Chapter 26 Three Truths Chedre Tsi Aru'un, keeper of the Iblisi, sat in stillness on her newly settled throne, now placed before the fountain at the heart of Togren Fell. Its beauties were, for the moment, entirely ignored by her. Chedre's only movement was a slight quivering of her hand as she gripped the top of her staff with a pale fist. Her acolytes, who had carried her heavy throne through every fold gate from the imperial city to the far reaches of northern Ibania, a seemingly endless succession through increasing carnage, had never complained about its weight or the length of the journey. Her personal guard had made no utterance regarding the open danger to which the keeper was exposed. Each of them took their orders and performed their duties in unquestioning silence. Now her throne, situated before the bone-white fountain inside the Togren Fell, a pretty little dwarven tomb about as far removed from every benefit of civilization as could be found. Keeper Chadre alone could afford to be as loud as she liked. How is it possible? Chadre barked in a shrill voice that seemed to shake the very stones of the great crafted cavern around her. That the keepers of all truth, the sharpest eyes and ears of the imperial will, cannot even find one of their own. My keeper, replied Master Indexia Charun from where he half bowed in front of the throne. We followed the trail to a small fold gate to the west that led us across the Hyperion Plain beyond the Hecariot Pillar. We have eight quorums searching now. It is only a matter of time before— I do not care if it takes another hundred quorums! Chadre yelled, spittle flying from between her long, sharp teeth. I haven't traveled over two hundred leagues into the wilderness just to wait for three days in this— this grave for your report of a stunning lack of news! Keeper Chadre— Charun said, looking away from her as he spoke. The Assessia who have returned to report tell us that the trail moves in the direction of the Murialis woodlands. It is entirely possible that Soen and the rest of his quorum may be dead. Chidre nearly choked on her laugh. Ha! <laughs> dead! Soen! Yes, Keeper Chidre. He wouldn't dare die without asking my permission first. That being true, came the raspy voice from the entrance to the tomb. Then perhaps, perhaps I might ask your permission now, in advance. I would hate to disappoint you. Chidre's head jerked up toward the voice. Soen, is that you, my son? Soen stepped from the dark opening onto the broad flagstone of the tomb's floor. The black of his robes was lost under layers of dust, mud, and stains. He swayed slightly, his balance uncertain. His narrow jaw hung open as he sucked in the moist air. <sighs> yes, keeper. Your loyal servant has returned with news of a great victory. Or oh, what will be a great victory once we deal with a few awkward realities. Soen shuffled forward, casting a tired smile at the Indexia. Ah, Charun is here to save me. How considerate of him to be so concerned about my welfare. But as you can see, I am not so much lost as I am delayed. So, un, the keeper said, trying unsuccessfully to keep the anger out of her voice. I left the citadel to meet you among the marshalling fields in Ipania. So your assessia informed me. Soen stepped around the throne to the tree fountain in the center of the great hall. He sat at the edge of the pool and removed his boots. Poor Jukung! So young and so ambitious, also sadly inexperienced, although, in all honesty, even my own two Codexia didn't see the danger. 
No offense intended, Sharun. Soen eased his feet into the cool waters and closed his eyes with a sigh. You've lost them all, then? The keeper said with a dangerous purr in her voice. Soen, ignoring the remark for the moment, turned to face Sharun. My deepest thanks for your concern, Master Indexia, and the efforts of all those under your charge on my behalf. Perhaps now, however, would be an excellent time for you to recall your searching quorums, as clearly I have been found. Charun stiffened slightly, but one glance at the keeper and he knew it was time to retreat. With a bow he turned and quickly stepped across the stones to the exiting tunnel and disappeared into its blackness. Chadre waited a moment before she spoke again. What? Happened, my son. Soen smiled to himself, then reached down with both long hands and scooped up water from the pool. He buried his face in his hands, rubbing the water vigorously over his face, then plunged his hands back into the water. Soen! Chadre spoke in dark tones. There are limits to my love. The Inquisitor stopped and then turned toward her. So I have observed. He looked up at the cascading fountain. It is rather magnificent, although its effect would be ever so much better were it moved out of this cave and into the light of day. When our Imperial Legions finally managed to break the seals on this place, I was one of the first called in to evaluate it. There was considerable discussion at the time about how we should dismantle the entire thing and transport it as a trophy back to the Imperial City. But ultimately the idea was abandoned. It was just too much effort. Rather fortunate for you, however, that we left it here. The sound of its waters rather conveniently obscures close conversations from more distant ears. Chadre remained silent for a time her black eyes fixed on him. This is why you drew me to this place. You knew that I would choose it. I think it much more pleasant to say, rather, that I counted on the tactical and political good sense that has made you a legendary keeper of the Iblisi. Soen replied, leaning back on his elbows as he faced her. Chidre spoke just loudly enough over the hiss and roar of the elaborate fountain, for Soen to hear her words. The quorum, then. Soen took in a long breath before he continued, his own voice pitched just for the keeper's ears. My two Codexia are dead, those that came with me, that is. The borders of Murialis have always been in some dispute, with neither side pressing for exactly where to draw that line. It seems that Queen Murialis decided of late to expand her perception of what constitutes her territory. I expected the fairy line, but not nearly as soon as we came upon it. I had sent both Kinsei and Fang ahead to envelop our prey before the bolters reached the line, but they were both taken before they could get into position. And the Assessia? Tadre asked quietly. I brought him back but I do not know how much use he'll be to you now. Water nymphs attacked him when he crossed the fairy line. He may live, but I wonder if it wouldn't be better for him if he doesn't. I tried to warn Jukung when we came up on the line, but he crossed anyway. Chidre sniffed and then shrugged. <sighs> Foolish boy. Well, I suppose that's the end of it, then. Sorry to have put you to such trouble, Soen. Soen stood up, stretching. Who spoke of endings, my lady? You chased those bolters from one end of the Hyperion plane to the other only to herd them all to their deaths, Chidre said. It's over. Now we may never know what brought down those wells in the provinces, and it all seems like such a waste. Quite the contrary, Madam Keeper. This investigation grows more fascinating with each passing moment. We know three very important truths now. 
truths that are best kept to ourselves. Soen said, his black eyes shining. First, I must report that while those august members of my quorum who were with me at the time were indeed utterly destroyed by the denizens of the Murialis woods, the bolters, on the other hand, were left entirely unscathed. What? Chidre's outburst threatened to overwhelm the noise of the enormous fountain behind her. Rather interesting, isn't it? An entire living forest bent on the destruction of anyone invading its territory. And these seven bolters from an obscure and apparently unimportant elven house pass the fairy line without so much as a hair out of place. It rather begs the question of why these particular seven are the exception to Queen Murialis's standing decree to kill all invaders first and then ask who they were later. Chidre leaned forward on her throne. You think Murialis is assisting them? Certainly. Why else would they have survived the border crossing unless on her express instructions? Soen stepped in front of the throne and dropped down on the stones of the floor, crossing his legs under him as he sat facing the keeper. As for why Murialis would do such a thing, that part remains hidden to me. Murialis knows that harboring bolters would provide the Emperor with the very excuse he needs to declare open war on the fairy lands, and she knows that he's looking for any such excuse now that the war with the dwarves is finished. The fact that she allows them to live means that she is aiding them somehow, though she won't publicly admit to it. But suppose that rumors began circulating around the Imperial houses that Murialis is not only harboring dangerous fugitives, but even hinting that they may have been acting under her orders to destroy an elven house on the frontier. Were I Murialis in such a circumstance, I would be under increasing pressure to push these trouble-plagued bolters out of my kingdom as soon as possible. Murialis won't risk open confrontation— Neutrality has worked too well for her thus far. So you want me to foment a war? Just beat the drums loudly enough so that Murialis is uncomfortable. Chadre nodded slowly. I think I can manage that. But why bother? Seven slaves escaping into the Murialis woods are hardly... The reason to bother is in fact my second truth. Soen said, straightening his back. You no doubt have the reports of our discoveries at House Timuron. Yes. Chidre nodded, her face thoughtful. Great tragedy, that. Never happened officially, of course, but the explosive collapse of the Aetherwell is still of considerable private concern, especially to the Okuran. You know, then, that one of the bolters is a human male by the name of Drakis. Yes, what of it? The second truth I have discovered is that this human named Drakus also hears the dragon song. Chidre looked up in disgust. Oh, by all the gods, do you actually believe this human to be the fulfillment of the desolation prophecies? Of course not. What kind of fool do you take me for? Soen snapped his voice echoing off the walls of the domed chamber. The Inquisitor stood up quickly and moved closer to the Keeper. One out of every ten human males of the Seventh Estate hear that same song in their heads, and since the humans still teach that prophecy to their young before they're impressed for devotions, it seems hard to find a male child who hasn't been named Dracus by their sires. Those prophecies are nothing but the cooling embers of a dead faith. Soen's hand reached out, grasping the arm of the keeper's throne and pulling him closer to her. He may not be the lost king come to destroy Ronos and bring honor back to humanity. But he could be the one, or worse, mistaken for the one. We've got to find him before any of the ministries do, before the legions and their generals, before the emperor or any of his minions have any idea of his existence. We are the keepers of truth, Chidre, and this is one truth we would want within our control. 
You think he might be useful to us? Chidre nodded, her voice barely audible over the rushing waters behind her. He doesn't have to be the one. Soen smiled, his sharp teeth showing. But in the right place, he could pass for the one. He did cause the aether wells of nearly every house in the western provinces to fail. Think of it, Chidre. To fail. The well of House Timuron utterly destroyed. A feat beyond even the Grand Wizard of the Akuron. And yet, this Dracus did it. In the wrong hands, he could threaten the foundations of the Empire. And in the right hands? Chidre asked. In the right hands? Soen replied. The Empire might still fall, but in a direction that could be to the right people's advantage. You propose a most dangerous game, my Inquisitor. But it is my gamekeeper, he replied, his lips parting into a wide smile, revealing his pointed teeth. The stakes are high, perhaps none higher. And yet in the end... You know that you risk nothing at all. Chidre nodded slowly and smiled back through her translucent, needle-like teeth. I always liked you. I'd hate to have you killed. It might prove a difficult task to carry out, my keeper. Soen nodded. It's been tried before. Stay with the subject at hand, she snapped. All of this might have proved useful if you actually had this Dracus slave. Chidre pointed out, her long fingers uncurling into an open palm. But as you have already said, this bolter is a guest of the vast kingdom of Murialis. Even if we flush this bird out of the forest, he could reappear anywhere along a thousand leagues of Murialis's border, back into Iperia, Aria, Cronassus. This Dracus is currently about seventy-three leagues inside the border of Murialis. Soen said, standing upright and folding his arms across his chest. Keeper Chidre eyed Soen in astonishment, momentarily unable to speak. And he will emerge in Vestasia to the north. Soen finished with a smirk. Are you a wizard, Soen? Chidre frowned. You can believe that if you wish, my keeper, Soen said, reaching into the folds of his robe. But the source of my knowledge is more mundane, and it is my third truth that I have brought to you. He pulled out his fist, opening the fingers into a loose bowl. Cupped in his fingers were five round stones, each entwined with twigs or blades of grass. Beacon stones! Chidre sighed in wonder. I found the first of them before the fold gate near the Timuron ruin. Soen said, his eyes wandering lovingly over the stones in his hand. Once found, it was a simple matter to align my staff to their aether emanations and follow them and other signs through each successive gate. The gods favor you, Soen, Chidre chuckled. If so, they did not see fit to favor me with the lives of Kinsei and Fong. Soen replied, closing his fist around the small stones. Do you think the other bolters know? Chidre asked, her question merely curiosity. That they have a traitor among them who is giving away their every move to us? Soen pondered for a moment. No, this is a truth that is known to only three of us. You, myself, and the wretched creature that will deliver these slaves into my, forgive me, Keeper, our hands. Chapter 27 Pretending Dracus awoke with a start, sitting upright so quickly that he felt three vertebrae in his back crack back into place. He drew in a great gulp of air and then held it for a moment, 
his eyes blinking as he tried to make sense of his surroundings. The walls of the circular space were a dark, rich brown color. The curve of their surface showed slick and glistening in the thin light that spilled down through a woven grating that capped the room ten feet or so above his head. At length he let out his breath and stretched slowly. Every muscle in his body felt stiff and aching. It was to him as though he had slept for a thousand years, and yet he still longed for the bliss of unconsciousness. He rubbed his hand quickly over the bristles of his emerging hair and was surprised at how long it had gotten. How long have I been in here? he wondered. For a while he fingered the matted animal furs under him. He remembered running into the woods. Then something about Mala finding him, leading him somewhere. He frowned at the thought of her, his mind tumbling through a cascade of memories. He loved her had to love her, and yet the things he had done to her, had suffered because of her, were shameful, painful, and unforgivable. A small, quivering voice cut through his dark musings. Dracus? He turned at once toward the sound. He sat on a slab of stone about the size of the tombs where the bones of the Ronos dead were so often placed. There were two more of these slabs set around the floor of the curved room, but only one of them was likewise occupied. Mala, he replied as evenly as he could manage. I'm here. Mala sat with her legs pulled up tight against her chest as she rocked nervously back and forth. Please, Dracus, is it you? Dracus smiled ruefully gripping the edge of the stone beer with his hands as he leaned forward. I might ask the same of you. Are you all right? I... I don't know. She raised her face toward the light. Her eyes were red from crying and still filled with tears. The beautiful shape of her head was now covered with a bristle of rust-red hair, nearly obscuring the dark stains of the house tattoo. But there was something in the heart shape of her dirt-streaked face and her wide mouth that called to his heart, and her eyes, those emerald eyes, called to him still. Where are we? he asked. I... I don't know that either, she said, her voice quavering. I'm frightened. There's nothing to be frightened about. Have you seen the walls? Dracus turned his head around, pressing it closer to the reddish-brown surface. I don't see what... He stopped. The wall was composed entirely of enormous cockroaches. Their legs were linked together, forming a thick pattern so dense that it was impossible for Dracus to tell if there was anything beyond the mass of roaches, or whether they alone formed the wall. He reached out gingerly to touch it. No, Dracus, don't! The wall of roaches reacted at once to his touch, a clattering, chattering sound engulfing the cell as the walls around them contracted inward in a violent spasm. Dracus leaped off of the stone slab with a yelp, reaching without conscious thought for his weapon, and only then realizing that it was no longer at his side. Mala screamed hysterically, pulling herself into a tighter ball as the size of their confined space grew rapidly smaller. Then with equal swiftness, the surrounding cockroach wall stopped and receded, though to Dracus's eyes, not quite so far back as it had been before. Dracus concentrated on bringing himself under control. His breath was too quick, and he could feel the heat of his flushed face. He had no idea where they were, nor how they had gotten here, but he was certain that anywhere else would be better for them. At once he turned his face toward the overhead grating, and was again surprised. What had appeared to him to be a thick grillwork, he now saw, was constituted entirely of large snakes, their bodies woven to cover the opening. He could not discern much of anything in the light beyond the snakes, but he held little hope it was much better than where they were now. Dracus looked down at the soft, fine-grained floor under his feet. Various skulls protruded from the deep white grains along the wall's peripheral base, the sand was composed of crushed bone. It will be all right, 
Draco said, as much to himself as to Mala. How will... will this possibly be all right? Mala asked through gulping sobs. Dracus turned. He longed to go to Mala, to take her in his arms and comfort her. He took a step toward her, and then he stopped and stood awkwardly in mid-stride, watching her. She gazed at him, her tear-filled eyes narrowing on him, reflecting a world of pain, longing, hatred, hope, and despair. When she spoke, her words were more of an accusation than a question. You remember, don't you? Dracus heard his own quickened breath in his ears. His mouth had suddenly gone dry, and he was having trouble looking her in the eye. Yes, Mala, I remember. I remember a great many things now, we all do. Her lips parted in contempt. Dracus let out a harsh breath. <sighs> but yes, I remember. How could you, Dracus? Her voice shook as she spoke. How could you do that to me? The servants who brought me to Shaban's room scorned me and tore at my clothes, all the while screeching that my humani body was too ugly to tempt them. And then they forced me to watch you. You and that hideous, soulless elf bitch. Her voice trailed off to nothing. Only now did he remember it all, how he had spurned C. Shaban the day before because of his love for the garden slave called Mala, and how her vengeance had taken its own cold course. So she had changed his devotions that night to include erasing his memory of the woman he so tenderly loved so that she could arrange her horrific and unforgivable humiliation. It was not the first time Dracus knew that C. Shaban had played cruelly with him or with those he dared love other than her. He shook with revulsion, feeling the urge to vomit and all the while knowing that it was he alone who made him sick, that it was himself whom he hated the most. Dracus was filled with unspeakable shame over what had happened and what he had done. Yet his other memories of Mala persisted at the same time, of their yearning to touch softly through the bars that separated them, of the quiet talks they stole and the warm smiles they shared. He looked again into those emerald eyes and saw his own loathing and longing reflected back. Mala, he said quietly at last, I am so terribly sorry, more sorry than I think there are words to tell. I wish there were a way that I could take it all back or change it all. I even sometimes wish that I could just forget it all and go back to being ignorant and happy. Mala gave a short laugh, wiping her eyes against the soiled cloth covering her knees. <laughs> I'd settle for ignorant. Dracus smiled slightly and nodded. Well, if all you're looking for is ignorant, then here I am. Mala gazed at him again, her face serious. Dracus, I don't know how to forget. I look at you, and I see so many different faces now, all at the same time. So many of them I hate, and so many of them I long for all at once. I can't make myself forget what I know. I need you, Dracus. I don't understand what is happening to us or where we are going, but I need to follow you, be with you, and be comforted by you. But every time I see you, I also see your other faces, and I just can't... Maybe, Dracus said, maybe we could just pretend. Mala looked away from him. What? Look, I... I don't know what happened to us, and we're all dealing with our own pasts, Dracus said, taking a step closer. Mala tightened her grip around her knees. I know there are a lot of things in my own past that absolutely terrify me. He went on. I've seen things, done things, 
You know that I have that are... Trachus ran out of words, unable to express his self-loathing. Up until now I've been able to push all these memories aside. I keep telling myself that I've got to take command. I've got to be in control and get everyone to safety. And that I'll think about my unthinkable past later. I haven't stopped. I haven't really let any of us stop long enough to deal with our own thoughts and memories. We've been running away from ourselves as fast as we could, dreading being caught by our own pasts as much as any inquisitor the Empire has sent after us. Now we've stopped, and we have nowhere left to run from ourselves. Mala turned her gaze back on him once more, her eyes both pleading and reserved. Dracus offered his hand out in front of him. Now all I know is that you are here, and I am here, and together we're stuck in this hole. You need someone to hold you, and I need someone to hold. So if we can't forgive our pasts or forget them, maybe we can just pretend, for a while at least, that I still love you, and you still love me. Let's pretend that all that happened before was just a bad dream, and that all that matters is what's happening right here and now. Mala did not move. We are who we are, Dracus said quietly, extending his hand once more. But for today, can we pretend to be those people we were before we remembered? Mala reached out her small, dirty hand slowly, taking his large hand in hers. He climbed up onto the stone bier next to her, and slowly, carefully put his arms around her. She turned into him, leaning against his body and turning her face into his chest. He held her there for many hours, doing his best to pretend that she loved him. All the while, she shrank from his touch. Chapter 28 Eternal Halls Dracus opened his eyes to a dream. He sat facing walls that were the white of fine marble, illuminated by soft balls of light floating in perfect stillness at set distances between narrow fluted pillars. Carefully shaped trees and plants adorned the octagonal space in hues of green, augmented with brilliant flowers in orange, blue, yellow, and crimson. The pillars drew his eyes up toward a glorious and intricate ceiling twenty feet above him. Clouds drifted past the intricate latticework formed between the arches high overhead. Somewhere in the distance he could hear the soft echoes of musical pipes playing a gentle melody. Mala was still at his side, though sleep had taken her at last, too. She leaned against him, quiet at last. Dracus closed his eyes. So this is what peace feels like, he thought. Free from care or pain, free from responsibilities, free from your own past. He smiled and shifted slightly to relieve a muscle that was threatening to cramp in his lower back. He seriously considered whether it might be possible to remain in this one spot forever. He supposed that eventually he would need to find water and food and other such bothersome necessities of life, but for now the relief that he felt in this one place was acute. He had been in pain for so long that it was not until now, when he let it go, that he realized just how large a burden it had been to him. The hollow tones of the pipes continued to drift over him, carried from a distance on a gentle, sweet breeze. Five notes. Five notes. He wondered how he'd got here. He remembered finding Mala in the woods. He remembered following her into the glade, the rock fountain in the middle, and drinking from it. His memories became more confused after that, and it seemed like too much of an effort to remember. Then he remembered being in the terrible cell with Mala, and... He shifted once more, frowning. He didn't know how he got from that horrible cell to this place, but he knew that he didn't care. For now, he thought, 
It is enough to just sit here, drink in the peace, rest, and listen to the sweet sounds of the nine notes, seven notes. He sat upright suddenly, his eyes open. The song, that song. The distant pipes were playing the melody that had so often troubled his dreams and even his waking hours of late. He had tried so hard to push it from his thoughts for so long that he could scarcely mistake it now. It must be the dwarf, he thought. Jugar had been humming the tune around the ninth throne of the dwarves when they first took him as a prize. It had to be him. The peaceful, languid tone suddenly annoyed Dracus. That damnable little beast! He would be the one to spoil this! Mala roused slowly, blinking as she awoke. Dracus? What happened? Where are we? Dracus pushed himself off the stone, the same stone they had sat upon in the roach cell, he realized, as his bare feet landed on a soft green material that blanketed the floor. His practiced eye glanced around him, searching for something that might be used as a weapon. But other than the large stone beer itself in the middle of the tall room, and the small trees that seemed to be growing right out of the flooring, there was nothing that presented itself to him as useful in combat. He took in a deep breath and blew it out slowly. This was not a battlefield. Indeed, there was something about this place that was so far removed from everything he knew about life that he found himself increasingly anxious in the midst of absolute peace. A land of peace and rest, the young boy said. Even if there were such a place, you won't know what to do when you get there. What do you know about it? His brother whispered gruffly beside him as they pushed the wheel of the mill with a dozen other slaves. There is a land of peace and freedom. That's not what Dracosta says. I'm twelve, Dracus thought, as he heard his young self speak. That young boy was me. Dracosta was still alive then. He would not be beaten to death by Timuron for two years yet. He says that it's all a story someone made up. Well, that's not what Mom says. Polis answered back. "'sweat pouring from his forehead. "'It's north. "'In Vestasia, maybe, beyond a sea of water "'and even a sea of sand. "'That's where we're going, Drake. "'You and me together. "'No one will ever make us work again. "'You wait and see.' "'I had a brother, Polis. "'Which brother was that? "'And was that our mother who told those tales? "'Or was it someone we only thought was our mother, "'because the elves always tried to make us believe "'we were in families?' Even when our parents were dead, when several sets of parents were dead and our memories of each were successive lies. Dracus, what is it? Dracus shook himself back into the present. Mala stood in front of him. The soft tune continued to play. Come on, he said as he turned toward the tall arched doors of translucent glass and pushed them open with a violent shove. The room beyond was a small, circular garden enclosed by a glass dome overhead. A fountain murmured in the center of the garden, whose appearance mildly shocked Dracus, as it was identical to the one he remembered being in the glade just before his thoughts faded. "'This is it,' Dracus said. "'This is where you brought me when you found me in the Hyperion Woods.' Mala cocked her head, her eyes narrowing above her cheekbones. "'What are you talking about?' I couldn't find you in the woods. This, Dracus said, stepping up to the fountain. When we first entered the Hyperion Woods, we all got separated. You found me and brought me back to this fountain. It was in a glade then. What glade, Dracus? Mala asked. I never found you. That dwarf of yours found me. Oh, that dwarf. Dracus growled and gritted his teeth. Dracus turned around, shouting up into the dome. Juga! You monstrous little snake! As soon as I find you playing those damned pipes, I'm going to take them, break them, and one by one insert them into your... Silence, Master Dracus, came the imperious voice behind him. These are my halls, and you will respect my home. Dracus turned, his tirade cut short. The lyrics stood before him, 
her narrow face uplifted in regal scorn. She still wore the same dress, now tattered to rags, that she had from the beginning of their ordeal. But now, on the sparse and stubby golden hair sprouting from her head, she wore a circlet fashioned of woven twigs. You need not concern yourself with Juga. He is with us, and his dwarven ways shall not trouble you while you are in my realm. The lyric gestured behind her, and a wide, familiar, and now troubled face came into view at about the level of her waist. Good friends are always well met in strange circumstances, Jugar said quietly, his mouth shaking beneath troubled eyes as he spoke. You're a mighty man, Dracus, to live within the boundaries of the Murialis woods. The lyric turned to face Dracus once more, her face raised in defiance. You stand within the eternal halls, my forest palace where you are, for now, my guests. But you may find what the dwarf, it seems, has lost the words to tell you, that it is far easier to enter the eternal halls than it is to leave them. Dracus stared at the lyric for a moment, then held up his hand. Wait. Do you hear it? Hear what? Mala asked. Listen. In the immediate stillness, the tones of a set of pipes drifted through the garden. Dracus stared down at the dwarf, who was trying to keep his oversized robe closed around him. Jugar shrugged, shaking his head in denial. If it isn't the dwarf, where is that music coming from? Dracus asked. From your destiny, Dracus, the lyric said. Shall we find it together? The lithe woman walked with long, measured steps toward one of the arched doors. With elegant grace she pulled the doors open and stepped into the enormous hall beyond. Dracus took Mala's hand and pulled her along as he followed the lyric, with Jugar keeping so close behind that he stepped on Dracus's heels several times before the human's angry looks forced him farther away. The hall was a magnificent space with galleries on both sides. Here the floor was polished stone, cool to their bare feet as they walked across its even and measured tiles. It was over a hundred feet in length, dizzying in size, and to Dracus's mind, brain-numbing in its impracticality. It was opulent, glorious, and magnificent all at once, and yet seemed to serve no purpose whatsoever. There were no audience chairs here for an assemblage, nor artwork for display, nor did it appear to have anything to do with combat or training or any other function that Dracus could imagine. They followed the lyric through the enormous arch at the far end of the hall into a magnificent garden. In its center stood a raised dais platform with a wide, grand throne. The back of the throne fanned up and over the seat with sheltering branches and golden leaves. Three figures stood before the throne and were at once recognized by Dracus. Ethus, the Chimerian, and both Manticores, Balog and Ruukog. It was the fourth figure seated on the throne that caught Dracus's attention, for she was the one who was playing the pipes. She was an enormous human-appearing woman, who, Dracus judged, would be fully eight feet tall when standing. She wore a robe of deep turquoise in color, though the exact shade seemed to shift as she swayed with the rhythm of her song. She was a strange woman to Dracus's eye. Her hips were disproportionately wide, and she appeared heavy even for her height. Her breasts were enormous and seemed barely kept in check by the closed robe. She had a wide, fleshy face that tried unsuccessfully to obscure two brightly twinkling eyes. Her mouse-brown hair fell in wavy strands down as far as where her waist should have been. She looked up at once as they approached, her panpipes dropping from the warm smile of her supple lips. So you do come when cold, she said in a deep alto voice filled with the warmth of late spring. The lyric stopped at the base of the dais, and Dracus, Mala, and the dwarf stopped just behind her. The lyric bowed deeply. When she spoke, her voice was suddenly high-pitched and had a nasal quality to it that Dracus had never heard before. 
Queen Murialis, I am Felicia of the Mists, Princess of the Erebusia Isles. I have long traveled the paths of the sky and hidden my identity from common men, but I lay myself bare before you, my royal sister. Dracus gaped at the lyric. You're who? Murialis, Queen of the Nymphs and Dryads, nodded with a smile, then turned to Ethis. Is this the lyric you were telling me about? Yes, your majesty, Ethis replied. Murialis turned back to the lyric. My sister, you are most welcome here in the Eternal Halls. May you find respite from your weary road and surcease for a time from your adventures. You honor us with your trust. Thank you, Murialis, the lyric said imperiously. Your kindness shall forever be remembered among my clan. Of course, Murialis said with a slight smile. As a princess, perhaps you might rest for a time while I give audience to your companions. I understand that you, Felicia, are constantly weary. The lyric considered that for a time. That is true, Murialis. I shall rest here in your garden for a time. You have my leave, Murialis replied. The lyric turned and strode across the grasses of the garden and settled to the ground almost at once. Murialis turned to Ethis, laughter playing across her lips as she spoke. She certainly takes her job seriously, doesn't she? How do you think she did as an impression of me? She was but a shadow of your imperial presence, your majesty. Ethis answered with a slight bow. Flatterer! You must agree that even my shadow is so large that she can't even fill that. Murialis laughed heartily and then turned her eyes on Dracus. Hmm. So, this is the one, eh? He answers to the song well enough, I'll give you that. Ah, yes, your majesty, Ethis nodded. His name is... Dracus, of course, I know. But then it would have to be, wouldn't it? Murialis nodded, her eyes fixed on the human male. So, are we standing in the presence of destined greatness? Is this the one of whom it is said that he will return the glory of the human age? Ethis began. Your Majesty, let him speak. Murialis cut off Ethis's words. She rose from her throne, towering over them all. Dracus looked up into the wide face and realized that Murialis was in no way weak or even benevolent. There was malice and anger behind her eyes, and her body held power and strength that might easily break even a manticore in two. What say you, Dracus? This manticore tells me that you are the human of prophesied destiny who will free us all from the tyranny of Ronos and bring back the glories of the past. Are you this avatar of the gods? Dracus swallowed, the words forming with difficulty in his throat. Jugar spoke into the silence. He is, your majesty, I can personally assure you without hesitation. If I had wanted a lie, I would have asked you first, dwarf. Murialis took a step closer to Dracus. Clouds gathered with unnatural speed overhead. She towered over him as she spoke, her face pressing down close to his. I am not some young wench who can be impressed by tales, human. Do you know why these are called the Eternal Halls? It is because there is no end to them. The halls, rooms, walls, floors, ceilings, furniture, everything is constantly being built for me by the subjects of the forest. You cannot escape these halls because they never end. They are being renewed from moment to moment so that my palace surrounds me no matter where I go in my kingdom. You cannot find a way out, because there is no way out until I decide there is. Your destiny is in my hands until I say otherwise. So tell me, are you the prophesied one? I... perhaps... 
a dwarven answer if I ever heard one! Muriala shrieked. Lightning cut across the sky, its thunder shaking the garden. I'll ask you once more, human. Are you? I don't know! Dracus yelled. Muriala straightened up. The sky began to brighten. Oh, Felicia! Muriala's called brightly. Yes, sister, the lyric said, sitting up at once on the grass nearby. Please take my friends through that door, the queen said with a smile as she pointed to an opening on her right. You will find a banquet prepared in your honor. Your courts honor us, the lyric replied with a firm nod. Yes, we do. Murialis nodded. Just leave me with Ethis and this Dracus fellow for a time. We have a few more things to discuss. Chapter 29 Unwelcome Guests He's a lot shorter than I expected for a god, Murialis purred dangerously. I must say I'm disappointed in what you have brought me, Ethis. I regret having been a disappointment, Your Majesty. Ethis responded at once. You're a Chimerian of many words, my old friend, but I sincerely doubt that regret is one of them. Murialis took two steps down from the dais as she peered at Dracus, then threw back her head and laughed. Ah! Oh. <laughs> oh, look at him, Ethis. Have you ever seen such delightful puzzlement? If I did, I do not recall it, Your Majesty. Ethis said with ease, his blank face gazing back at Dracus while he folded two sets of arms in front of himself. Ethis, what is going on? Dracus said quietly to the Chimerian. Do you... you work for this woman? This woman? Murialis hooted. She stood on the ground directly in front of Dracus, towering over him. Her low voice started with a soft lilt and turned slowly to a keen edge as she spoke. My dear, frail little human, your kind is such a wonder. You all have egos ever so much larger than any evidence would support. The embodiment of nature stands before you, the very same patient force that pushes mountains up from plains, cuts valleys from stone, and will surely outlast every single construct wrought by the hand of your fleeting race. And you have the effrontery to call me this woman? The ground of the garden suddenly softened beneath his feet. His feet plunged down into the earth, which had suddenly turned into a worm-riddled mud that refused to support his weight. The worms churned in the mire, pulling him downward. Draca struggled to pull his feet out of the mess, but he was already up to his knees. Ethis! Dracus cried out. Help! I can't! Your most glorious majesty, Ethis intervened. He is, as you yourself have noted, only a human, and as such carries with him the follies of his race. He should show better manners, Murialis replied in tones devoid of compassion, and know his place in the world. I should be delighted to instruct him on your behalf, Ethis replied. But in your majesty's interest, may I point out that your august self only has a use for this human if he remains breathing. Murialis considered for a moment and then nonchalantly raised her left hand. Two of the great ash trees that stood to either side of her throne bent over at once, their branches wrapping around Dracus's torso and pulling him from the mire. Dracus cried out from the crushing pain, and then fell awkwardly to the now surprisingly firm ground beneath him as the branches sprang away from him and the trees returned to their stately positions. This is supposed to be the fulfillment of the Ronos doom. Murialis sneered as she climbed once more to her throne and sat down. So the dwarf says. Murialis gave a dismissive laugh. 
And so the manticore believes, Ethis continued, he bears the name of prophecy and the circumstances of his past, fit the legend, or would with a little judicious revision. Your glorious self has proved that he answers to the dragon song, as one in any random dozen humans do. Murielis mused, still, the possibilities are intriguing. You've questioned him. What does he think of this prophecy he is supposed to fulfill? Your Majesty, he is aware of— Questioned me. Dracus interrupted, but on seeing the look on the Queen's face, struggled to think of more appropriate forms of address. Forgive me, Queen Murialis. I am only a slave warrior, but this Chimerian never questioned me on any prophecy or anything like it. Oh, this is too entertaining. Murialis's voice purred as she leaned back into her throne. Ethis, indulge me. Show this human your marvelous trick. Your Majesty knows that I serve at the behest of the Lady Cheadle, mistress of the High Council in exile, Ethis said, straightening slightly as he spoke. It would be a betrayal of that trust if I were to reveal, I need no reminding of Cheadle. Murialis spoke loud enough to cover the Chimerian's words. You and your vagabond traveling companions are still reveling in your tiresome mortal existence only because of the bonds between your Lady of the High Council and my most generous self. Show him, Ethis. I will be amused. Uh, might I suggest? You may not. Murialis frowned, and as she spoke, Storm clouds gathered over the transparent dome above their heads. Oblige me! Ethis paused and then bowed, spreading all four of his arms out graciously. At your service. Dracus wondered for a moment just what it was he was supposed to be impressed by. He had fought alongside Chimera, and occasionally against them for as long as he had gone to battle— his training in the arena had taught him all about their telescoping bone structure that allowed them to vary their size and at the same time made it nearly impossible to break their bones in combat. He knew, too, of their ability to alter the coloration of their skin so that they could blend into their surroundings and be more difficult to see on a battlefield. As he watched Ethis's form shift, it was all familiar to him, and he wondered if he would have to work up some feigned astonishment in order to please the mercurial Murialis. But the transformation continued beyond anything Dracus had experienced before. The bone plates of Ethis's face began to shift, and the muscles over the skeleton shifted their positions. The normally translucent skin began to change texture and color. Flaps appeared in the skin, seeming to shift with the Chimera's slightest move. Ethis grew shorter, his second set of arms disappeared as his shape became more human. Dracus gasped, uncertain whether it was from horror or wonder. Ethis stood before him in the perfectly modeled form of Mala. By the, the gods, Dracus sputtered. The Chimerian Mala walked up to him, speaking in a slightly husky rendition of the human woman's voice an honest sadness in her expression. I'm sorry, Dracus. It was the only way I could get us through alive. Dracus kept his eyes fixed on the counterfeit woman, as though seeing some terrible vision from which one cannot look away. Ethis, how? It's rare among our kind, the pseudo-mala said with a rueful smile. A very few of us can alter our shape radically, and hold the new form for extended periods of time. It takes effort, a great deal of training and discipline. Hair is the hardest to form. Clothing from skin folds is perhaps more challenging still. It's also a rather lonely existence. We are considered freakish by most of our own kind, but the High Council in exile makes good use of turning our curse into their blessing. They call us the Shades of the Exile— and we can go places in the world, perform the bidding of Our Lady Cheetle, and— And none would ever suspect the Chimera. Dracus finished. Something like that? 
the false Mala said through a pout as she took another step toward Dracus, near enough now to touch him. It does allow us to get far closer to our targets than they might otherwise allow, and anyone will tell any secret to the right companion. Still, I am glad that you and Mala were having problems when we arrived. Why? Dracus said, finding himself leaning in toward the woman. The false Mala reached up with her hand and held Dracus back. Because you're a good friend, Dracus, and I'm not that kind of girl. In a moment, Mala melted in front of him, expanded, faded, and became the four-armed Ethis. Dracus leaped backward with a sharp cry. Oh, that was wonderful! Murialis clapped atop her throne. We stage dramas for ourselves from time to time, just for our amusement, but that was far better than I could have produced. Bravo, Ethis, and your performance was refreshingly honest. Drake us of the prophecy. Queen Murialis, Drake us said with growing exasperation. I'm not this, this man of any prophecy. Oh, I don't care whether you are or not, boy, Murialis said with delight. It doesn't matter either way, really. All that matters is that other people think you could be this great legend destined to bring about the fall of the Ronos Empire. Fear and doubt are like weeds growing between mortared stones. Given enough time, they will destroy the strongest wall. If what Ethis tells me is true, then you've already planted those seeds whether you think it's your destiny or not. It is up to us now to help those seats along a little. Your Majesty? Ethis prompted. Queen Murialis leaned forward on her throne as she spoke. The Empire will know that you are here, that much is certain. Not all of the Iblisi who were hunting you were taken. One left to the east, carrying a second who was... Badly damaged, and it has been reported to me by my own operatives, has returned in great haste to Imperial lands. No doubt his report will be interpreted against me. They will claim that I am harboring you and threaten to use it as a pretext for invading my kingdom. Of course, they have never really needed an excuse to invade my lands, but that is one of the peculiarities of the elves. They feel compelled to justify themselves to some trumped-up morality before they commit an immoral war. I never could understand why they didn't just call it conquest without a lot of foolish justification and get it over with. Your Majesty, please, Ethis urged. It's a long, sorry process, Murialis lamented. They will assume I've granted you asylum. I'll tell them I didn't. They'll accuse me of lying, which is right enough, and I'll tell them I'm not, which is just another lie. And then they'll threaten to invade my land, for my own good, and I will in the end either capitulate and hand you over to them, in which case they will have beaten me, or I will rush you across my border and claim with feigned innocence that you aren't here at all. Which, if they want you badly enough, may be what they're after all along. Then may I suggest, Ethis said, that we could try to win the game before the elves know they're even playing. Don't wait for the elves. Send us out of Hyperia now. You remove their pretext for war and upset their plans all in a single move. I always like the way you think, Ethis, Murialis mused. Where would I send you? I'm on good terms with Cronassus to the southwest. You might make your way down to Mestophia. We might also go east, Ethis considered, into the mountains of Aeria, and then into the Chimerian lands of Ephendria. The dwarf might then be of considerable north, Dracus said. North? Murialis asked with surprise. Into Vestasia. Why would anyone want to go into that backward swamp? Well, Dracus thought for a moment before continuing. Isn't that what the legends say? But I'm supposed to go north. Ethis frowned. Mm, that might be a good reason not to go north. The Ronas know the legend well and would anticipate such a move. 
Muriala slapped both her open palms down on her knees at the same time and stood up. So they might. But how can we resist twisting Destiny's tail? North it shall be, but we shall best them with speed. They may expect to move to the north, but never this quickly. I shall make the arrangements at once. Thank you, Ethis, for bringing me such amusement. I knew there was a reason that I let you live. I am grateful, Your Majesty. Ethis replied, But do you not think that the Ronas may invade you, whether we are here or not? If they wish to invade my sovereign lands, Murialis replied with a quiet smile, then they will have to invent a lie in order to do so. I will not provide them the satisfaction of an excuse. And if they do come, let them come. The land itself shall rise up against them. Let us see how their legions fare when the rocks themselves rebel beneath their feet. Murialis stepped down to where Dracus stood, and leaning over slightly, extended her hand. Dracus glanced at Ethis. The Chimerian nodded. Dracus took the woman's large hand and kissed it. Murialis straightened and smiled. Dracus, I bid you farewell. Your journey is young. I go now to make arrangements for you and your companions to be tossed out of my kingdom at once. I trust you do not mind being such unwelcome guests. Your majesty, Dracus said, I believe I prefer it. Thank you. Murialis smiled and with a nod vanished into fading embers and smoke. Dracus paused for a moment and then turned slowly to face Ethis. This trick of yours. Who else have you done this to? Ethis cocked his head to one side, his face once more the blank that was common to his kind. Each in turn after we enter the woods. Murialis was long acquainted with me, but did not trust the rest. It was the only way I could convince her, the only way she would spare your lives. Who are you? Dracus asked. Part of me remembers you as a faithful and long-standing comrade, but that I know is a lie placed in my mind by the devotions. What is true is that I have no memory of you prior to three weeks ago, so tell me, who are you? No one that need concern you, but I am concerned. Dracus stood his ground. How does a creature who has such incredible abilities, who could be anyone, allow himself to be enslaved? You could have taken the form of an elf, and I did. Ethis chuckled. Then how? My own mistake, Ethis said, then shrugged his four shoulders. It matters little now. My mission was to find Thuri. Thuri? Yes, the same Thuri you know from your Octian, Ethis continued. He had been a rather prominent leader of a rebellion that threatened the security of the Chimerian High Council in exile. I had been hunting him for over a year when I found him as an impress warrior in House Timuron. He had forgotten his past, of course, but I knew if I could get him away from devotions long enough, he would remember what I needed to know. I came in the guise of a fourth estate elven guardian and applied to the Tribune for an appointment as a house guardian. Tribune Sajinka. Dracus urged. Yes, Ethis admitted. I knew he had been a general some years back, and hoped to use the story that I had served under him as a means to gain his trust. He seemed to me, on our first meeting, to be ancient and feeble-minded, and that was my mistake. It was all a game on his part. He laid a trap for me, literally a metal cage. The last thing he said to me before forcing devotions on me was that he could remember the name of every warrior who had ever served with him. It seems he had never believed my story from the very beginning. And now you have told me a story, too, Dracus said, and I still don't know you. How is it possible when each of us has barely had time enough to know ourselves? Ethis replied, Let's find the others. Murialis always puts a good meal on the table for her guests, and as we are apparently bound for Vestasia, 
We should avail ourselves of her hospitality as much as possible. Astasia is a wild land, and that part of our journey will be difficult. I don't trust you, and you shouldn't. The Chimerian went on. But then, I think that's sound advice in general. Don't trust anybody. Chapter 30 Shift in the Wind Chadre settled once more on her throne in the heart of the Iblisi Keep and permitted herself a grateful sigh. It was an entirely familiar place, and she was thankful to enjoy it again. In her younger days she too had been numbered among the Inquisitors who ranged across the wide lands and seas wherever the influence of the Ronas was extended, and often far beyond. But age and the politics of the imperial city had eroded her enthusiasm for distant horizons and new vistas. She preferred that the reports of such places came to her here, in the center of political life. Better to hear of the open sky than to experience it. Rather the world be brought to her than she leave her lair to see it herself. There were, however, those rare occasions when a journey beyond Tzu Jen's wall was required as when the truth to be learned needed to be kept to herself and as few others as possible. This business with Soen on the western frontier was one such time, yet whenever she was required to travel, she was comforted along the road by thoughts of this place, that all her journeys would end back here in the quiet darkness of her court, deep beneath the ancient stones of the old keep. The darkness better suited her purposes, and the decisions that she was required to make for the good of the empire. It felt much like a tomb, she mused, and where better to bury the truth than with the dead. Truth, after all, was the province of the Iblisi. The imperial will had from its inception altered the public perception of its past. Lie upon lie was told in the interest of the greater good and the will of the emperor, until any concept of the actual truth was becoming lost. Even the imperial family of the Ronos had begun to lose track of which lies it had told on top of other lies, and too often real truth would surface to the detriment of the state. It was during the Age of Mists, Chadre recalled, that the scrolls of Zothos came to the elves. The legends every elf knew by heart told of the great Ronos, father of their empire, wresting the scrolls from the gods in a challenge of wits and physical strength and founding the magic on which the empire would be forged. Its epic tale made Ronos the undisputed leader of the elves, trying to conquer a land that was then called Palandria. But the truth was that the scrolls of Zothos were bartered from a group of manticores who had no concept of their worth as they were capable neither of reading the scrolls nor of reproducing the magic, even if they could read. They had stolen those scrolls centuries before from the Chimera in Ephendria, who themselves had stolen them from the humans of Dracosia, beyond the Erebus Straits to the north. But the truth would not make Ronas a mythic emperor. So it was that early in the burgeoning Ronas state nearly eighteen hundred years ago, it was decided that one group would be tasked with keeping the actual truth intact against those times when new lies had to be crafted in the face of reality. After all, a lie based on a truth is far more effective than one made up entirely of whole cloth. The truth, a powerful and dangerous thing, would be kept safely hidden from the general populace and often from the guilds and orders of the empire as well when it was in the interests of the imperial will. The guardians of the imperial family, the Iblisi, were originally charged with this task, and for nearly two millennia they labored tirelessly as keepers of the truth and the touchstones of the imperial will. The histories were written and rewritten, torn down and written once again to shape the minds of the Ronas elves to support whatever the current political climate wished to be true in the public heart. Yet through it all, the Iblisi remained the keepers of the true past, and the black, violent, and immoral bloody treacheries that were the constant tempo of the real Ronas histories. The Age of Frost, the Age of Mists, the Age of Fire, all were chronicled in gory, terrible detail, and then buried here, 
buried for the good of the citizens of every estate and the welfare of the imperial rule. Yet unbeknownst to the many guilds, imperial orders, and ministries of the empire, even to the emperor's own thoughts, was the deepest truth of all, that for many years the Iblisi were not as concerned with safeguarding the past as they were with avoiding destiny. The empire was doomed. The Iblisi alone knew it, and they alone had any hope of preventing it. Prevent it? Chadre thought as she sat on her throne. At any cost. The doors opposite her opened with a terrible booming sound that echoed between the squat pillars of the hall. The keeper smiled graciously at the figure approaching her with determined quick strides. Inquisitor Soen, Chadre said through a smile. How good of you to pay your... Keeper Chadre! Soen angrily cut across the keeper's words. Why am I here? The keeper drew in a breath before she lightly responded. Why, my very question to you, Inquisitor, why are you here? Soen ignored her attempt to blunt his anger. Three weeks! Three weeks since we returned from the Hyperion Plain, and still I'm kept in the Imperial City like some shackled animal! Hardly shackled. I would have thought you might have taken more time to recover from your journey, or at least reacquaint yourself with the pleasures of Ronos. You know that the city holds no interest for me. My duty lies in Vestasia, not behind these damp walls. Of course, Chadre said in purring tones. But I have only begun to bend the imperial will over Murialis and your bolters. It could take weeks more before we can apply any real pressure on— Keeper, we both know that I should have left weeks ago. Soen interrupted once more. We cannot be certain that Murialis will hold them at all. I must leave at once. We dare not risk losing them. Calm yourself, the keeper replied. Haste breeds mistakes, Soen. You of all people know that. Soen seemed about to make a sharp reply, but hesitated, his face relaxing slightly. Indeed, you are right, my keeper, but the circumstances dictate haste. I should not have returned so far as the Imperial City in the first place. Have a care, Soen, Jadre said with an edge in her voice. It was I that instructed you to return here and in doing so have cost us both not only weeks of delay, but the contact with the beacon stones that mark their path. So encountered. I could have been in Vestasia reacquiring them by now if you had— If I had done what? Bartered passage for you through the imperial folds? And just how would I have done that without giving the Okuran answers about the provinces, or the Myrdin Dai some report on the mess they are still cleaning up on the frontier? They only granted you and your quorum access last time to find out why they had been made out as fools. They certainly would not have done so again without receiving their payment for your last adventure. You may be a great Inquisitor Soen, but you know nothing about politics. One day you'll trip over your tongue once too often, boy, and fall where no amount of craft can save you. Forgive me. Keeper, Soen said carefully. I serve at your pleasure. Yes, you do, Chadre said, her tone still sharp. And you will continue to do so. Having been so adamant, I hesitate to tell you that I have indeed arranged passage with the Akuran through their imperial trade folds, as you requested. You have been granted an imperial charge that cannot be questioned— and it leaves you free to pursue your target at any price. Any price, you understand? Yes, my keeper. Chadre nodded with satisfaction. Very well, Soen. How do you intend to proceed? I must leave at once, keeper, Soen said. I'll follow the trade folds into occupied Chenandria, and then the old Northmarch folds as far as Yorani Keep. Then I'll make my way southwest to pick up their track once more. 
My mate remains aligned to the traitor's beacon stones. It is only a matter of time after that. The keeper raised her brow over her glossy black eyes. Time before what? Before I track down this Dracus and find out who he really is. So and said, If he's worth your time, Chidre, then I'll bring him back to you as a gift. Chidre smiled. She could imagine so thinking and rethinking this plan each day for the last three weeks. Bring this Dracus back to us, and we'll see if he is of any use. I'm counting on your skill and your discretion. No one may know of this, you understand. I am sending you out alone, and with no quorum in support. This is against the laws of our order, but under the circumstances I think it best you be left to act on your own. Wisdom, indeed. So and said with a smile. For if I am discovered, I will deny that this conversation ever took place. Chidre nodded. I believe we are both clear on this subject. Yes, Keeper. So and nodded. When may I leave? Within the hour, Chidre said. You are expected at the trade folds of the Okuran before noon. Thank you. I shall bring honor to your name, Chidre, Soen said with a slight bow and a wry smile. I have every confidence in you, Soen. Chidre smiled in return. The keeper watched her inquisitor as he backed a few steps from her, and then turned, his strides carrying him across the floor back to the still-open doors. He stopped, and flashing a sharp-toothed grin, pulled the doors closed as he bowed out of the room. Chidre sat for a moment, waiting for the deep silence to once again permeate the room. She always thought of the silence as a physical thing that she both welcomed and respected. She reveled in it for a while longer, until she was certain that it would not be disturbed by Soen again. You understand what you have heard? Chidre whispered into the silence. The silence whispered back. Yes, Lady Chitre. And your quorums are its members in place. Yes, Lady Chitre. Came the hushed response, barely echoing between the columns supporting the low ceiling overhead. They are arranged among the trade portals as you requested. Everything lies in wait. And none of the quorum members know your mission, the keeper said, stressing each of the words as she spoke. It is absolutely vital that you alone know your true mission, that you alone complete it. They know only that we serve the Iblisi, the voice replied. They will obey me without question. The keeper allowed herself a sad smile. He must never suspect you are tracking him. Never have the notion so much as into his head. If he so much as hears you breathing, you will be of no use to me. Yes, Lady Chudre. The keeper stood up from her throne and carefully descended the three steps to the floor of her audience hall. Tell it to me once again. Let me hear it in your own words. What is your first task? Track the Inquisitor Soen wherever he may go. Leave no trace of our passage. Follow him to a human slave named Dracus. The Dracus who bolted from House Timuron in the western provinces. That is right, the keeper purred. What is your second task? When we are assured of his identity, we are to capture this Dracus alive and kill any who may have associated with him. I am then to deliver this Dracus to you personally, here in this room. That is right, Chidre said, and then, holding up her hand, she paused. The keeper had thought this through again and again since that day at Togren fell tried to find a different course to take, 
but her first thought as she had sat on this same throne inside a tomb half a continent away remained her only answer. Soen was right. This Dracus could easily be mistaken for the bringer of doom to the Ronos Empire, especially because he was a weapon of untold destruction. The fall of the Empire was coming, as Chidre, Soen, and a number of other Inquisitors were well aware. Soen wanted to control that fall and emerge victorious from the rubble with the Iblisi to rule. Chidre shared that vision, but she also knew that such power was not something easily held in common with anyone, especially an Inquisitor with boundless ambition. Sooner or later, one of them, Chidre or Soen, would have to go. Better sooner than later, Chidre sighed to herself, and better Soen than her. And finally, Chidre spoke at last to the darkness, and then we are to track and kill Inquisitor Soen, the voice said, a rasping sound now apparent in its speech. So it had been said, and having been said was now the will of the Keeper. Killing Soen would not be easy, she mused, for that she had needed someone who was personally motivated and committed to the Inquisitor's death. Chidre smiled as she turned. From the shadows at the side of the hall a robed figure emerged. It drew its hood back, revealing a face that would have caused even elven adults to blanch. A flap of damaged skin sagged down over the elf's right eye, which was now a dreadful and useless milky gray in color. The skin of his face bore long scars and discoloration from slashing burns that ran up his long forehead to the elongated crown. But one particularly terrible scar pulled badly at the left corner of his mouth, lifting the lip on that side into an unnatural and perpetual snarl. Chadre sighed at the sight of him. Ah, I delayed as long as I dared. I had hoped that the healers of the Okuran could have done more for you, but there is no more time left to us. Are you ready, my son? Can you do this thing that the Order demands of you? To follow so into this human, rob him of his glory, and then kill him? The misshapen elf asked. After a slight pause, the figure fell to his knees. Yes! Oh, yes, I can with the greatest of pleasure, Lady Tidre. The keeper laid her long, bony hand atop the burn-scarred forehead of the elf kneeling before her. Then go with the blessings of the gods and the will of the emperor. Inquisitor Jukung. Jukung raised his face toward her, his effort at a grateful smile contorting his features into a grim mask. Book Three The Forgotten. Chapter Thirty One Fool's Errand. The dwarf stood on an outcropping of rock, surveying his own mind as much as the landscape spread before him. There were two obvious paths in the morning light. One lay northward, into the broad, unknowable expanse of the Vestasian savannah that ran to a flat and hazy horizon. The other path led eastward, up into the foothill foundations that formed the western end of the Aryan Mountains. He could see the peaks in the distance now outlined in the slowly warming twilight of the dawn. Northward with Dracus, eastward with his heart. In truth, back into the roots of the mountain had been his original, if somewhat desperate, plan. When the last throne had fallen, he was trapped with the heart of air, both of them hidden in the midst of the Ronos army occupying the cavern surrounding them on all sides, it was only a matter of time before the entirely too predictable elves would come with their gleaners and discover him and his treasure. Then Dracus had come, a gift from the forge of the gods, and the confused human became the means of Jugar's escape. That his escape involved placing himself into slavery was, he chuckled to himself, the very foundation of its brilliance. 
House Timuron was obviously just another of uncounted, self-important, and equally insignificant imperial houses of the Third Estate, aspiring to grandeur in the grandeur-ridden Ronos Imperium. A more important house, or perhaps one closer to the actual power of the Empire, might have recognized the heart of air for what it truly was, and then Jugar would have been a fool indeed. But a backwater house of the western provinces? No, that was a place that would not recognize what they had until he had used its power against them, caused their hearts to be torn still beating from their chests, and freed himself and his prize. That this human idiot heard the song of the northern legends in his mind made it all the easier. And it had all worked out so much better than he had planned. Jugar congratulated himself again on how well he had manipulated this Dracus fellow, to the point where his distraction had allowed the dwarf to recover the heart of air, and do all the damage that he had hoped to achieve. That Dracus and his companions had brought him north through the infernal elven folds had been a wonderful and happy accident that he had managed to steer toward Togren Fell, his intended destination all along. The westward bend in their course across Hyperia had been necessitated by the Ronos armies that remained encamped at the southern gates. But then things began to go wrong. The Hecariot had been a close thing, and then, try as he might, he could not influence Dracus, who had grown unreasonably stubborn, to turn them back north toward the mountains. Somehow that madwoman Lyric had put that nonsense about Murialis in his head. Even then he might have managed to persuade Dracus to turn north toward the end of the mountains, but his bad luck turned to worse. The Iblisi Inquisitor and his quorum had shown up at the most inopportune moment and forced them all into the lands of the dreadful Murialis Fairy Queen. But the dice of the gods had not stopped rolling, and even that apparent disaster had turned to his advantage— Murialis had bought into the Dracus legend. No wonder fairies are so fond of tales, and had not only spared their lives, but had managed to whisk them through her kingdom, and deposit them all at its northernmost boundaries almost exactly at the spot where, in his wildest dwarven dreams, he had hoped to come. So you're leaving us. Jugar actually started at the voice behind him. He slipped the black, cold crystal stone back into his pocket. Eh? Oh, <laughs> Dracus. My apologies. Dracus said, his own gaze fixed on the mountains in the distant east. Still, I'd be sorry to see you go. Go? The dwarf turned and smiled charmingly. No, friend Dracus, I was but looking on the ancestral mountains of the lost dwarves. Just a fool lost in thought. Not so lost, I think. Dracus replied. I've been doing some thinking of my own. Just before the last battle. Before we met, Braun told me. Who? Jugar asked. Braun. Dracus answered with some annoyance. Our proxy. You don't know him. Anyway, he pointed out that there were no young nor old among the dwarven dead. Indeed. Yes, indeed. Dracus continued. So I think they must have gone somewhere, Juga. There must be dwarves somewhere, and a great many of them, I wouldn't doubt. This mm, brawn friend of yours seems uncommonly clever, Jugar sniffed. My point is that you should go and find them, Dracus said, nodding toward the mountains. You've done enough for us. Nonsense, Jugar laughed. We've only just started down our road. My road, not yours, Dracus said. Why have you even come with us this far? I half expected you to leave us at Togren Fell. He nearly had, Jugar thought to himself, but now he wavered. Jugar gazed at the distant outline of the Aryan range to the east and sighed with great satisfaction. He pulled the heart of air from his pocket, fingering its cold facets as he tumbled it over and over with the fingers of his hand. There beneath the mountain, he thought, his people waited. There, deep in the dark roots and secret places farther below than elves or men ever suspected, his fellow dwarves waited for the return of the heart of air, and through it the healing of their race. But healing was not what Jugar had in mind.
vengeance, retribution, justice, pain. That is what filled his thoughts and schemes. Along with the growing conviction in his soul that Dracus could be the means by which he could achieve all his dark and cold desires. Could Dracus be the real thing? If he was, then Dracus could be the means of spilling enough elven blood to satisfy even Jugar's thirst for revenge. All he needed was for Jugar the fool to guide his steps a little longer and a little farther north. Sometimes it's a good idea to take a road you've never walked before and see where it leads, Dracus, Jugar said through a gap-toothed smile. I'd like to walk yours a bit longer and see where it takes me. Dracus! The human warrior and the dwarf returned from the ridge to the small encampment. Ethis tended a cheery fire that was somehow almost entirely devoid of smoke. Jugar moved quickly to the flames, warming his hands. Dracus would have joined him, but the lyric rushed up to him before he could take another step. The pale face of the lyric was staring at him. Dracus, it is long past time you returned. There is a journey before us, and you are our guide. Dracus took the lyric's offered hand. Thank you. And you are... The lyric flashed a bright, roguish smile. Her emerging hair was almost white in its lightness, a fuzzy nimbus framing her pinched face. You are still confused from the journey. You will remember me as Felicia of the Mists. Yes, Dracus nodded, trying to remember just who the lyric last thought herself to be. The, uh, Princess of the Isles. Princess of the Erebusian Isles, the lyric corrected with a light laugh. Fear not, good Dracus. We raiders of the Nortesian coast are far more forgiving than our frightening legends make us out to be. When we reach the coast, our cousins who sail the Bay of Thetis will show you such hospitality that you will never again forget my true name. I shall look forward to it, Dracus said but his words seemed to fade toward the end as his eyes tried without success to take in the vista that lay just beyond the lyric. The morning sun cast long shadows across a low, jagged terrain that gave way quickly to a seemingly infinite plain of grassland, marred only occasionally by a grouping of solitary trees or the flash of water through the shimmering waves of the warming air. To his right, Distant purple peaks rose above the line of dense trees that ran from the east behind him and continued to form a great arch that vanished into a hazy and indistinct horizon to the west. The sky itself seemed larger to him, stretched over such a vastness so flat that he felt he might almost fall off of it. Ethis looked up, his face now the typical blankness that characterized most of the Chimerian race. Good morrow, Dracus. Dracus ignored the Chimerian. Juga, since you're determined to be here with us, perhaps you could tell us just where are we? We are precisely where you asked that we should be, the dwarf said brightly. We are beyond the northern border of the cursed Hyperion woodland and now stand on the verge of Vestasia itself. We have traveled just short of eighty leagues and seemingly overnight. That far? Dracus asked. How is that possible? The dwarf looked up from the campfire and smiled. My good Dracus, it is a miracle, nothing short of a miracle of the gods that we have been brought here, carried by the demons of Queen Murialis for reasons of her own, and deposited as you yourself requested here across the northern boundaries of her most terrible and feared kingdom— I had hoped to skirt the western slopes of the Aryan range and avoid any danger that her minions might present, and yet here we are, and a week's journey the richer for it, and fortunate, fortunate indeed, for all our possessions remain with us, and not a piece of lint nor thread subtracted from the lot as one might expect from the fairy folk. A week's worth of travel in a single day, thanks to the capricious whim of the fairy queen. Hardly capricious, Ethis added, his eyes fixed on Dracus. Dracus negotiated our passage for us. It seems Morialis is a reasonable monarch after all. 
The human warrior eyed Ethis critically for a moment, but decided not to let the comment escalate into an argument. Dracus had done nothing that brought them through the strange woods of Murialis, except to let the fairy queen believe that he might be this mythical fulfillment of some ancient prophecy that everyone seemed to know about except him. Ethis had been the one who had saved them, bringing them into the fairy realm and ensuring that they weren't summarily killed. If Ethis had his reasons for letting the rest of the group think that Dracus had been the big hero, then an argument over who had actually saved them would have been foolish. They were in enough trouble without fighting among themselves over anything, so Dracus turned his mind to other things. Vestasia, Dracus thought. It felt different from the Hyperion Plain that they had crossed with such trepidation just the week before. Though it had been deserted, Dracus felt it was a land where civilization had once flourished and could return again to tame the broad plain and cultivate its expanse. The overwhelming impression that the warrior had of the grass and rock-choked flatlands before him was that it was entirely wild, forbidding, and savage. It was a bad lands with its own natural law that defied anyone from the outside who wished to impose any rule other than that of unstoppable, deadly nature. Beautiful, is it not? Dracus turned toward the deep voice. You think it beautiful? Belog seemed to stand taller than ever. His great flat snout was raised as though sniffing the wind for the scent of prey. Ru'u Kog stood behind him, but presented a completely different demeanor. His shoulders were hunched forward, lowering his head with the curve of his back as he looked over the plain. Yes, mm, beautiful, Belog said, a smile pulling at the corners of his mouth and baring his fangs as he spoke. This place is known among my race as the Land of the Shamed. It is the place where cowards come to die in exile from their clans. It is supposed to be a cursed place. It is a cursed place, Ru'ukog said abruptly. Cursed? How is it cursed? It does not matter. You are here with us, Dracus. Belog continued. It is sung of in the prophecy that where you walk, the cursed land shall be made whole beneath your feet. You seem terribly pleased at the prospect of crossing this cursed place, Ethis observed. I find the open land calls me, Belog said, drawing in a deep breath. <sighs> it brings into my mind the great plains of Chalandria, where my father and his father's fathers hunted our prey and fought our battles down through all our songs of glory. Ru'u Kog and I can run in the open. I have no desire to run, Ru'u Kog grumbled. Then I shall feel the wind pass through the hairs that are springing from my mane, and the sun beat upon my back. The open sky shall be my temple, and all the wild beasts shall flee from me in fear. I shall pit my speed and strength against them, and bring them down in righteous sacrifice. In your name, I shall hunt for you, Dracus, and for all of us. I shall taste the warm blood of my prey in my mouth once more, as the star gods intended from the beginning. Dracus turned to Ethis. What about you? I can assume you've been here before. Here, yeah, yes, Ethis said, then nodded toward the great plain to the north. But there, no. That is a land that cannot be tamed, a land too wild and harsh even for the determined and cunning elves of Ronos. The Empire has extended its influence farther to the north and east, but into this place they rarely bother to venture except on occasional slaving expeditions on the southern shores of the Bay of Thetis. Dracus was having trouble hearing what Ethis was saying. He had to remind himself that he could not trust the Chimerian, a creature that a small part of his mind still told him was a trusted colleague and brother-in-arms, but only, he reminded himself, because the devotions had made him believe it. Dracus had no memory of Ethis before the battle for the Ninth Throne, and his actions since the fall of their devotions 
his alarming transformations in the fairy kingdom, and his use of them to trick Dracus into revealing so much of himself, had left the human hurt and suspicious. Beyond his distrust, the song was running through his mind, and it distracted him once more. It was never far from his thoughts, and was growing stronger with every step they took toward the north. In some ways this was a comfort to him. Before it had been a weak annoyance, like an itch that one could not quite reach. With its increasing prominence, he was better able to tune it out, and even ignore it from time to time. But occasionally it dislodged memories that rushed to the surface of his thoughts, and broke upon his consciousness. "'Well, that's not what Mom says,' Polis answered back, sweat pouring from his forehead. "'It's north, in Vestasia, maybe, beyond a sea of water and even a sea of sand. That's where we're going, Drake. You and me together. No one will ever make us work again. You wait and see.' Drakus forced his attention back to Ethus as he spoke. "'No real knowledge of the nomadic tribes that managed to make their home here.' Ethis concluded, I took a very long road to avoid crossing that dangerous wasteland. No one enters the savannah of Vestasia lightly. All the more reason we should, Dracus answered. What better place to hide than a place no one wishes to enter? Ethis raised both his hairless brows in surprise. It's north, in Vestasia, Dracus said with a thin smile. You wait and see. They walked for five days across the plain without feeling they were making any progress. Ethis insisted that they pick a point in the distance in the morning that appeared to be north and then keep their track fixed on that destination. This almost always amounted to finding a distant grouping of trees that could be spied across the seemingly endless grasses. The terrain was far from entirely flat, Undulations and occasional rock outcroppings gave some variety to what otherwise would have been a near tabletop flatness to the land. The grasses were yellowing, and the ground beneath them parched. Their footfalls raised great clouds of gray dust that drifted upward, which greatly concerned Ethis, as their movements could undoubtedly be seen for many leagues in any direction. Mornings were the time that Dracus liked best, for each of them worked in harmony toward their common good. Belog, who had disappeared the previous night, would return exhausted in the morning, but always with a fresh kill. Ru'ukag would quarter the creature and properly butcher its meat so that it could be cooked. Jugar would busy himself finding or making a properly clear space while Ethis constructed a fire pit. Mala and Dracus would cook the meat for them, while the lyric always seemed to appear with wild roots or berries though none of them could determine just how or where she came by them. Then their meal concluded, and the remaining cooked meats packed for use later in the day, everyone would see to cleaning up the camp before setting off. Belog would remain behind and sleep in the early part of the day, but he would always join them by afternoon, his deep-throated voice singing through the grasses as he approached. By midday of the sixth day of their trek northward, they came upon a wide, meandering river that wound its twisted way across the plain. Wildebeest, antelope, and ibex appeared from time to time at the river's edge to drink, each one a sight that astonished the humans, and even, Dracus noted with amusement, the Chimarian. Jugar, at each opportunity, managed to spin a tapestry of knowledge about these beasts based entirely on stories he had heard, or, Dracus was convinced, that the dwarf made up on the spot. They followed the river for four additional days, but by the morning of the tenth day, it was obvious that the river's course was leading more toward the west. When Belog reported that there were watering holes to be found on their northern course, Dracus determined to abandon the river, and once more they set off across the plain. It was on the evening of the thirteenth day that they saw the great dust trail crossing the plains to the north. For three days they followed the long cloud of dust that seemed to precede them. By the end of the seventeenth day on the savannah, Dracus could see that the clouds of dust they had been following ended at a brown knob, too distant for them to make out any detail. When Belog left on his evening hunt, he promised to hunt in that direction, 
and report on what he saw over their breakfast. Dracus waited from dawn of the following day to hear Belog's report. The manticore did not return. Chapter 32 The Haka Aran You've killed us, Dracus! Mala screamed, her fists flailing against him as he tried desperately to restrain her without doing her any harm. He was finding it impossible to do either. You did this! You killed Timuron, destroyed our home, destroyed our lives! All reason had fled from Mala. The despair and anger that she had pushed down behind a wall of apathy from the first step they had taken into Vestasia now exploded in a senseless rush of blind anger and rage focused on Dracus. She shoved at him, pushing herself away and staggering back onto the trampled grass where they had all spent the night. Dracus was keenly aware of the audience around them. Ethis stood with both sets of arms folded across his chest, detached and observant. Jugar looked as though he were enjoying a play that was being enacted for his benefit, while Ru'u Kog was openly enjoying Dracus being ridiculed and shamed by his supposed mate. The lyric, at least, was paying no attention whatsoever. Mala glared at Dracus. I've walked for days, days into this, this, this nothing, because you said we should. And now the one creature that provided for us brought us our food and made it even possible to live in this... This armpit of the world has vanished because you sent him off to find out about something you know nothing about. Dracus breathed in deeply, reigning in his own rage and embarrassment. Mala, this isn't the time for this. You just need to... No! Mala shouted back running one hand in frustration back from her forehead through the red hair that was now nearly an inch long. I do not just need to do anything for you anymore. You ruined it all, Dracus. Ruined our lives and let us out here to die. Dracus let out his breath and gazed up into the sky. He could feel their eyes on him, waiting. Fine, he said at last a cheek muscle twitching as he spoke. What? Mala said between clenched teeth. Fine. You're right. He was not looking at her, his gaze fixed on a horizon of his own choosing. I did it all, Mala, just the way you said. I brought down House Timuron and woke us all up to the lie we were living. I brought us into this dangerous, barren place. If it makes you feel any better, I agree with you that it is entirely my fault. Then Dracus looked directly at Mala with the same cold stare through which he had often viewed his prey in battle. But you, Mala, are here. All of us are here. How you got here or why isn't going to change the fact that you are here right now. So you have a choice to make. It's your choice and you're going to be responsible for it. He took a step toward the woman. She stepped back. Dracus could not decide if her look was of fear or hate. You can either stay here, curse my name for as many days as you have left to you, and die, Dracus said. Or you can shut up, come with us, and do something that might get us through another day. Mala glowered back at him. How dare you even? It's up to you. You may not think I'm much. Dracus continued, but right now, I'm all you've got. I'm going to find my friend Belog, if he's still alive, and find some way to live another day. Come or stay, you decide. Dracus turned to face the rest of his companions. That goes for you, too. Die on your own, or come with me now. He gazed out over the tall grass and pointed toward the strange brown mound to the north. He went that way. Let's go. Ethis smiled slightly, and then, drawing his sword, walked in the direction Dracus was still indicating. The dwarf took his cue from the Chimerian and followed closely behind. The lyric jumped up from where she had been otherwise seemingly ignorant of the proceedings, and slapping Dracus on the shoulder in earnest support, quickly fell in line. Ru'u Kog looked everywhere but in the direction of Dracus, 
and lurched into movement after the lyric. Mala remained stone still. Dracus turned, drew his own sword, and fell in line after Ru'ukag. It was many long minutes before he heard Mala following behind him through the grass. What is it? Dracus whispered as he crouched down in the grass. Ethis knelt on one knee next to him. I don't know. I've never seen anything like it. The tall grasses ended abruptly just a few feet in front of them. Beyond was a barren ground completely denuded of any plant life, perhaps a thousand feet wide surrounding a mound of sun-baked mud so enormous that neither Dracus nor Ethis could see the sides from where they watched. It looked smaller this morning, Dracus mused. It also looked a good deal closer, Ethis observed, gazing at the deepening hues of the horizon. We've only got about an hour of daylight left now. What do you suggest? I don't know, Dracus sputtered. It's... well, it's enormous. Someone or something must have built it here. Look, there, see the way there's an overhang all around the bottom of the mound. It curves outward to keep the predators off the top. The thing has openings all around it under that overhang, but they each seem to be blocked by a large stone. And we don't know what's on the other side of those stones either. The two of us are the only warriors left in a group whose remaining skills include butchering, storytelling, singing, and complaining. So you were planning on storming the defenses? Ethis asked. Dracus chuckled. <laughs> no. But we haven't seen any signs of movement out of the... Wait. Did you hear that? You were talking at the time, and quiet, Dracus said, holding up his hand as he cocked his head to one side. It was a strange, hollow sound, but in the silence around the mound it was unmistakable. Dracus, come! Dracus turned to Ethis, but the Chimerian was already craning his neck higher, straining toward the sound. Dracus! Ethis! Come! Where is it coming from? Dracus whispered hoarsely. I don't see where... Wait. Ethis pointed with his upper right hand. There, just to the right of center, I would swear that was closed just a moment ago. Dracus gazed closer in among the deepening shadows being cast by the overhang around the mound. One of the blocked openings was suddenly and inexplicably open. A tunnel ran backward and up into the mound. Two torches burned in sconces mounted on either wall. That's a little too accommodating, Ethis said. The voice from within called once more. Breakers! Ethis! Night is falling! Come! Ru'ukag, Mala, Juga, Lyric, come! It's Belag, Dracus said, as much for his own assurance as Ethis's benefit. No, it can't be, Ethis countered. This makes no sense, Dracus. Perhaps not. But I'm going to get a closer look, Dracus said, dropping his pack. He unstrapped the small shield and adjusted the sword at his hip. You wait here and watch. If I don't come back, get everyone out of here and back to some more civilized place. North, I suppose? Ethis quipped. Dracus chuckled. <laughs> if I don't come back, I wouldn't advise following such an obviously flawed prophecy. Dracus bounded from the cover of the grass straight onto the flat open ground. He ran quickly across its surface puzzled at the springy quality of the ground under his feet as he ran, but too intent on the opening looming before him to stop. He flattened himself against the wall next to the opening, and then slowly turned to look inside. The tunnel floor rose upward. Pairs of torches fluttered in a breeze coming from inside the tunnel, emitting greasy smoke as they flagged, each pair lighting the way farther inside. The upward curve of the tunnel itself prevented him from seeing more than a hundred feet or so down its length. The closing mechanism was obvious to him now, as a round, carved stone rolled out of its channel and into a space in the wall. Something had built this place. Rikas, I've got to explain something. 
The voice was unmistakably that of Belog, but there was an odd quality to it that Dracus could not identify. Dracus ducked into the tunnel and, grabbing a torch, ran up the curving incline. He passed several pairs of torches along the way as the rough-walled tunnel first curved upward into an incline and then began to curve down away from him. There were no side passages nor openings that he could see. Each step carried him farther and deeper into the great mound. The tunnel ended abruptly in a black void so large that the torch in his hand did not penetrate it. Just over a hundred feet in front of him, illuminated by a single torch, sat a manticore on a woven throne. Belog? Dracus called in a loud whisper. The manticore stood. Dracus, thank the gods. I must beg your forgiveness. I would have come, but the Hakaran would not permit me to leave. Dracus did not wait, but walked quickly toward his friend. You are being held a prisoner, then? No, not exactly. Please, Dracus, I need to explain. Explanations later, Dracus said. First, let's get you out of here. No, you don't understand, Belog said, holding his huge hands out in front of him. I need to warn you. The Hakaran. Warn me. Dracus stopped at once, crouching down and turning slowly, his senses heightened. What is it? The Hakaaran. Belog started again. They love to. In that instant, ten thousand torches flared into life. Their light banished the blackness from the enormous chamber. Welcome! Dracus screamed in shock, his body reacting at once in fear. When he came to his senses once more, he was crouching, his sword drawn and shield held high as he stared in wonder. The Hakaaran, Belog sighed, love to surprise guests. The torches illuminated hundreds of caves that honeycombed the walls of the mud cavern. Branching caverns could be seen in several directions, now completely visible in the bright light but it was the eyes staring back at him that astonished him the most. Each of the hundreds of caverns was filled with short, reddish-brown creatures with enormous eyes and hooked noses. They wore hides, pelts, and tanned leathers for clothing, and each held a torch in large hands with long fingers. Dracus was standing next to a great blackened pit filled with dried grass bundles and even a few dead trees. As he watched, two of the small creatures scurried forward, and tossed their torches onto the pile. The pit erupted into a towering fire, and the thousands of creatures in the caverns lining the walls broke into an enormous cheer. Where in the abyss have you been? Dracus yelled at Belog, trying to be heard over the noise. Here! Belog roared back. They caught me last night trying to get a better look at them. They have a rather impressive defensive plan that— Not now! Dracus yelled back. Why didn't you come back? They wouldn't let me. Belog replied. We need their help, but I didn't want to hurt any of them. So you just sat here? Dracus barked. No. Belog shook his great head. The Haka Aran are mud gnomes, wanderers of the wasteland. About the only thing they love better than surprising other creatures is hearing their stories. Dracus was not sure he heard the manticore correctly over the noise. Did you say stories? Yes, the manticore bellowed in reply. Dracus looked up, suddenly aware that the cheering had become rhythmic. Oh, no. Dracus's murmured words were completely obscured by the chanting. Dracus! 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 The human warrior turned to the manticore and smiled grimly as he yelled. I think I can guess which story you've been telling. Chapter 33 Caliph Son Chindre, Inquisitor of the Iblisi! 
The brilliantly robed gnome shouted from the far end of the great house hall, throwing his chubby arms wide. My dear old friend, the sight of you fills my eyes with joy. Soen bowed deeply at the hall entrance, dust billowing from his robes as he quickly returned upright and threw his own arms wide. His narrow face split into a sharp-toothed smile. Argos Helm, Caliph of the Jekarian, and my most honored citizen of the North. The burdens of my journey are lightened at your sight. Argos Helm slapped both his fat hands down on the top of his trouser-covered thighs with a resounding clap. This caused both his short legs to jerk forward slightly in reflex, his ornate silk shoes swinging away from the tall throne, where they hung two full hand-breaths above the floor. Soen determinedly held his fixed smile, fingering his mate staff in his right hand, and mentally reviewing the many ways in which he might use it to most satisfactorily obliterate the pompous, scheming, slippery, and utterly corrupt gnome who sat so cheerfully before him. Argos was the latest in an unfortunately long line of caliphs who had ruled the stone gnome tribes of the northern coastal regions of Vestasia since the Grand Army of the Emperor had come to a disappointing end to its march at these miserable shores three centuries before. Mortis Helm was only one of several dozen self-proclaimed warlords, but it was he alone who had both the shrewd foresight and unbridled pragmatic opportunism to ally himself and his family with the weary invaders. Mortis was in awe of the might and splendor of the Ronos Imperium from the distant south, especially their stand against the humans, who had in his mind long ignored and dismissed his people as unworthy of their attentions. He envisioned a day when all his people would be a part of that empire, forever giving up the wandering ways of the tribes, living in one place in sheltering walls of stone, while enjoying at their ease the luxurious splendors of a more civilized world. Of course, being the only visionary he knew, Mortis would rule them on behalf of the greater good. The J. Ka'arin would no longer govern themselves, but then governance was such a burden for the unworthy and unenlightened, better that he should do their thinking for them. Not all of the other warlords agreed with this view of the world, but Mortis Helm was not bound by such mundane considerations as ethics, and he had the support of the Ronas legions of conquest. A little treachery went a long way, especially when it was coupled to an incredibly huge lie. He convinced the stone gnomes that he and his tribe had actually effected the surrender of the elven legions to him. At the same time, Mortis offered to hand over the effective rule of the stone gnomes to the elves, so long as they were discreet about their arrangement and supported his deception. Soon the elven commanders, with smiles on their faces, not unlike the one which Soen now wore, fulfilled their promise and installed Mortis Helm as the first caliph of the J. Ka'arin, master of all the stone gnomes of the Vestasian coast. Succeeding generations saw the dreadfully accurate fulfillment of Mortis Helm's original vision with the establishment of an Okuran trade portal in Urani Keep, the farthest portal of the northwest fold chain. Trade goods from the heart of the empire were soon flooding the village. The stone gnomes, once proud nomadic warriors, were enslaved at last, not by chains or whips, but by soft clothes, easily bartered meals, and their own complacency. The old stories were still told to their children, but with each generation it was harder to believe that gnomes had lived any other way than as a drone outpost of Ronos civilization. The one thing that never seemed to fade was the general hatred of the J. Ka'arin gnome citizens for their Helm Caliphate rulers. The Helm dynasty's treachery was by no means limited to the origins of the Caliphate, and over time had become the stuff of legend among the stone gnomes. Down the centuries there had been repeated attempts by various factions— usually descendants of the ancient warlord families, to oust the contemporary Helm Caliph, install their own warlord, and foment a radical change in the J. Ka'arin government. Time and again, the Iblisi were called upon by the successive Caliphs to journey to this miserable outpost of the empire 
and shore up the sagging fortunes of the Helm dynasty. So when shining black eyes studied the caliph, even as he strained at his studied pleasant grin. Argos was only the latest incarnation of the line of succession, and if anything, had proved himself as typical an example of his forebearers as possible. He was short, even for a gnome, the top of his head, minus the ridiculous crown, barely coming to the midpoint of Soen's thigh. His gray beard was carefully groomed, coming to two separated points just below his waist. These he kept tucked inside a wide belt that he wore incongruously over an elven imperial tunic. His skin was of a reddish-brown color reminiscent of cherry wood. He had the large, hooked nose that was typical of his race, and bright, narrow eyes with perpetual smile lines at the corners. The top of his head was bald, shaved, so unsuspected, so that he might look more like the elves with whom he did his most important business. Indeed, the great house hall itself was a ridiculously bad imitation of the emperor's audience hall in Ronos. The great domed ceiling was reincarnated as a stick framework tied together with rawhide thongs. Even then it was not properly put together and sagged badly toward the eastern wall. Someone had shorted up with additional long poles inside the dome, which destroyed any marvelous architectural effect the dome might have presented in the first place, but at least it didn't look on the verge of collapse. The walls were entirely of native stone covered in a thick adobe mud, but the mud itself had been scratched at by gnome artists with sticks in an attempt to reproduce the delicate marble friezes of the emperor's throne room. The mud had proved to be a poor medium for such reproductions, and so one often had to remind himself not to look at them. The throne was bad enough, a vulgar and unintentionally sacrilegious copy of the seat of the empire, that were its existence generally known, might have been deemed sufficient to put an end to the Helm Caliph line once and for all. The throne was, like most things, entirely too big for Argo's helm. The Caliph had to bounce twice on the cushion before he could gain enough momentum to hop down from his perch. You honor me and all my people. For you, the generous nature of my heart is laid open without reserve. But how is it you have come to me in such a state? What long roads have brought my favorite son of the empire to my humble self? I regret that my mission requires urgency, O oh, great caliph. So and said, letting a hint of deference into his voice. I would have made myself more presentable to you, but I am on the Emperor's errand and time is against me. The Emperor's errand! Argos's rubbery face affected astonishment as he waved the Iblisi to approach him. Perhaps from the Imperial City itself? Yes, O oh great Caliph. Soen began. Ah, to visit the heart of the Empire! Argos opined to see its towers and walk its streets. I have heard of your citadels that float among the clouds and the magic of your aether that flows like water from your wells. I should dearly love one day to make the journey and stand among my fellow citizens. Soen gripped his staff until his fingers lost all color. Argos was a citizen of the Empire, but only just. He was considered to be of the Sixth Estate, technically a citizen by the laws of the Empire, but devoid of any real rights. It was reserved largely for elves who had no social station whatever, and was the last refuge of elven criminals. It was also a status held out as a reward to slaves who had performed some heinous deed for the Empire. Betrayal, murder, assassination, spying, and the like. It was rarely granted to slaves, and was relatively meaningless when it was given. Perhaps the caliph shall see it one day, Soen said as evenly as he could. But the way is long and arduous. I myself had some trouble along the way. No, may the gods forbid. The North March folds can be treacherous. So advised, and dusty, as you can see. But my need is great and my time is short. 
Then come at once, my friend. I shall forgive at once your ill manners and the need of haste and history, for no doubt you are on a mission that impacts both. Soen tried for a moment to make sense out of Argos's words, but realized it was pointless. The caliph often misspoke, a problem that had been the root cause of several assassination attempts. The inquisitor simply took in a long breath, nodded, and walked quickly toward the short ruler with his staff in hand. Oh, great caliph, your words are as wise as they are meaningful. You have no doubt already divined that I have come to request a boon of your eminent self. Argos frowned uncertainly. I need a favor, Soen urged. Ah! The caliph's face brightened. Of course! I am most anxious to assist the will of the emperor in all things. You have but to ask, and Argos Helm shall grant all that is in my power to give. Please sit with me as brothers, and we shall discuss your needs. The caliph indicated three curved benches set at one side of the hall. Together they formed a broken circle, a meteorol in the gnome tongue, which translated into story circle. It was where gnomes traditionally gathered to converse, discuss, and listen to stories. It was, so unnoted, the only gnomish conceit in the entire hall. The tall elven inquisitor sat down on one of the benches. It was unfortunately built to gnome specifications. Soen was more stooping than sitting. Argos took no notice of his guest's discomfiture and plopped himself down on an opposite bench. There! Argos leaned forward and spoke quietly. What favor might I do for my good friend Soen? I am looking for a man. Soen began. A man! Argos interrupted, stroking his beard. I don't know about a man. I can get you a woman. A good number of them, in fact, I should think. But ours is a backward people not as enlightened as the heart of the great Ronas Imperium. No, Argos. Just give me a moment, friend. I might be able to come up with a man for you. No. Soen began fingering his staff once more. I am looking for a specific man, a human bolter. Argos's eyes were losing focus. Bolter, bolter, a runaway slave, Soen continued, a human male. We believe he and a number of fellow travelers left the Murialis woods and were making their way into Vestasia. Murialis! Argos repeated as he nodded his head vaguely. Suddenly, his eyes focused, shifting to stare at the Iblisi. Murialis! That! Murialis! The witch of the southern mountains! Yes! Soen continued. I believe they may have been traveling north. But that's over one hundred and seventy leagues from here! Argos laughed incredulously. Yes, Soen agreed, and it is land with which I am not familiar. What can you tell me about it? Argos leaned back, his face turned upward as he considered the question. He began stroking his beard with his left hand, as though trying to pull some answer out of it. Ah, you believe your quarry is in the great savanna? Soen nodded. If that is to the north of Murialis lands, then yes. Difficult place, that savanna, Argos mused. You'll need to travel south around the edge of Gnavis Bay, then follow the Lenadio River inland until you cross at the confluence. West beyond the river is the great savanna, filled with wild creatures and death. Perhaps you would like some men to accompany you, our finest warrior guards, and at a most reasonable price. I could get you some women also, but that would be more difficult and naturally more expensive.
No! Soen said, his sharp teeth grinding slightly as he spoke. I don't need an army, just your... your most excellent advice. Have you any news of my prey? There are three humans, a pair of manticores, and a Chimerian who... A Chimerian! <laughs> Argos laughed. That sounds like the beginning of a joke. I assure you it is not. Soen snapped, then drew in a breath. Have you any word of such strangers? In the savannah! Argos chuckled. <laughs> no one cares what happens in the savannah. Isn't there anyone? Any tribes who might have seen my prey? Ah, perhaps the Hakaarin, Argos said with a disdainful sniff. Hakaarin, so urged. Foolish creatures. You could barely call them gnomes, really. Argo shrugged. Mud gnomes of the great savannah. Backward savages that constantly wander the savannah waste, traveling from mud pile to mud pile. They have no appreciation for property, no understanding of the finer things of the world. Uncivilized and unworthy of your attentions, my friend. They cover the savannah like a river of idiots, never stopping long enough to build anything of value. But if anyone will have seen your bolters, did you call them? The savages of the Hakaarin will know of it. The doors were closed, and at last Argos pulled himself back up onto his throne and sat on it with satisfaction. The gnome caliph relished the moment. After all, he had a family tradition to uphold. All of his helm ancestors had been brilliant politicians and strategists, he reasoned. Otherwise, how could they have stayed in power so long? So he, too, had to be as masterful and cunning as his forebears— this time he was more cunning than them all, for he would outsmart an Iblisi. Fun! the caliph yelled, and at his word a gnome guard appeared from a side door, resplendent in his ridiculous armor. Yes, a oh great caliph! Fon barked. There is an elf awaiting word for me in the shadow caves. Do you know them? They're in the gully north of the city. I know them, O oh great caliph. Tell him his friend journeys into the great savannah, the caliph grinned, and tell him to follow the trails of the Hakaarin. The gnome bit his lower lip for a moment. O oh great caliph, how will I know I have the right elf? You idiot! Argos screamed. How many elves are there in this province? Sorry, my caliph, the gnome mumbled. Ah, very well, Argos grumbled. His name is Jokung. He is an inquisitor of the empire and will reward us for our service. Yes, so great, caliph. And we must always be grateful to the empire. Argos sighed then in a flash of inspiration, turned and put his hand in a semblance of benevolence on the helmeted head of the guard. Quickly, write this down so that we can have it written on our next wall. We must always be grateful to the Empire, for without it all the gnomes would be forced to endure terrible suffrage. Chapter 34 Traveler's Tales Aye, there he stood, Dracus the Just, atop the very throne of the Dwarven Kingdoms. His hands were stained with the blood of a thousand dwarves, the sworn enemies of his cruel masters, as he took the crown from the last of the Dwarven Kings. 
The dwarf's voice filled the cavernous space inside the mud gnome's city adjacent to the main fire pit. He stood in the center of an enormous crowd of mud gnomes, all staring back at him in rapt attention. On the fringes of this congregation, however, a number of gnomes were talking excitedly and gesturing wildly. These would then fall away from the crowd and meld back into the constant stream of mud gnomes that swept past them in an unending river only to be immediately replaced with yet more gnomes who would chatter away at the fringes of the group, trying, it seemed, to catch up to events in the story before they arrived. A few of these would settle more toward the middle, where the dwarf was blathering on, while others fell back into the perpetual parade. It was an audience whose comings and goings seemed to have little reference to the story as it was being told. The mud gnomes might love stories, but Dracus could not be sure that any one of them had heard a single one of Jugar's tales from beginning to end. They seemed to be perpetually in motion and unable to stay in any one spot long enough for a long joke, let alone an epic tale. At the edge of the cavern, Two additional figures watched in stillness as the river of gnomes swirled around them. "'Jugar is in rare form tonight,' said Ethis, both pairs of his arms folded across his chest. "'Yes,' Dracus said in disgust. "'Rare, almost raw.' "'You don't approve?' Ethis asked in a calm, droll manner. "'Is that meant to be a joke?' Dracus complained. Just listen to him. Jugar stood, his thick arms raised above him, his head bent backward in the drama of his storytelling. The gnomes were leaning toward him now. There, Draca stood, gazing upon the fabled crown of the dwarves, its jewels sparkling like all the stars of the winter sky, his mighty army arrayed about him, howling in their blood-crazed frenzy for more slaughter, more violence, more death to fill their empty souls. Draca saw in that dwarven crown all the terrible sins of his elven masters, the pain of his fellow slaves, the loss of their dignity and their life's blood, all sacrificed on the altar of Ronas' ambition to take one more jeweled crown into the already burgeoning coffers of the elven state. What was this crown, weighed in the balance against the thousands of lives he had taken to obtain it? What was this crown, weighed in the balance of his own soul? That's it, Dracus grumbled, taking a step forward. I've got to put a stop to this. Just a moment, Ethis said, reaching out with one of his left hands and restraining Dracus by the shoulder. I think he's nearly finished. Jugar's voice dropped dramatically into hushed tones, drawing his eager audience even closer to him. So, what did Dracus do? The gnomes leaned closer still. He threw the crown away from him! Jugar shouted, reenacting the moment by swinging his arm in a wide arc over the heads of the nearest gnomes. The gnomes gasped in astonishment. That's the truth of it, and may the god strike me down otherwise. Jugar concluded. Drake has tossed away the riches of the elven world, a crown whose wealth would have bought him power and position even among his evil elven masters. For he saw that wealth and power were meaningless if one pays for it with one's own soul. And from that day to this, Dracus the Just, Dracus the Wise, Dracus of the Prophecy, has wandered the face of the world seeking to fulfill his destiny, destroy evil, and bring lasting peace to all. And now... Jugar paused, then pointed his finger directly toward the astonished Dracus. Now he has come to you! The mud gnomes leaped up, cheering. Oh no, Dracus murmured, his eyes going wide. 
No. No! The gnomes rushed toward Dracus in a riotous wave of approval, sweeping the human off his feet. Dracus! 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 Put me down! He insisted to no avail. He managed to twist in the mud gnome's collective grasp as they lifted him over their heads. Ethis! Where are they taking me? I suspect back to the feast hall! Ethis replied through a perplexing smile splitting his malleable face. Again? That seems to be their preferred way of showing their appreciation for a good story. Ethis replied, pushing gingerly away from the dried mud wall of the story cavern. Besides, we're leaving with them in the morning, and we'd all rather do so on a full stomach. I don't see the need for any complaint. The food here is quite good, and they seem perfectly content to share it with us. But it's a lie! They don't seem to care. Ethis observed as the gnomes once again carried Dracus above their shoulders and down a ramp toward their common feast hall. If anything, they seem to prefer it. Early the next morning, Dracus stood outside the great mud city of the Hakaaran mud gnomes and waited in the cool dawn with Chugar, Ethis, Belog, and Ru'ukag, with their traveling packs filled to overflowing in preparation for their journey. What are we waiting for? Ru'ukag grumbled. The sooner we get moving, the quicker we're out of this cursed plain. We're waiting for Mala and the Lyric, Dracus responded. A pair of gnomes came with word that they would be late, but would be along shortly. Where have they been for the last three days? Ethis asked. I've seen them at the feasts, but then they seem to disappear. Oh, I know about that, Jugar said brightly, his round cheeks bowed upward in a cheery smile. I asked the chief of the day where they had taken the precious women in our company, and— Chief of the day? Dracus asked. Oh, yes, I assure you that these Hakka Aran have enacted a most fascinating form of governance, really. Jugar replied, They have no permanent rulers, but rather take turns directing things. They change out the chief pretty much whenever they feel like it. There is no set schedule, but a change in leadership usually takes place when the chief of the day gets tired of doing the job and gives someone else a chance. They have no interest in power or wealth, as we understand it. Indeed, they find the stories we tell of the acquisition of such things to be something like cautionary tales. Their civilization is entirely based on total community of property and pride taken in the whole rather than the individual. Individuals don't own anything as we understand it, but take ownership in the whole of their society. All these gnomes coming and going take whatever burrow is available to them when they arrive, use the things in it as though they were their own— because in a very real sense they are theirs as a community, and then just leave them behind when they travel to the next mud city. For that matter, it's one of the reasons the elves, or anyone else for that matter, have never bothered to conquer them. They don't have anything worth taking. They live relatively simple lives, journeying constantly from one mud city to the next. They have no desire for power— they even think that the great ether magic of the elves and even the air magic of the dwarves is a crutch that weakens the moral fiber of anyone who touches it. With no desire for power and no interest in wealth, they are a formidable group for anyone wanting to corrupt them. Fascinating, Ethis replied through a yawn. But you were telling us about the women. No, oh, indeed I was. Jugar nodded brightly. The chief of the day told me, and in rather disappointed tones, uh, that they have been keeping Mala and the Lyric separated from the males of our group, and offered women of their own tribes to you in substitution. Dracus blinked. What? The chief of the day had hopes that you might each mate with some of their women. Jugar concluded. Would have been a great honor for their community. Belog sniffed. <sighs> Barbarians. Well, each of us has our different customs, Jugar replied with a shrug. Strange as they may strike us as outsiders, it sometimes is to our credit to keep a more open mind about the traditions of other nations. Ah, but here is the rest of our intrepid group now.
Dracus turned to see Mala running toward him, relief in her eyes. She threw her arms around him, nearly knocking him off his feet in her eagerness. I've tried to find you. These little mud creatures kept pushing me off in other directions. Are you all right? Dracus looked down at her upturned face. The anger and the fear had for the moment evaporated from her countenance, freeing her once again to look like the Mala he had loved in that life before, and still loved in the jumble of memories that occasionally threatened to overwhelm his thoughts. Her skin was still smudged and tanned from the long journey, and her face was now framed in the rust-red hair that had sprouted from her head, nearly obscuring her slave brand tattoo. But in that moment, she looked again like the woman he had so long loved, or believed he had loved, and he smiled warmly in return. Mala, I am fine, Dracus said. Are you ready for the road? She stepped back, still smiling at him. Three days' rest in a mud cave seems to have been quite enough. I've got my pack, and thanks to these gnomes, far better shoes for the journey. She turned in front of him, raising her foot. Dracus laughed at the sight of the soft leather boots with their hard soles, indeed perfect for the road, but entirely incongruous with the rest of her tattered clothing. What's so funny? she asked, a note of caution coloring her words. They are indeed perfect, Dracus laughed, letting go of his anxiety and fear seemingly for the first time in ages. It felt good to laugh again. <laughs> oh, how is the lyric today? Or perhaps I should ask, who is the lyric today? You'll find out soon enough, Mala teased. But one word of caution, duck right after you ask. They were two days out from the third mud city. The trail of Hakaara gnomes stretched across the savannah in a seemingly endless procession. The line heading northward, in which Dracus and his companions marched on the left side of the trail, was matched in kind by a second endless procession heading back the way they had come on the right side. Dracus smiled as he marched along. There was something soothing in the rhythm of his strides, the wide sky above him, and the warmth of the sun on his face. Mala and the Lyric, now claiming to be Sheen Rach, warrior queen of the Manticores, were both riding on a large wagon being pulled by scores of gnomes, an honor he had declined. Ethis was arguing once more with Ru'ukag behind the wagon, while Belog tried to broker some peace between them. Ahead of him, Dracus could see Jugar marching alongside the gnomes, and decided he could use the sound of the fool's prattle in his ears. He quickened his pace, and shortly, as they crossed a shallow river, caught up with the dwarf. We are making good time, Dracus said, gazing northward. We'll make the next mud city before nightfall. The chief of the day tells me that it's the farthest north of the Hakaaran settlements. He also says that they often trade with humans there, actual free humans from the forests bordering the shore. The dwarf's gaze remained downcast as he stumped along in silence. Dracus walked alongside Jugar for a few moments as the silence stretched on. What? No long description of the wonderful customs of free humans in the wild? Dracus chided. No half-forgotten epic poem that will last us until sunset in its recital? No made-up facts about an ancient civilization from the past that is going to resurrect dragons from our nightmares and save us all. The dwarf looked away as he marched. Well, isn't that my fate? Dracus said, shaking his head. As long as I've known you, I couldn't get you to shut up. And the one time I want to talk to you, you lose your tongue. Jugar turned his head and glared at the human. We do... Have a need to talk, my boy, but not so close to so many ears. The dwarf gave Dracus a great shove, pushing him into the tall grass bordering the trail and following in his wake. You dwarven fool! Dracus exclaimed. What are you up to now? It's time for you to be quiet and do as I say, Jugar said with menace in his voice. 
Keep walking and keep the trail in sight. The grass is taller than I am and will keep my words between us alone. But I still don't. Keep walking! Jugar snapped. Don't look at me. Look at the trail. What's this, dwarf? Draco said as he walked through the rustling grass. What new game are you playing? No game, Jugar replied. But we are the ones who are being played. See this? Dracus glanced down. In your hand? That round ball of mud with some grass stuck in it? It's a good deal more than that, lad, Jugar explained, although it's certainly meant to appear as innocent as you suggest. Only someone familiar with the magic involved would know its true purpose. And I suppose that someone would be you, Dracus said. The dwarf spoke with pride. I know a thing or two about magic. Dracus nodded. I've been meaning to ask you about that. Soon enough, my boy, Jugar interrupted. But we must speak of this first. This, lad, is a beacon stone. A beacon stone? Dracus urged. He'd never had such trouble getting the dwarf to talk before. What is a beacon stone? It's a device of the Iblisi, Jugar replied. It is used by the Inquisitors to find anyone who drops them along the way. They have many uses, but it would seem they are now being used to track us. Wait, did you hear something? Draco stopped. You mean beyond the marching feet of several thousand gnomes? No, I don't hear anything. And just what are you suggesting? That the Iblisi are still following us? All the way across the Vestasian savannah? More than that. Jugar said, That they are still following us is now certain. But what we did not know before is that one of our trusted number is also helping them to do so. Chapter 35 Preceding Reputations The sun was setting by the time they reached the entrances to the Mud City. Dracus wished, as he forced his tired legs up the long, sloping tunnel into the city, that the Haka Aran would take the trouble to put different names to their settlements so that he could at least keep track of where they had been. For a time crossing the savannah, he had occasion to wonder if the gnomes were somehow magically leading them back each night to the same mud city. A different name would have helped him at least feel some sense of progress. As it was, however... The Haka Aran's rather odd view of physical possessions, they didn't believe in them, led to an inability to distinguish any Haka Aran thing from another. They simply took whatever hovel hole was unoccupied at the time in whatever mud city they found themselves, shared in the communal food, and worked at whatever job was needed at the time, and then, bidden by some inner impulse Dracus could only guess at, they would leave one mud city and make an arduous journey to the next. Some patterns in this chaotic life occasionally emerged. Not all the gnomes were skilled at everything, and sometimes groups of them would gather who shared the same skills to teach each other what they had learned on their last pilgrimage. Yet such gatherings never seemed to last for very long, and would dissolve just as quickly as they formed. As to his own inner voices, the musical demons that seemed to torment his mind, they were making him increasingly uncomfortable on the road. Ever since the dwarf had told him that there was a traitor among them, he had not been able to shake the feeling that the sooner they left the beaten paths of the Haka Aran, the safer they would be. At least they would be in the wilderness again, and it might be easier to spot trouble as it approached and possibly catch this informer in the act of placing one of these beacon stones. As to who that traitor might be, that was a painful thought that revolved in the music of his torment in every monotonous moment of walking whenever they moved between the mud cities. Manticore, fanatic, lunatic, breaks with a crystalline sin, never forgiven, ever deceiving. Belog had evinced a near reverential attitude toward Dracus since the fall of House Timuron that was nothing short of fanatical. And yet... There was something inside that fanaticism that Dracus did not and could not trust. He suspected that anyone so deeply committed to a single idea or person 
was probably likely to react just as strongly the other way if he felt betrayed in that commitment. Lion Man hiding from shadows past, fleeing from lands he once loved, longing for lost homes, longing for dead tombs. Then there was Ru'u Kog, a manticore whom he never liked even before his memories came flooding back. He had fought the group at every step, but recently he seemed more anxious than any of them to cross this savannah. He never explained himself either way, and his distrust seemed to breed it in everyone else. Shifting the shapes of allegiances, nebulous is his own heart, constantly changing, soul rearranging. Ethis was demonstrably not only a manipulative and deceptive creature at his heart, but now appeared to be highly trained for it. Draca still shuddered to think of how the Chimerian had appeared to him in the form of Mala. Hope of a past, now a memory. Love that was all just a game. Where does her heart lie? When does her tongue lie? Then there was Mala herself, of course. Things had improved with her, and recently she had become almost cheerful. Her face was tanned now by their long day journeys between mud cities, and there was an almost robust health to her that was, he had to admit, an improvement over her former self. Yet he knew resentment still smoldered beneath the surface like banked coals waiting to burst again into hot hatred. Their bargain in the fairy kingdom to pretend their painful past did not exist, had only buried it shallowly. Everyone else but the girl herself, who is the woman within, masking her faces and her dark places. He had considered the lyric, who was unquestionably insane, and changed her personality as easily and as often as anyone else might change their mind. She could be the traitor among them, and not even remember it from day to day. That, he thought, would be worst of all, since she was the least accountable of any of them, and Dracus felt certain he would have to kill whoever it turned out to be. Jesters all hide in the light and sound, plain in the face of our doom. Watch for the fool, laughter is cruel. Finally, he had to admit that it could even be the dwarf who had pointed all this out to him in the first place. The conniving little fool might have thought himself in danger of being caught and tipped his hand as a bluff just to throw suspicion off himself. The only thing Dracus was sure about regarding the dwarf was that he couldn't be sure about anything. So he would journey through the day, receding more and more into the cycle of his siren song. Sometimes Mala would walk with him, chattering away about some innocuous memory she had of her life in the Timuron house, or some previous house she had been a part of and only recently remembered. Such recollections studiously avoided the darker memories and were occasionally expurgated as she spoke, her voice stuttering slightly and stopping altogether, only to restart on a completely different topic, light and breezy once more. Sometimes Belog would journey with him, speaking sonorously of the legends of the manticores regarding the afterlife. Or Ethis would join him, respecting the human silence with his own. Occasionally the dwarf would accompany him, rattling off some nonsense story he remembered that the shape of a bush they passed or some figure in a cloud above them brought to his memory. But all along the way, the names of his companions would circle through his mind and soon merged with the cycle of the music, that dreadful music that called to him and ran always in the back of his mind. Nine notes, seven notes, five notes, five. Jugar, lyric, belog, the smiles of each beguiling. Whose is the false heart? Who plays the false part? Ethis. Mala, Ru'u Kog, they swear their oath is telling. One is more than willing, all your lives they're selling. Juga, Lyric, Belog, Ethis, Mala, Ru'u Kog, the smiles of each beguiling. Drekeski? 
Drakus shook himself. He had nearly fallen asleep on his feet. His eyes were trying to focus on the short figure before him. Drakus thought that he had never seen this particular gnome before, but could not be entirely sure. The only thing he was certain of was the orange vest and floppy hat that signified the gnome's august position in the mud city. Since which gnome was the chief of the day changed seemingly on a whim, and each mud city had its own chief, who was just as apt to pick up and wander to the next mud city as any other gnome, the only way to tell who was in charge was by which gnome wore this bizarre outfit. Yes, uh, ch chief of the day, what is it? Drekeski. The gnome bowed deeply as he repeated the name with respect. You honor us with stories of your people. We thank the gods of the sky that you have come among us to brighten our thoughts and dreams. Yes, thank you. Drakus spoke through a yawn. I'm sorry, chief of the day. Is there something you want? Drakeski. The gnome bowed once more. I have a story to tell you. Ah, Drakus nodded, closing his eyes as he continued to trudge up the ramp. Thank you, Chief of the Day. I would love to hear your story, and I'm certain that it is a really great story, but... It is! It is a great story! The Chief of the Day responded, enthusiastically following along next to the human. It is the story of a human like yourself, a great... Warrior woman who journeys from the coastal forests, who moves in silence and shadow. She comes from a human tribe that is lost to the knowledge of the world and remains hidden from the knowledge of all except the Haka Arin. And most remarkable of all, in her story she is searching for you, Drakus. Drakus stopped and rubbed his eyes, not entirely certain of what he had just heard. A human woman? And she's looking for me. Where did you hear such a tale? Oh, of course. The chief of the day nodded with sage understanding. My poor skills in the telling of the story would diminish it, and I will not do such a fine tale this injustice. Would it not be better if Drakaski heard it from its source? Drakus looked at the gnome with a frown his awareness sharpening as the words sank into his tired mind. It would. Is this storyteller near? I may have some questions. Not near. The chief of the day shook his head. Here? The woman herself is here. What? Here? Dracus blurted out. What is it? Mala asked, concerned at the look on Dracus's face. She and the Lyric were walking up the ramp toward Drakus, with Belog, Ruukog, Jugar, and Ethus behind them. Drakus did not answer her, but continued speaking to the orange-clad gnome. She's here! Where? The gnome grinned with all his wide-spaced teeth. Why, Drakus Key! She is there, behind you. Drakus turned at once, his hand instinctively moving to the hilt of his sword. Above him, at the top of the ramp, stood a tall, slender woman the likes of whom Drakus had never seen before. Her skin was a deep black, as deep a black as the middle of the night and as smooth and unblemished as pure silk. Her thick black hair was pulled back from the high forehead of her oval face and gathered into an explosion of curls at the back of her head. Her large brown eyes gazed at him above her pronounced cheekbones, their eyelids shuddered languidly in disdain. Her lips were thick and plump around her smallish mouth, drawn slightly up at one corner, as though being amused by some secret thought. She stood with casual confidence, the long fingers of her right hand resting on her hip, as her head tipped upward slightly atop her long, slender neck. So, the woman spoke in a deep, husky voice. This is what a prophecy looks like. Who are you? Drakus asked, his eyes narrowing. The chief of the day, 
still standing behind Dracus, thought that was his cue for a formal introduction. Oh, I sorrow over my lack of honor. Dracus Key, I present to you Urulaniku, warrior of the Sandau. Urulani will do, she replied with an amused smile. I suppose Dracus will do for you. Or do you have some rather more exalted title you prefer as the living fulfillment of a legend? How do you know who he is? Mala demanded, moving smoothly to Dracus's right side and wrapping her arm around his. Dracus muttered a curse. She was holding his sword arm. How do I know who he is? Urulani said through a hearty chuckle. She stepped toward them down the ramp, her athletic figure moving with ease. She wore an outer vest of cured leather over a loose sleeveless shirt of homespun cloth. Dracus noted that she wore soft buckskin breeches laced tightly up both legs, as well as matching boots that made no sound as she stepped. How is it possible not to know of Dracus? The bolter from House Timuran, who is the professed harbinger of doom and salvation now sprung to life. It's a story that's being told and retold all across the Vestasian savannah by every Hakaar in Nome with a tongue, and now it seems by every Jekaar in opportunist looking to find you and turn you in for more Ronas coin than they can possibly carry. Urulani stopped just in front of Dracus, her eyes fixed coolly on him, though her words were aimed at Mala. No, I tell you, little slave princess, I'd be surprised if there were a blade of grass or a stone under all the sky from the southern mountains to the Nordesian coast that doesn't know who this Dracus is by now. Dracus could hear Belog's low growl rising behind him. Urulani looked up at the Manticorean warrior. I'm not your problem, big cat. In fact, I'm here to help you all, so you might think again before you decide you'd like to try and eat me. Dracus drew in a breath to speak, but Mala interrupted, gripping Dracus's arm tighter and pulling him possessively toward her. I don't see how you can possibly help us. Urulani turned her gaze on Mala for the first time and took her in through a long stare before she replied. You may have weathered a bit on the road, princess, but your little cherry tan and cracked lips don't hide you. I see that the Ronas pigs still prefer to stock their households with cloud-white, dainty human slaves who can blend in so invisibly into their marble walls. She turned her look back to Dracus. Until that fashion changes. The Imperial Hunters have no need to bother with us. We are the Forgotten Ones, and we prefer to keep it that way. As long as we are forgotten, well, you will have a chance. Why should we trust you? Dracus asked. Don't, if you'd rather not, Urulani said with a tilt of her head. I just happen to be the first to find you, if you like. You're welcome to refuse my help and wait for some bounty-crazed fool or an Iblisi to find you, although I suggest that they might not present terms quite as good as I have to offer. Dracus shook his head and smiled. And, uh, just what are your terms? Urulani took a step back and folded her arms across her chest. Dracus, I don't believe in you. I was raised on the stories and the legends, and I gave up on believing in them years ago. No human is going to rise up and free us from the Ronas oppression with a wave of his mystical fingers. The only freedom we'll ever have will be what we take for ourselves. Urulani shrugged. But? But? But the clan elders do still believe. Urulani continued. They sent me here to find you, hide you from the eyes of the Ronas hunters, and bring you before the elders to answer their questions about you. Dracus nodded, his hand slipping slowly from the hilt of his sword. And if they don't like my answers... 
Urulani looked up at the ceiling as she spoke. You know, it's a hard thing when you're confronted with a legend and you discover that he's only a man after all. The faithful who are disappointed in their gods can be so unpredictable in how they will react. No, Dracus said. I disagree. They are entirely too predictable. Very well. But you have to... Dracus, Mala said, turning toward him. You aren't actually considering going with this. Dracus ignored her. But you have to take all of us. You must promise to extend your protection to all of our group, or we'll just continue on our own way. Urulani nodded. Done. Anything else? One last thing. Yes? Tell me that your clan is to the north. Chapter 36 Ru'ukog The mud city of the Hakka'aran usually bustled with activity regardless of the time of day. The only exception was on the night of arrival, when most of the mud gnomes, exhausted from the day's journey, retired to their newly occupied warrens and slept through the night, leaving only a few hundred or so of their number to keep watch over the city and keep the fires stoked until the mound could properly be brought back to exuberant life the next morning. The enormous central space of the city was, therefore, nearly deserted, as Ru'ukog moved with contemplative, heavy steps onto the main floor space. His great head hung down from his hunched shoulders. The field pack, completely provisioned once more, did not weigh him down nearly as much as the burdens of his soul. The manticore looked up. The open dome of the mud city was lined with the cave-like warrens of the gnomes almost to its very summit, lit now only dimly by the flickering flames in the great central pit that had earlier been a roaring bonfire. The curling smoke rose up to the full height of the chamber, escaping through the large hole in the ceiling. Ru'ukog watched the smoke for a time. The hole through which it escaped the mud city was called the Ocule by the Haka'aran, the Eye of God. It watched over the mud gnomes in their pursuits, and for the most part, brought light into their lives. Ru'ukog chortled to himself. The Haka'aran repaid their god by blowing smoke into its eye. Perhaps, he mused, that was why God's eye seemed so blind to the problems of the mortals in their care. But then another thought came to Ru'ukog. The blaze of the great fire pit in the center of the mud city consumed the solid wood, and sent it up to the gods. Through the ocule he could see the stars of the night sky beyond, the very realm of the gods, welcoming the smoke and freeing it from the cares of the world. Ru'ukagi? The manticore, startled from his reveries, looked down into the face of a young gnome. By his reckoning, the creature could not have seen more than twelve years in this world. What do you want, gnome? The large, liquid eyes of the youth gazed up at him. Your story, Ru'ukagi? I want to hear your story. The manticore shrugged his field pack higher on his shoulders. I have business to attend. Go away. You are leaving us, then? Yes, Ru'ukag said at once. I mean, no, I've just got to go outside for a while. I've just got something I have to do. Not with a field pack, the gnome replied, pointing up at the manticore's back. You are leaving forever. A business to attend to, boy, Ru'ukog said, pushing past the small gnome. But you have to tell me your story, the gnome said, the urgency in his voice making it louder. Ru'ukog turned in frustration. Quiet! You want to wake the entire city. Just tell me your story, the young gnome urged. Look, we're right next to the storytelling cavern, and there's no one there now. I don't want to tell you my story, Ru'ukog growled. But you'll be lost, the gnome wailed. Quiet, Ru'ukog said quickly. What are you bellowing about? Your story. The gnome replied, his eyes tearing up. 
If you don't tell someone your story, you'll be forgotten. No one will remember that you passed through the world. Your story will be lost, and your soul will not be recognized by the other souls in the sky. Ru'ukog looked up through the oculae once more. The stars were looking back down on him. He felt their disapproval. No one wants to hear my story, he said at last. I do, replied the gnome. Ru'ukog sighed. He needed to get out of the mud city, and the last thing he needed was a whimpering, wailing gnome cub calling attention to what was supposed to be an unnoticed departure. <sighs> Fine. A short story, and then I've got to leave. Your story, the young gnome insisted. Ru'ukog sighed again. Ah, yes, my story. What's your name, little cub? Jith. The gnome replied, Well, Jith, where do we get this sorry tale over with? Jith wrapped his small, long-fingered hands around the manticore's paw as best he could, though even though both hands failed to encompass it entirely. He tugged at the manticore, who dutifully followed him into a round side cavern. In its center sat three curved benches that formed a circle. Yeah, Ru'ukagi. This is the storytelling place. Sit, 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 sit. The manticore squatted down on one of the benches, most definitely not built for someone of his size. Just a few minutes, Jif. I'm very busy. Yes, of course, very busy. Jif nodded as he scampered over to one of the opposite benches and clambered onto it. He turned around, his own feet dangling from the edge of the bench and not quite reaching the floor. The young gnome leaned forward in anticipation. But first you tell your story. Yes, Ru'ukog said. Well, once between a moon long ago, there was a manticore named Ru'ukog. No, that's no way to start the story. Jith interrupted. You start with, I... Ru'ukog! The gnome milled his hands through the air, urging Ru'ukog to continue. The manticore bared his canine teeth in frustration. <sighs> Very well, then. I, Ru'ukog. And then what? Tell me about your family, Jith suggested. Ru'ukog closed his eyes. I have no family. Jith caught his breath in surprise and excitement. What a wonderful beginning! I, Ru'ukog, have no family. Why? Why? Why what? Why do you have no family? Jith asked. You must have had one sometime. Did you lose them? No, Ru'ukog replied, looking at the wall. They... Well, my father threw me out of my clan... He proclaimed me dead and banished me into the savannah, the eastern edge of this same savannah, as a matter of fact. Banished? Jith drew in a long breath. <sighs> How terrible for you. It was. I was heartbroken at the time. Ru'ukog replied. My father was a proud warrior who had joined the rebellion against the elven occupation leading our clan out of our traditional lands and into the wilderness of the northern steppes. His name was Krachak, and his armor was ten generations old, very prestigious among our clans. He was the result of a long line of brave warriors with their own tales of bravery and battle and honors in their warfare. He taught me the use of the spear and the blade and age when other cubs were still wrestling across the green. My mother, her name was Laurna of Clan Kadush, was so upset with our father that day that he had to call a clan council just to get away from her for a few days. <laughs> they were both proud manticores, who were in a lot of pain now that I look back on it. 
They had lost everything in the Ronas occupation, everything but their prideful resentment. My father had lost his ancestral lands, and that was a terrible thing for him to bear. My parents could not give up the life that they once had. Maybe they didn't know how to live any other life. There was something about talking to this little gnome that felt good to Ruukog. He had been carrying the words around inside himself for so long, never daring to tell them to anyone. He had forgotten them entirely while under the elven devotional enslavement magic, but their burden had returned to him in force with the fall of House Timuron. He wanted desperately to return to the mindless bliss of his enslavement and to rid himself of the weight of his own decisions and consequences. But here and now, in the quiet of the night of a far-off land, he could tell those bitter words to this little gnome and somehow be rid of them. Soon the words started coming unbidden and in a rush, as though the story had been there all along, waiting for him to tell it and be rid of it. He told of his life, growing up in a clan exiled from their own nation. He spoke of the customs of the manticores, and how disputes were most often settled in combat. He told of the wonders of getting up at dawn on the northern steps and hunting at his father's side. He talked of lying under the canopy of the night and listening as his mother explained the lights in the sky and how they were our ancestors looking down on our honor from above. As he spoke, another gnome happened by and stopped for a time. Then a third and a fourth came and sat down. Ruukog took little notice as he spoke, for he seemed lost in the telling of his tale to the large eyes of the enraptured Jith. All these wonders, all these beautiful stories, Jith said as Ruukog paused. And your clan family, they are lost to you, why? The Battle of the Red Fields, Ruukog said, his voice breaking as he spoke the words for the first time in decades. The Rolas legions were not satisfied with taking control of the government of Chanandria. They wished to crush all possibility of rebellion once and for all. With the aid and assurances of the Chanandrian Council, the elf legions moved north to challenge our rebel clans directly. A war, then? Jith asked breathlessly. Barely even that. It had been a hard winter, and we did not expect them to join us in battle so soon, Ruukog replied. The hall was now full of gnomes, but he no longer cared. To speak the words unburdened him. When their legions were reported, there were few that the rebel clans could feel. Every one who could hold a blade was pressed into service, many of them barely trained youths, and I counted myself among them. Jith was in awe. You joined the battle. What choice did I have? Ruukog snapped. I was the son of the clan elder, an honored warrior with ancestors covered in glory for a hundred years. I had grown up on stories of fortune and battle. It was all such a fabulous game to me. Here was my chance to add to the name of my clan, to add to the glory of my ancestors, to... to... To what? Jith urged. To prove myself to my father, Ruukog roared. To show the rest of the clan that I wasn't just a child of privilege, but that I too could stand with my ancestors and lay claim to my father's armor. What happened? Jith asked. Ruukog sat back and lifted his head. He could see the field before him as though he were there once more. We formed a line as we had been taught. None of us were tried in battle. We barely knew how to hold a sword, much less use it against a cunning enemy. We were supposed to be in reserve, not to be used in the battle itself. But the lines before us broke. The legions of Ronar stormed into the gap, pushing back the lines to either side, trying to flank them. But our leader was an old warrior whose mind had grown brittle and his judgment stale. He saw the gap in the lines and ordered our unit to charge into the bloodiest part of the battle. 
And what happened? Jith whispered. I... I couldn't move. Ruukog replied in a voice that felt detached from the images in his mind. I saw the death and the blood and the slaughter in front of me, and I just couldn't move. The room was filled with gnomes now, but only the sound of Ruukog's quiet voice was heard. The line closed again as the manticores fought back. Ruukog continued. As it turned out, the charge was in vain. The line would have closed anyway, and all those young manticores who stood next to me and charged died for nothing. Yet there were a number of us who just didn't heed the call, and we lived. It would have been better for us to have died that day. We were branded as the cowards that we were. We lived, and that was our shame. Ruukog paused and looked up. Gnomes filled the story cavern and were standing at the entrances. Each was facing him in rapt attention, sadness in their eyes. Sadness for him. Ruukog was now intent on letting all the words come out. He had forgotten his urgent reasons for departing. He spoke of returning to his father's clan, his shame of a coward son. He told of his banishment and the tears and howls of his mother echoing in his ears as he departed into the Vestasian savannah. He spoke of his longing to die. His words spilled from him throughout the night in one tale that was many tales, the tale of his enslavement to the devotions of House Timuron, the tale of Dracus teaching him the pain of knowing the truth, and Ruukog's longing for the peace of not knowing it all. And finally, the tale of Belog and Dracus leading them across the savannah, and how a dishonored manticore now stood on the edge of a knife, trying to decide between the oblivion of the elves and the hope of a life at last. At last Ruukog stopped, all his words spent. He looked up into the eyes of the gnomes and settled at last on those of Jith. The young gnome looked at the manticore with his large, watery eyes and gently smiled. Ruukog looked at the ground. Jith stepped quickly over to the manticore, moving beneath his face and gazing up as he spoke. Thank you, Ruukogi. Thank you for your story. We understand now. Ruukog took in a long, deep breath. Jith took the manticore's huge paw with both his small hands. The gnome then touched his forehead to the back of Ruukog's furry grip. Your story begins again, Jith said. Now, begin with I, Ruukog, of the family Hakka Arin. Then each in turn, the mud gnome stepped up to Ruukog and taking the manticore's paw, placed their foreheads to the back of his grip. The gnomes were still doing so when Dracus found him the next morning. Chapter 37 Different Roads Keep up! Urulani growled. What is your hurry? Mala snapped. You said it was less than half a day's walk, and the sun has barely risen. It's dangerous out here in the open, princess. If anything, Urulani quickened her own pace a little. And can you see those peaks ahead of us? Those hills? Mala sniffed. You call those peaks? I've climbed bigger hills just to get a good look at real peaks. Really? Urulani laughed. Well, then... You won't mind climbing those. We call them the Sentinels, and those hills have kept our clan free of elven interference since before your entire family was groveling and begging for scraps from the Ronas table. They had left the Hakaaran mud city only a short time before, just as the first hint of dawn lightened the eastern horizon. Urulani led them northward on a narrow path that occasionally vanished for long stretches. 
Still, the dark-skinned woman always picked up the trail again as it ran northward toward the Sentinel Peaks. It was true, Dracus reflected, that these mountains were not as tall as the Aryan range that they had left so far behind them to the south, but they were not that much shorter and were of a far more formidable aspect. The peaks looked like sharpened teeth that erupted from the ground at nearly vertical angles. Rulani said they would be crossing them, but from where he walked now on the savanna, even he was skeptical as to how they would manage it. Dracus, did you hear that? Mala turned to the warrior striding next to her under the early morning glow. Did you hear what she said to me? Dracus drew in a deep breath as he strode next to her under the soft glow of the early morning light. Yes, Mala, I heard. Well? Mala demanded. What are you going to do about it? Yes, pray tell. Urulani snarled. Just what are you going to do about it? Dracus rolled his eyes upward in an appeal to the stars. He was no longer sure that he believed in the gods. The only gods that he knew were those of the Ronas Pantheon, which had been instilled in him by his slave masters, and now he questioned everything that they had taught him. Still, at this moment, he would have preferred some divine answers, or even an inspired lightning bolt or two, to help him find a way to keep Mala out of Urulani's way. Thus far this morning, the gods had wisely stayed out of the fight as well. Please, Dracus urged, we need to get into the safety of those mountains. So you're siding with her? Mala shouted, her voice squeaking at the end. No, Dracus said quickly. I'm not siding with anyone. She said we groveled for scraps. Mala fumed. Look, Mala, Dracus shrugged. She just doesn't understand how it was, or she wouldn't have... I don't understand how it was! Urulani had the voice of a commander that carried over everyone else when she chose to use it. This was one of those times. Maybe I don't understand how it is that you cattle managed to find your way out of your pens and wander out here into the world where people actually live and die for something more than the master's pleasure. Now wait just a minute. Dracus said. See? Do you see what kind of person you've entrusted our lives to? Mala jabbed Dracus with her finger. She has no respect for you or any of us. Respect! Urulani roared back. And just what have you done, little pale princess, to earn my respect? Ladies, stop it, please! Dracus held up both his hands in exasperation. Can we all just calm down and... This! Urulani threw her head back in derision. From the domesticated warrior! Dracus turned to appeal to the rest of their companions, but there was no help in sight. Ruukog seemed to be enjoying the row with deep amusement. Ethis, Belog, and even Jugar all walked behind him, keeping a distance that also kept them out of the argument. Only the lyric quickened her step toward him. She smiled and said, don't worry, Dacus. I'm only too glad to help. You are? Dracus asked dubiously. Of course, the lyric said, her eyes bright. They're both wrong, and I'll be happy to tell them why. Dracus looked again to the stars and offered a prayer. It was going to be a very long day. I have news, Inquisitor. Jukung looked up, his face shadowed by the deep hood pulled over his head. The new Inquisitor sat still beneath the great tree of the savannah, as he had for two days awaiting just such news. Speak, Codexia Mendrath, Jukung said. The robed newcomer bowed and then began. What comes from the savannah west of Tempest Bay? There are several mud cities of the Hakaaren in the northern regions of the Vestasian savannah. I do not need a geography lecture, Jukung snarled. Yes, Master Inquisitor, Mendroth responded at once. There are stories now being circulated among the mud gnomes in that region about a man named Dracus. 
who is traveling with the gnomes. He is said to possess great powers and to be the fulfillment of prophecy. Jukung looked up sharply. And his companions. The story speaks of two women, Manticores, a Chimerian, and a dwarf. Jukung smiled. Ah, dwarf. Yes, that is news indeed. Where? Where are they? The Hakka are in move a great deal, Mindrath replied. There are a dozen or so of their cities across the region where they were last seen. And Inquisitor Sowen? Jukung asked quickly. What news of him? He is moving toward those same mud domes that the Hakka Aran call their cities. Jukung stood up at once. Then we must get there before him, so that we may greet him properly. Contact the quorums wherever they are, and have them journey at once to the mud-domed cities of the northern savannah. Have them determine if Dracus and his companions have been there. And what are their orders then? Mindroth asked. Jukung smiled once more. Our orders are explicit, Codexia. Capture this Dracus and bring him to me. It will be done, Mindrath said and turned to move away. Jukung's arm restrained him. There is more. Jukung removed his hood, exposing his hideously deformed face. Anyone who has had contact with this Dracus, anyone at all, is to be killed at once. I... I am not sure that I understand the order, Master Inquisitor, Mindroth said. There are entire cities of gnomes who may have had some contact with this Dracus human, and you will find them and kill them all. Jukung said quietly. That could be thousands of gnomes, Mindroth said, still uncertain he understood the order correctly. I do not care if it numbers in the tens of thousands, Jukung said, irritation rising in his voice. Towns, cities, females, children, if they have had contact with the human pestilence, they are to die. But, Master Inquisitor, do you question the Imperial will? Jukung screamed. This is the order of the Keeper of our order, and the direct expression of the thoughts of the Emperor. Will you shirk your duty and forfeit your honor to his glorious ideal? No, Master Inquisitor. The Codexia stiffened. They will die, Jukung said. His breathing labored as he spoke. He reached up with his right hand and ran his fingers lightly along the melted skin of his face. They must Pay for what they have done. The Emperor has declared them poisoned to his will by this Dracus. Any creature that has had any contact with him must die. They must all die. Chapter 38 Sondao clans. Elders of the Sondao, Urulani said, dropping to one knee and placing her right hand against the floor as she bowed her head before the three older men. She knelt in the center of the lodge, the long building that served as the heart of the Sondao clan's society. The walls were framed from wood hewn from the surrounding forests, and carved intricately with the tales and legends that formed the foundation of their laws and beliefs. The vaulted ceiling was supported by thick beams, each carved with different and portentous figures overhead. The floor was planked from the same wood as the walls, though this was scrubbed and sanded to a smooth and carefully maintained finish. Flaming torches mounted to the walls and angled out above the floor filled the space with guttering light. 
I am Urulani, daughter of the Sundao clan. I have done as the elders have asked. The elders praise the gods for your return, and are astounded that you should return, it seems, on the very heels of your departure, stated the balding elder with the short cropped hair, who sat in the middle of the three. Thus said, we welcome you before the elder's council. Urulani stood at once. The elders honor me. As apparently do the gods to an extent we had not hoped possible, said the man with the long iron-gray hair pulled into a ponytail at the nape of his neck. As you say, Elder Kintaro, Urulani replied, glancing toward the ceiling. You have returned with him so quickly, asked the bearded man on the left, who was sitting back in his chair. I have done as the council has asked, Urulani responded. I have the man, and I must also report several of his companions with him. I thought it prudent to bring them as well, and not risk their tongues waggling once we had left. Wise as always is our Urulani nodded the man with the iron-gray hair. Urulani bowed slightly. Elder Kintaro honors me once more. The central balding elder leaned forward. What is your report, Urulani? The tall black woman opened her mouth to speak, hesitated, and then began. As instructed by you, Elder Shasa, I journeyed southward through the Cragsway Pass and onto the Vestasian Plain, I made my way southward to the first of the Haka'ar in mud dorms to begin my search. That was but three days ago, Elder Kintaro said, his eyebrows raised. We had expected your journey to take many months to complete. I had not been in the mud dorm a day when this man Drakus and his companions came to me. Kintaro raised his eyebrows. Indeed. You did not look for them, then. I had intended to search for them as instructed. Urulani corrected gently. We had heard stories of their passing through the mud domes in the deep parts of the Vestasian plain. Indeed, it was impossible not to hear of it from the Haka Arin. But as it happened, they arrived at the same mud dome where I first began my search at nearly the same time I did. A miracle of the ancients, Haku intoned, closing his eyes. Perhaps, Urulani said, again looking away toward the ceiling. Oh, it may have been an accident, I cannot see. And so your journey is over before it has begun, Elder Shasa intoned. You have done well, Urulani. You are among our most trusted sisters of our clan. Will you then assist us? We wish to begin our investigations at once. Direct me, elders, Urulani replied. We will find the heart of the tree by starting with the leaves, Shasa said, pressing the fingers of his hands together and lightly touching his own lips. Let us begin with his companions. Elders of the Sondao, Urulani said, bowing low. I present to you Mala, an escaped slave from the house of Timuran in Faronas. The man with the iron-colored gray hair leaned forward. Mala, is that not a Marindo clan name? Are you of the Marindau clan? Mala stood shivering in the torchlight. The gray-haired man glanced at Urulani. Does she not understand our speech? She understands, Elder Kintaro. I cannot explain her silence, as she would hardly keep her words to herself during our return journey today. Indeed, I had soon begun to dread our rest periods, as she was always so full of words after we stopped. Mala shot an angry glance at the woman. Urulani smiled in response. Perhaps you might ask her again now, Elder Kintaro. 
I am not of any clan. Mala said at once, then her eyes fell to gaze unfocused at the floor. I was... I was born a slave and know of no clan but the houses in which I served. But you are no longer a slave, said the balding man seated between the other two, his voice calm and quiet. You no longer serve any house, as you call it. How is it that you have come to be free? Free, master? Shasa smiled. I am not your master, Mala. No man is your master any longer. Do you understand? Mala nodded her head, but kept her eyes fixed on the floor. Yes, master. Shasa shook his head. What we want to know is how you came to no longer be a slave, said the older man with the beard. I do not remember it very well, sire, Mala replied. It is difficult, Haku pressed on. But you must tell us. Mala's lower lip began to quiver. Tell us, Haku commanded in a firm voice. Shasa's face was full of warning for his brother, but Mala suddenly began to speak. We were at house devotions, she said, her words coming out in a rush. Everything was happening just as it always had before. Lord Timuron and his wife and daughter were near the house altar. I had already had my devotions from the altar and was standing to one side of the Sabatria. Then Dracus... I don't know what happened, but Dracus was yelling and fighting the house guardians on the far side of the Aether Well. He didn't want to take his devotions. I couldn't understand why. We had just spoken earlier in the day and we had such great hopes. But there he was, fighting the guardians, and— Mala stopped talking, her eyes still fixed far away. And what, child? Shasa urged. And then— the Aether Well came apart, like shattering crockery, only so much quicker and with a terrible noise. That's when I knew. Knew what? Kintaro asked. That's when my memories returned to me, and I knew that my life was over. He is the fulfillment of a prophecy laid down in the most ancient of times. Belog stood tall in the center of the lodge, the crest of his growing mane nearly touching the rafters of the ceiling overhead. He spoke with conviction, his eyes bright in the torchlight. He freed me from the enslavement of the Rona sorceries and showed me the way to life and peace. He is the embodiment of the promises made of old. He will journey to the North Countries, Commune with the gods, and return in power to wreak vengeance and doom upon the Ronos Imperium. He is the one that my brother sought beside me, and for whom he gave his life. And how do you know this? Haku demanded. How do you know he is the one? My brother gave his life for him, Belog affirmed. He is the one. Now, Dracus, he knew that the Iblisi were after us after we had spent the night at Torgrenfell, and he was determined that those slippery elven bastards would not lay a hand on us. He also knew the song of the dragon that was calling him along, giving him the knowledge of what was to come, that if we had stayed there but another hour, those very demons of the imperial corruption would be upon us. So he stood before us and led us westward through the entire length of the Hyperion in plain, where the gods favored him by laying all manner of food and drink in our path. I tell you, elders of the honored Sondao clan, that the gods themselves granted powers to that boy that are beyond explanation. Thank you, Master Juga, Shasa said for the fourth time. Wait, th th there's so much more to tell. Take, for example, that time when we were passing the Hecariot, that 
terrible doom to tower on the plains of Hyperia. The spirits of the mountain came down among the stones as we passed. We shall take your statements into account as we deliberate, Haku said emphatically. You may go. Oh, but there is so much more, the dwarf offered cheerfully. The miracle of the fairy halls, the miracle of the Hakaarin, the miracle of the... Elder Kintaro groaned. Thank you, Shasa said too loudly. It was late by the time Ru'ukag was led out of the lodge. As the manticore was led from the room, Urulani moved to one of the guttering torches at the side of the room. He is hiding something, Kintaro said a few moments after the door closed behind Ru'ukag. He is afraid, Shasa replied. Fear can make anyone do foolish things. He doesn't believe in Drakis, Kintaro said. He says he does not know, but then he doesn't really believe in anything. Haku observed, which is of no use to us. Urulani pulled the fluttering torch from its mount and snuffed it out in the pot filled with sand sitting on the floor below it. You will not need the others. How so? Haku asked. Urulani pulled a new torch from a second holding pot and lit it on one of the other torches. Because one is a lyric who no longer knows herself or finds it too painful to be herself. In either case, examining her will not help you. And the other? asked Kintaro. The other is a Chimerian. Urulani answered as she placed the new torch in the wall bracket. It has been rightly said that a Chimerian once told the truth and was executed on the spot for heresy. I do not like your tone, Shasa said. But I agree that we cannot in this matter trust the word of a Chimerian. They see the world through their own eyes and have no love or regard for us. Then it is time we dealt with this prophecy directly, Kintaro said. I agree, Haku responded. Shasa nodded. Urulani? Yes, Elder Shasa. Bring us this man, Drakis. What is your name? Drakis, my lord. Of what clan? I do not recall. I may have been too young to remember, and my memories are still disjointed, especially of my youth. But I believe that my family came from one of the clans near here. The white clans were hunted to near extinction, spoke the gray-haired man. It was obviously many years ago, Dracus replied. But I recall my... my mother, I believe it was my true mother, telling me about our family to the north. She always spoke of going north and family at the same time. And your father? I do not recall my father, my lord. And the other family? The balding man asked. I... I had a brother. Drakus paused, looking away briefly and then blowing out a quick breath, continued. I had a brother whom I recall as being quite close to me. He, ah, uh, he died, beaten to death by one of our masters. I may have had a sister, but I cannot say with certainty whether she was my actual sister or some relationship our masters concocted for us. The bearded one spoke next with impatience. What caused you to rebel in your master's house? Uh, I, I don't know what you... Where did it start? The balding man urged. What brought you to the point of breaking the bonds of the devotions? Well, Dracus thought. I guess it all started with the song. The bearded man's eyebrows arched up. What song? Well, it's not really a song. I suppose... I'm sorry, my lords. Let me answer your question. I suppose in a way it started with the dwarf. Wait, the balding man said, holding up his hand. Tell us about this song. 
Dracus looked puzzled. Well, it's something that seems to be running in my head all the time. It wasn't always there, but the dwarf calls it the Song of the Dragon. The bearded man finished. Well, the dragon song, actually, but... Enough! Dracus, come with me! Shasa stood up from his chair and stepped in front of Dracus, crossing to the right side of the room. He took a torch from the wall and then stepped down to the corner of the lodge, beckoning Dracus to follow. Look here, Shasa said, pushing the torch closer to the wall. Dracus leaned forward, gazing at the relief carved into the wood planks. It was crude by elven standards, almost primitive, but the figures were unmistakably human. This is our story of what will be, Shasa said as he moved slowly down the wall with a torch. The other walls tell of our past and our present, but this wall here tells us the story that is yet to come. It is the story of a man who will be a slave, but will break his own bonds. It is the story of the man who will come out of the south and journey across the waters to the ancient home of our people, now lost to us, hidden beyond the clouds. It is the story of the man who will bring back the glory of humanity that was lost and destroy the oppressors of the land. Look here. Dracus drew himself closer to the carvings, following Shasa's pointing finger. Here is this warrior prophet being called home. What are those creatures calling him? Dracus asked. Dragons, brother. They are dragons calling to the souls of the chosen to come to them and find their destiny. Many have heard the dragon's song, but none before you have followed the path of the story. Are you a god? The dwarf's words echoed in his mind. Dracus looked into the face of the elder. Are you this Dracus' son? The elder asked. Are you this warrior prophet who will free us all? Dracus drew in several breaths before he responded. Elder Shasa, I truly do not know. Chapter 39 Something of My Own Well, Dracus, what are you thinking? Dracus smiled. I was just thinking how beautiful this place is, Elder Shasa. Dracus walked side by side with the large, balding elder down the wide path on the right-hand side of the village square. Small children ran about their feet, chasing one another with concentration in their delight that was oblivious to the adults around them. The square itself was lined with stalls filled with a dizzying variety of goods, fruits and vegetables from the farms that terraced the hillsides surrounding the village, as well as pottery, tools, weapons, shields, and any number of other crafts. Many of the goods were obviously made by the Sondao, while many others had quite obviously been looted during previous raids. Everywhere Dracus looked, there were dark-skinned men and women, young and old, all freely engaged with one another. Three huge and powerful men stood together at the corner of the green, speaking to each other in quiet tones, but with large gestures, their eyes filled with the passion of their argument. Ahead of them, two women walked past, their arms filled with large fruits. They both turned to look at Dracus as they passed, then broke into giggling laughter as they walked on. Yes, son, Shasa said, as he stopped at a stall filled with a sweet-smelling long yellow fruit and turned to face a woman with high, delicate cheekbones tending it. There is no place more beautiful than Northry. Wouldn't you agree, Kesai? Far be disagreement from my door. The woman replied with a wide smile. May the gods grant you a fair wind, Elder Shasa. Where is Dorian today? Shasa asked. I would have thought he would be here on market day, especially with such a fine crop. 
He is helping Moda repair a ship at the beach. Kesai replied. Moda has offered to help us add a room to our home in exchange. Shasa raised his eyebrows. Another room? Then have the gods blessed your family, Kesai. Soon enough. The woman smiled even more. Shasa nodded. Have you met our traveler, Drakis? Fate smiles. Kesai bowed slightly with the traditional greeting. Fate smiles. Drakis bowed back. Your family shall be in our hearts, Kesai, Shasa said. Forgive us our leaving. I must speak with Drakis. Shasa turned and continued down the path with Drakus falling into step at his side. Elder, Drakus said, I have only been here a week, and yet I feel more at home here than any other place I have ever been. This was not always so, Drakus. <laughs> Shasa laughed deeply. Drakus grinned. No, Elder Shasa, that is true. When we first arrived, well, I had never seen any humans with skin nearly so dark as the Sun Dao. And this worried you? Shasa asked. Well, no. I just felt terribly conspicuous, as though everyone was looking at me. Shasa laughed again, warm and filled with humor. Ha ha ha! Everyone was looking at you. It is easy to pick you out in a crowd. Your white face could be seen from two leagues in the darkest part of a cloud-covered night. Finding you is not a problem. Hiding you is. Drakus nodded. They passed the great house at the end of the square. The path under their feet now moved under the canopy of the tall palm trees and the huts of the village families. The sounds of a mother yelling from inside the home for one of her children drifted past them, as the path soon started to climb a winding trail up the steep slope surrounding the village and its bay. There was one other thing, Drakus said after many steps in silence. Yes, Drakus. It's that I've never seen so many humans in one place before, he replied. There have always been a few of us, of course, doing specialized jobs or kept around as curiosities. Timuron owned five or six of us, and that was considered an extravagance. But several hundred in one place? That could only happen when entire legions were called into battle, and even then it would be hard to find them in the enormous press of so many other races. How did you get here? How have you survived? The Sundao clan settled North Ree during the Age of Fire— some seven hundred years ago by the counting of our law keepers, Chasa said. In those days, it was an outpost of the Dracosian city-states, the human kingdoms of the north that ruled all the land of Armithia. They were still recovering from the War of Desolation, the first great conflict between the humans of the north and the Ronas army of conquest from the south. It was an unsettled time, and the clans of the coast took it to be a sign of opportunity. Opportunity? Drakus squinted in disbelief. The path became steeper and more winding as they climbed. Certainly, Shasa nodded. In all change there is opportunity to benefit someone. So our ancestors came in their ships to what they saw as a land of promise. They found that the forgotten coast east of Point Cantantine was mountainous and lush, its ground fertile and mineral-rich from the ancient volcanoes that had shaped it. Much of the coast was treacherous going for ships, but there were choice harbors to be had if one knew where to find them along the arc of Sanctuary Bay. The Sondao captains were exceptional seafarers and soon small settlements tucked in the back of hidden harbors like this one, access through all but impassable rock-strewn passages, darted the great jagged shores of Sanctuary Bay. As Shasa spoke, they stepped to the crest of a low hill overlooking the village. The thatched roofs of the huts below could barely be made out through the canopy of trees. 
lush, broad-leafed hardwoods, and tall, strange trees with great fan-like leaves spreading out from their tops. He had never seen their like in all the lands of Ronas, and wondered why. Surely, he thought, they would fetch a handsome price for so strange a thing as these trees Shasa called palm. The village was formed around a small, deep harbor surrounded entirely by steeply rising hills. The homes had to be built on the hillsides, and in many cases the roof of one butted up against the foundation of the next home higher up the hill. Communities here seemed to grow in clusters, like fruit springing somehow from the mountainside. The harbor itself was guarded by a narrow and winding passage that looked to Dracus to be entirely impossible to navigate, although whenever he brought this up with the Sondau villagers, he was universally greeted with laughter. Behind him, bright in the rising light of morning, stood the craggy peaks of the Sentinels, nearly vertical mountains whose slopes were covered in lush foliage and whose tops were always shrouded in clouds. Those peaks seemed to hold the outside world at bay, and Dragus reflected, perhaps that was truer than he knew. So they found their land of opportunity then, Dracus said as he sat down and looked back out over the village spread below him. No, not nearly as easily as they had hoped, for no dream comes without cost, Shasa mused, sitting next to him. Many other settlements were established during that time, as the Dracosians tried to extend their land holdings to include foothills in Nordesia and the Vestasian coast, but each in turn failed. Only not three, no two, no four, and a handful of others clung stubbornly to their existence through the tumult of war and shifting alliances that marked that age. Our fathers found themselves increasingly on their own. The clans of the coast, as they called themselves. Tarakan, Finnig, Mirindau, Sondau, and Hakreb struggled to survive as the ships from our homelands became increasingly infrequent and our distant government drifted farther and farther removed from our lives. Shasa picked up a stone from the hillside and tossed it lightly down the slope. Then, two centuries ago, when the dragons of Armithia betrayed their alliance with the Dracosian lords, he continued, the ship stopped coming at all. We became the forgotten colonies, and here, in our little havens, we have been born, loved, Lived and died ever since. Dracus thought about this for a moment, the silence resting easily between them. Elder Shasa. Yes, Dracus. Have you determined whether I am this prophet everyone is looking for? Dracus. <laughs> what a strange question. Shasa said. It seems to me that a prophet would know the answer to that question himself. I don't know, Elder, Dracus replied. Sometimes I believe it, and sometimes I think it's just nonsense. I hear the dragon song in my mind, but from what I understand, so do many others. My name fits the prophecy, but then it's a common name. There is none more common among human slaves— there seem to be a lot of people who want you to be the Drakis of prophecy, Shasa replied. Perhaps you should ask a different question. A different question? Yes, Shasa said, as he too gazed off across the harbor. Perhaps you should ask yourself what you want. Do you want to be the Drakis of the prophecy, or do you want something else. Dracus stared at the balding man sitting next to him for a moment. Because if you are looking for something else, then you might consider looking down that upper path around the western hill. Shasa said casually. I believe I saw Mala following that same path toward the lace pools not ten minutes ago. Dracus smiled and stood up at once. 
Thank you, Elder Shasa. Write your own destiny, Dracus. Shasa called after the warrior as he sprinted down the path. Dracus could hear the cascade of the lace falls before he saw it, a gentle, quiet roar of water tripping down a rock face. The warrior in him knew that it masked the sound of his approach, and almost without thought he softened his footfalls and stepped more gingerly down the beaten path that wound between the dense undergrowth and the tree canopy above. The stream ran down the slope next to him, its clear, cool water rushing down toward Nothri far below. Before him, the forest was brightening as he neared the clear area around the pool. He stopped just short of the water's edge, holding his breath. Mala. She stood in the pool beneath the falls, the cascade of white water splashing around her shoulders and masking her body in tantalizing sheets. He could just make out the sweeping curve of her back above the surface of the pool, a hint of her breasts, and the profile of her elegant neck as her face turned up into the tumbling water. Mala turned toward the pool and dove, the momentary sight of her shoulders, waist, hips, and legs shining in the morning sun, taking his breath once more, before the lacy foam on the surface that gave the pool its name hid her from him. Her head surfaced near the center of the pool. She reached up out of the water with her glistening arms and pushed the water back from her short hair. Hello, he called gently across the water. Mala turned suddenly toward him, but her startled, angry stare softened at once. Oh, it's you. Yes, it's me. If you've come for a bath, you're too late, she said, her shoulders just above the surface as she moved her arms back and forth through the water. I claim this pool, and it is mine by right. I will not share my private little paradise with anyone else, no matter how badly they need bathing. And you most certainly are desperately in need of a bath. I didn't know you could swim, Dracus said, moving to the shore of the pool and sitting down. Mala took in a luxurious breath. <sighs> Neither did I, but I must have learned at some point. It feels so right, and I've probably left so much of the road in this pool that it will probably foul the stream for several months. Oh, but it's good to be clean again. What do you think of my hair? Mala turned around. Her red hair was wet, but he could already tell it was shaped differently than he remembered. That's a new look for you. When did that happen? Mala smiled and turned her head. Several of the women from North Three took it upon themselves to trim my ragged mop into this more pleasing form. Do you like it? Yes, Dracus said as he reached down and removed his sandals. I like it a great deal. Now you can stop right there, Mala said, though there was a smile still playing at the edges of her pout. I said this is my pool, and brutal warriors are not allowed to share it. I just want to put my feet in, Dracus complained. Surely you cannot deny me the opportunity to wash these travel-weary feet. You, travel-weary, Mala said. You've done nothing but travel, Dracus, and dragged us all along with you. She affected a serious look on her face, lowering her voice. We go north. Keep going north. Don't know where it is, but it's north. Fine. Have your laugh, Dracus said, though he was chuckling as well. He slipped his feet into the water. But it got us here, Mala. And here is not a bad place to be. No, she said softly. Here is a good place. Dracus paused for a moment, and then, reaching up over his shoulders with both arms, grabbed the back of his tunic and pulled it off over his head. You can just stop right there, warrior boy, Mala said sternly. It's a mess, Dracus replied, holding out the rumpled cloth. Look at it. Hasn't been washed in weeks. I'll bet it would move on its own if I left it standing. People won't talk to me, Mala, for the stench of it. This shirt needs a cleaning. It's just a courtesy. Mala giggled. Those, 
Those are the worst excuses I have ever heard. Can't you come up with something more creative? Warrior boy? Dracus smirked. Very well, that wasn't my best either. But you have me at a disadvantage. So you need clothes to think? Mala smiled through her pout once more. I don't seem to be thinking very clearly without them. Dracus laughed again, plunging his shirt deep into the pool. Then he drew the wet cloth up, wrung it out, and then stopped, just holding it. What is it, Drakey? Mala asked, her lithe arms making eddies in the surface of the pool. He stopped. It's good to hear you call me that again. So what is it? she urged. I am weary of the road, Mala, he said in a voice that barely carried over the rushing sound of the waterfall. I've been fighting all my life for things that meant nothing to me, for masters who thought of me as property and who didn't care if I lived or died. Now with all this prophecy nonsense, it feels as though everyone wants me to be something or somebody for them again. I'm tired of living my life for everyone else's expectations, everyone else's life. What do you want, Drakey? Mala said quietly. I want... Drakus struggled for a moment. It was a new thought for him, and he was having trouble even putting it into words. I want... something of my own. Something of your own? Yes. Dracus said, his words forming with more conviction around the idea. I want a place like this, a life that has nothing to do with the Iblisi or the Imperium, or mad dwarves or prophecies or this damn song that keeps calling me to a destiny I never asked for and certainly do not want. I want, I want this place, a small home in the village, cool water to drink, food to eat. I want children to raise, and a life that is my own to share, and— And? Mala asked, pushing backward through the water. And— And I want to know how to swim, he finished. Mala laughed. What's so funny? The great big warrior afraid of the water. Yes, he sighed. Drakey? Yes, Mala? You shouldn't be afraid, she said softly. I'm standing on the bottom, it's not that deep. Invisible to them both, Ethis the Chimerian stood watching Dracus and Mala from the shore of the pool. His skin blended so perfectly with the foliage that had they known he was there, they would not have been able to see him, even were they looking directly at the spot where he stood. All they might have discerned was the movement of the cloth as he fingered Mala's gown where she had draped it over a bush. But they would have had to look quickly, for in the next moment he was gone. Chapter 40 Without Doubts Belog crouched down in the lodge of the elders, peering intently at the pictographs on the walls. Mm. He growled in a low voice, his great eyes narrowing as he looked more intently at the images carved into the wall. They appear to have some of this wrong. It was a perfectly reasonable assumption for the manticore. His faith was sure and unshakable. As cubs pouncing and rolling through the tall grasses of the Chenandrian borderlands, both he and his brother Karag had lived and breathed the legends histories and tales of the lore-masters. In the fading light of a spent day, the two of them would gather with the rest of their pride as the stars appeared, and listened as the ancient dead and their deeds were brought again to life in their imaginations. Stories of the old ways and the shattering empires of men, the fall of the dragons and the desperate charges of the Tenandrian guardians, whose numbers were so great that the earth trembled when they ran into battle. But of all the legends told beneath the fading cobalt of the sky, 
none impressed his brother Karag more than that of Dracus Aerweaver and the dragons of Armenthia. Both of them would lie spellbound at the sound of the loremaster's voice as he wove the tale from memory. Elog could still see in his mind's eye those dragons that flew in their imaginations just beyond reach, weaving in and out between the stars as they appeared. He could almost picture the northern lords on their backs, watching over the world far beneath them. Then the loremaster came to the tragic and terrible betrayal, where all the world, including many weak and covetous lords of the Manticorean prides, conspired in their jealousy to bring low the might of Dracosia and take on its glory for their own. In sorrow at the betrayal, Dracus removed himself from the circles of the world. Then came the mournful song of the dragons as they in turn were brought to a terrible awareness of their own guilt and began the ages old lament, even as the great cities of Dracosia vanished into the mists, never to be found again among mortal lands. The song, the loremaster told them, was still sung today by the dragons of the North Country, beyond the raging waters of the oceans, calling to the night stars in the hope that Dracus would hear their sorrow, accept their regret, and return once more in might and power to establish justice for all the races of Dunea, who longed once more to be free. This was the great hope of the loremaster for the Kadush pride. For though they too were cursed as all the manticores for the betrayal, they had been among the prides that had broken with the lords of the manticorean clans and would not allow themselves to become toothless puppets of the Ronas oppression. By the crackling bonfire around which he and his brother had gathered with the rest of the Kadush pride, Belog heard the loremasters speak of their glorious destiny— to resist the Ronas, to free the enslaved prides, and to look for the day when Dracus, the mystical human of divine power from the north, would again take form among mortal men, and having been a slave himself, would lift the curse that held the Manticorean nation in chains and awaken the power of the Kadush once more to hunt their true enemies. Watching the embers from the fire rise up among the stars, Belog saw the firelight shining in Karag's eyes. His elder brother believed the words of the loremaster with all his heart. In time, Karag had even studied under the loremaster with the thought in mind of becoming his apprentice, and one day perhaps even becoming the loremaster to the Kadush pride. But in the end, Karag discovered that it was not his calling, that recitation of the lore was not enough for him, he had come to believe with unquestioning fervor that Dracus not only would come, but that he had come, and that the greatest thing he could do would be to leave the pride and journey into the world to find the prophesied liberator and serve him in his coming battle against the Ronas oppressors. It would require hardship, and in the end great sacrifice— but the glories of the songs to be sung and the stories to be told of those who served Dracus in his return would last down through the ages. To Belog, who lived on every word of his elder brother, the dreams and the glories that awaited them in such service were intoxicating, and any sacrifice seemed but a small matter by comparison. His brother believed, and so Belog too believed. For him, in those early years, it was just that simple. So when Karog left the pride to search for the promised emancipator of the manticores, Belog went with him without a second thought. They journeyed northward, because the legend said that Dracus would one day come from the north. Their track also took them somewhat westward, around the northern foothills of the Aryan Mountains, as Karog wished at all costs to avoid the bizarre and devious chimera of Ephendria. As they traveled, Belog learned all that his brother knew about Dracus Aerweaver and the dragons of Armethia, committing each detail to memory. Belog could still remember the smile his brother gave him with each correct recitation, or whenever Belog answered his questions correctly. Then came the day they were ensnared by the Ronas slave hunters on the verge of the Vestasian savannah, and with their first enforced devotions, all the memories of their great quest and hopes for their future vanished, 
under an avalanche of lies and false memories. And so they lived for nearly four years as slaves of the Ronas, asleep to their true natures and fighting battles for the elves in which they had only artificial loyalty and illusionary allegiance to their master's houses. Belog, in hindsight, now considered that time as a trial of his faith and part of the sacrifice by which the gods test their heroes. By then, both he and his brother knew a human slave named Dracus, but their memories were so buried beneath the miasma of house devotional spells that they did not even recognize the object of their quest when they saw it. Then Karog died in their final battle, died saving this Dracus. Belog believed that somehow Karog must have known, even through the damning house devotions, that protecting this human was his greatest moment and the culmination of his faith. His brother, Belog now knew without a doubt, was a martyr whose death atoned for the curse on the manticores of their pride's clan. Then came the awakening. Dracus utterly destroyed the aether well of House Timuron and freed Belog's mind from the interwoven chains of lies, deceptions, and falsehoods that his life had become. In that moment, he remembered it all, how the elven hunters had taken both him and his brother and every painful, humiliating day since. Most of all, he remembered the legends of Dracus and attached them at once to the Empress warrior that he knew so well especially since his brother had died defending him in the battle of the Ninth Throne. It was a sign. It had to be a sign. It had to be significant. His brother had to die for a greater cause, and his death had to be on behalf of his lifelong dream, so that his spirit could rest among the honored dead. In that moment, standing amid the chaos as House Timuron tore itself apart, in that moment, Belog knew the reality of it with his entire soul. His fragile sanity hung suspended by that single, inviolable truth. This human Dracus was the embodiment of his brother's every hope, and his life gave meaning to his brother's death. Belog withdrew his face from its close proximity to the carving on the wall and shook his head, repeating his words. Ah, they have it wrong. They see it differently, a small voice said casually next to him. The large lion man jumped slightly at the sound. Belog had not believed it possible for a human to be able to approach so near a manticore without being heard. No, they are wrong, Lyric. Not so much wrong as you are both right in a different way. The lyric replied, her own gaze fixed on the carvings adorning the wall. Her hair had grown into a wild nimbus of near white radiating from her head. Its soft strands seemed to float in the air around the crown of her head. They do not know what you know, Belog. How could they see through your eyes? Belog spoke quietly down toward the much shorter human woman. And whom have I the pleasure of addressing today? The lyric looked up at him, her large eyes shining up from her narrow face. Of course you are a manticore, and from a far and strange land, I wonder not that you have never encountered my kind before. Fear not, good creature, I am a beneficent spirit, and mean you no ill. A spirit? Belog furrowed his furry brow. I, the lyric responded with a sad smile, I am the ghost of Musarin the Wanderer. I am most often invisible, but I show myself to those whose stories I wish to take with me, and to those whom my stories may help. Every creature of the world has a story, and I am fated to know them all. Belog let out a relieved breath. The lyric changed her persona unpredictably, and more often than not, lately she had taken to adopting strange and sometimes dangerous characteristics. Yesterday had been a challenge. She had proclaimed herself Clarinda, the throat-cutting harlot of Shargoth Bay, and had everyone more than a little wary of her. 
A ghost of some wandering story-gatherer sounded like a good deal safer personality for all concerned. Then you know the legends of Dracus Ea Weaver. I do, and a good many more, the lyric said with a sad darkness in her voice. There is one story that interests me most right now, one with which you can help me. I have the beginning and the middle right, but I do not yet have the ending. You need my help with a story? Belog chuckled. It is a story that will interest you, I think. The lyric replied, arching her eyebrows. Thank you, spirit. Belog replied, turning back to the carvings on the wall. I have no need of stories. But this one involves you, the lyric replied. It is the story of Ru'ukog, the manticore who lost his tail. Lost his tail? Belog snorted. Ha! <laughs> he should look behind him. Not his tail, Belog, his tail the lyric said with surprising impatience. His story, his personal legend. Every creature is the hero of his own story, but Ru'ukag lost his. Now I fear he has gone to find it. Belog hesitated. Find it? Yes, the lyric replied, shaking her head. He left yesterday, late in the evening. I followed him, invisible as I was, for as long as I could. He crossed over the Cragsway Pass toward the— Where are you going? The story isn't finished yet. Belog was already throwing open the doors of the Elder's Lodge, his pace picking up quickly toward the bay. Aye, that's a fine ship, lass, Jugar said through his wide-toothed grin. I've never seen the like. Then you've never encountered the Corsairs of Thetis, Urulani replied, swinging around a backstay to land on the planked deck beneath her feet. She's just three hands under thirty cubits in length from stem to stern, and we can pull her at a respectable speed with a crew of twenty, given a good sea. She's the smallest of our Corsairs, but I rather like her. It is a wonder, the dwarf said shaking his head as he gazed at the ship where it was moored to the dock. The Sidron, as Urulani called it, was a beautiful craft. Its hull tapered fore and aft with such elegant lines that it looked as though it could fly across the waves with barely a feather's touch. She was not a terribly large ship, completely unlike the large and rather ponderous galleons that the Ronas employed against their rebellious cousins on the southern borders of the Empire, but was built for grace and speed. Three slightly angled masts gave a powerful rake to her lines. Her main deck was a single level, though a raised walkway just above the level of the oarsmen's heads connected a small enclosed forecastle and a more elevated afterdeck that held the long, ornately carved arm of the rudder. He was a dwarf, and his expertise was largely relegated to the realm of stone— but he certainly could appreciate the art involved in such a fine piece of woodcraft. His eyes twinkled as he took in the lines of the ship. How fast will it sail? She'll cross the bay in less than three days, Urulani said. We've raided coastal towns in Nordesia when necessary, and been back in less than a week's time. A wonder, a marvel of our age, Jugar nodded with appreciation. Perhaps I will have the privilege of sailing aboard her one day. You know, Dracus is such a strange human, even seen through the eyes of his own kind. I might venture to say uh, that I wouldn't wonder if he would request passage to the north. Urulani was no longer paying attention to the dwarf. It looks as though someone else of your group has taken an interest in boats. Jugar turned and was astonished if not a little frightened, to see Belog bounding toward them, crouched over and rushing toward them on all fours. The great manticore slid to a halt on the planks of the dock, rising back on his hind legs as he spoke. Urulani! Jugar! Have either of you seen Ru'ukog today? Jugar looked up. 
No, but I would not consider that an unusual occurrence. He is, as you well know, a most reclusive individual, prone to rather moody withdrawals from our company. Urulani, the manticore said, turning hastily to the dark-skinned woman. Have you seen Ru'ukag, the other being like me? Urulani smiled slightly through her puzzlement. I do know what a manticore is, friend Belloc. But I have not seen Ru'ukag since last night when... Urulani stopped speaking. What is it? Belog asked. I was discussing Drakus with some of the elders last night. Urulani replied, her smile having fallen. We were considering additional sentries to be posted in the Sentinel Peaks and along the Cragsway Pass... The discussion turned to whether we should have our warriors travel in pairs to watch each other. Watch each other? Jugar said, raising his own thick eyebrows. Why should you be concerned about your own warriors? Because, Urulani said, stepping up from the deck onto the dock. The stories of Drakus being spread by the Haka Aran and the Jeka Aran both also now speak of incredible rewards being offered for the location of your friend and any of the rest of you. We were talking of this when your friend suddenly appeared. We changed the subject of our speech. But now I wonder if perhaps he didn't overhear us. The traitor! Jugar's words exploded from his mouth. He's finally done it. We've got to stop him. He'll be the ruin of us all. What do you mean, dwarf? Belog snarled. It's him, Jugar said, grabbing his pack and shoving at Belog to get him moving as well. He'll bring the Iblisi down on all of us if we don't reach him first. Without a doubt. Chapter 41 The Crossroads the manticore stood silhouetted against the bright backdrop of the stars in a cloudless night. He was hunched over, his massive head turning furtively from side to side. The tall grasses of the savannah stretched to the south, west, and east under the starlight. To the north, the dark towers of the sentinel peak stood as a great jagged wall blotting out the stars. But here, almost exactly beneath his padded feet, two widely trampled roads came to an intersection. One curved down from the mud gnome city to the northwest and plunged deep into the Vestasian savannah to the southeast. The other carved a wide path from the Tempest Bay colonies of the Jeka Aran gnomes to the east and wound its way to other more southern mud gnome cities to the southwest. Both roads were formed by the passage of gnomes who were in too great a hurry to stop at this singular place and who, in the depths of the night, had left the manticore entirely alone. The creature continued to shift nervously under the stars, first on one foot and then the other, turning from time to time to look behind him. All the while he held a small stone gingerly between the thick fingers of his right paw, tapping it nervously onto similar stones he had cupped in his right paw. The manticore stopped for a moment, holding perfectly still in the night his head straining upward. He shivered abruptly, though the night was far from cold, the hairs on his growing mane shaking momentarily. Then he resumed striking the small stones together once more. So, it is you, a voice said from the darkness. The manticore wheeled around, dropping to a crouch, his legs contracted and prepared to spring. Peace, friend the voice said, seeming to come from every direction at once around the startled manticore. The manticore relaxed slightly, his eyes straining at the darkness. He spoke quietly into the night. I am a servant of the Empire! And you have done well, came the voice in reply from a shadow that appeared out of nowhere before the eyes of the manticore. Have we met, master? Not before tonight, the shadow responded. Its shape was more defined now against the stars, lithe and tall after the form of the elves. Its head was cloaked in a great hood, and in its right hand it held a long, ornate staff. 
although I have followed you for some time. By what name are you known? Ru'ul Kog, Master, the manticore answered, bowing down before the robed elf. I was a servant in the house of Timuron, and the beacon of that house. You have done well, Ru'ul Kog, the shadow answered. Are the others near? No, my master. The elven silhouette stopped. Then why have you called me Beacon of Timuron? The stones, my master, Ru'ukog replied with evident pain in his voice. The dwarf has discovered them. He stole most of them from me as I slept, and doubtless plans to use them to confuse you, my master. He will send them away with someone else and instruct them to mislead you, to take you farther from me. I would be lost to you, my master. I would be lost. The manticore fell to the ground, burying his head under his forepaws. Peace, friend, the hooded elf said once more, his staff lowering slightly until the glowing blue gem fixed in its head shone down on the manticore. The groveling creature relaxed slightly and looked up. Please, master, please take me back. I want to forget. I want to go back and forget everything I ever was or did. I had no part in this rebellion, I swear it. Please, I don't want to remember any more. In time, the elf replied calmly. When you have finished your task, my task? Ru'ukog asked as he pushed himself up. Even kneeling, his head was still nearly level with the elf's chest. But, master, I have done all that was expected. I have led you to me. You have found me. You are not the one I seek, the elf said softly. Until I have taken him, you will not have peace. Ru'ukog stood suddenly. The elf's staff shifted menacingly. Uh, but, master, Ru'ukog grumbled, I've done all you asked of me. I stayed with the rebels, dropped the beacon stones as I promised. And where are they now? The elf demanded. I could have taken you any time I wished, but just getting recaptured wasn't your task, was it? You were supposed to lead me to the rest of the bolters, not just you. The entire point of having beacons planted among the slaves is so that you will lead us to all the other escaped slaves, not just yourself. Please, master, the manticore said, wringing his large fur-covered hands. I just want to go home. Home? The elf spat. You have no home, Ru'ukag. It's burnt to the ground, its walls caving in on itself as a ruin, because your companions wrecked it all. If you're going to have any home at all, it will only be after you finish your task, by leading me to the bolters with whom you've been traveling. I don't know where they are. What? They... they moved on, Ru'ukag said. That Drakus human said something about going east, maybe finding a ship or something. They've probably left by now. Then find them, the elf insisted. By the gods, you're a manticore! But, master, Ru'ukag asked with uncertainty in his voice, I know you are powerful, but they have magic of their own, powerful and deadly. <sighs> How many of your brothers are with you? It's just me, the elf replied. And it will go a lot better for all of us if it remains just me. I don't understand, Ru'ukog said, shaking his head. Listen to me, Manticore. The elf was losing patience. There are three, maybe four, full quorums of Iblisi on the plains who are trying to keep up with me. They are hunting me in order that they may be led to you. 
when they find us, should they find us, then I can promise you as certainly as the sun will arise in the morning, things will go much worse for all of us, you included, if you do not get me to this Drakus friend of yours first. I, I don't... Oh, please, master, I've got to think. Think! The manticore flinched at the elf's shouted word. You don't have to think about anything. Thinking is what made you a coward. Ukog whined, his ears flattening back against his wide head. I may not have Timuron's impressed scrolls, but I did read the devotion ledger, especially of certain bolters, the elf said, stepping closer. Ru'u Kag, once of the Shakash pride, was supposed to be a warrior, supposed to rush into battle, but he thought too much, felt too much. So he came home, just walked back to his pride lands because the thought of battle and death and pain frightened him. The frightened manticore. A freak and an embarrassment to his father and mother and brothers and everything his Shakash pride had stood for and taught since the rise of Chenandria. You were useless, so they banished you to the Vestasian savanna. Ru'ukog shrank back. The elf pressed his face so near the manticore that his scent was overwhelming. How was that? For you, Ru'ukog, too afraid to fight and your own family not understanding why. They still loved you, still cared for you. But in one way or another, they all turned their backs on you and banished you from the pride. You might still be among them, but you could never again be one of them. So you banished yourself making the long way to the cursed lands of the Vestasian savannah, nursing the wounds in your heart. How was that for you, Ru'ukag of Shakash? Oh, pardon me, Ru'ukag of no pride at all. To come again just weeks ago back to the old lands of your punishment. Did even the mud gnomes remember the story of the manticore with no pride? No whispered Ru'ukag. Not even that. No, you were forgotten. Not even important enough for the mud gnomes to remember your story. The elf sneered. No wonder you prefer to forget. Ru'ukag closed his eyes. Great tears fell down his fur-covered cheeks, glinting in the moonlight. Now... I'm the one who knows your story, Ru'ukag. The elf continued. You could try to take me, I suppose. Try to summon that famously vicious warrior heart. And we could do battle right here. Or you could do as you were told to do. Lead me to Dracus and his companions, serve the imperial will, and as your reward, I will see to it that you never remember again who you were, and the shame you brought on your family and pride. Ru'ukog's breath was ragged. He held very still. Take me to Dracus, the elf whispered. And Ru'ukag can be completely forgotten. No one will remember that name. Not even you. Ru'ukag opened his eyes and stared into the blackness that was encompassed by the elf's hood. I will, master, the manticore said. The elf smiled, his sharp teeth shining in the starlight. But... I will need a new set of beacon stones, Ru'ukog continued. They're going to use the old ones to take you in the wrong direction. Here, yeah, the elf said, reaching into the folds of his cloak and pulling out a small plain pouch. These are my own, made by my hand. They will answer to my staff only. Thank you, master. 
the manticore said. He took a few steps up the northwestern road, and then stopped. Master, is it true that you do not wish to harm this Dracus human? The elf chuckled. <laughs> Rukag, I may be the only one I know who does not want him dead. But, Rukag persisted, why do you wish to keep him alive? I have my own reasons, the elf replied. Surely such things are beyond my understanding, Rukog said, his eyes gazing once more upward toward the stars. But it is a wonder that an elf should cross all of Chenandria, concern himself with the obscure backgrounds of a handful of freed slaves, and cross the length and breadth of the Vestasian plain just to meet this Dracus. The elf paused. You're thinking again, Ru'ukag. Sorry, master, the manticore said, lowering his head. Just don't let it happen again. Yes, master. The manticore turned once more to face the elf. They will have questions, master, about my absence, especially since they discovered the stones. What do I tell them? Tell them... The elf thought for a moment, before he continued with a bright lilt in his voice. Tell them that you were their traitor. They would kill me, Rukog said. You cannot be serious. On the contrary, I am most serious, the elf continued. They wouldn't believe you if you lie. Tell them that you have been dropping these stones so that they could be tracked and followed, and that the Iblisi are searching for them. Then tell them that after getting to know them, you have changed your mind and want to help them instead. They will believe this? Absolutely, the elf said, folding his arms across his chest, his staff casually crooked in his arms. Any lie is far more easily swallowed when it is mixed with a liberal amount of the truth. Besides, from what I know of this Dracus, he would be more willing to forgive a penitent traitor than a professed friend. Most humans are. Ru'ukog nodded. Then I shall do your bidding. But, Master, by what name shall I speak of you? Soen, the elf replied. Just. So in. Chapter 42 Heart of the Manticore Belog was straining at his own patience. Urulani knew the Cragsway Pass, and the dwarf simply could not be stopped from coming. Even the Lyric, who still insisted that as Musaran the Wanderer, her spirit could easily keep up with them all, was moving with them through the night. Fortunately, Belog mused, Dracus and Mala were nowhere to be found, or they too might have insisted on coming. As it was, the group was moving far more slowly than Belog liked. He would have preferred them to have just stayed behind and let him deal with Ru'ukag himself. A stealthy hunt and a quick kill would have been more to his liking. But he did need Urulani to help him track down the traitorous manticore and there seemed no stopping the dwarf or the lyric. At least Jugar had managed to close his mouth and keep silent as they passed to the south. It was well into twilight when they descended the southern slopes of the Sentinel Peaks. Ru'ukog's tracks had been easy to follow through the pass. He had made no effort in his haste to disguise them. Darkness fell fully upon them as the foothills gave way to the savannah beyond. The tracking became more difficult through the tall grasses, but Urulani had more success here. Soon it was evident that the trail had straightened. Urulani lifted her arm and pointed southward. Belog stopped and stood silently in the night for a time, finally lifting the dwarf up so that he could see above the tall grass. The trail led straight toward the mud city of the Haka'aran, the same city they had left just days before. 
Even from three leagues distant, they could see that something terrible had happened there. The mud city was burning. Tongues of flame flared above it from the opening in its enormous roof. Smaller fires burned outside the great dome. Black, greasy smoke was billowing from the opening, marring the night sky with a great absence of stars overhead. Belog put the dwarf down, and they began a more wary approach to the city. It was well after midnight when the four of them arrived at the clearing surrounding the city. Gaping pits had opened up all around the base of the dome, part of the defensive system that Belog had observed surrounded each of the mud-mound cities of the Haka'aran. Many of them appeared to have been activated. Other places in the ground and across the dome were marred with long, charred furrows. Look, Urulani said in hushed tones as she pointed along the base of the dome. Most of the gates are shut, but those two are broken inward, as is that third father down. Belog nodded and then raised his head. His ears swiveled forward as he listened intently. Only the crackling and rush of the fires came to his ears. No cries, no battle, just the sound of burning. He came here, the lyric said, with sadness filling her voice. Belog turned to her. Lyric, I don't think. Ru'ukag came here because he was in pain, the lyric said, her eyes fixed on the nearest shattered gate. He was in pain because he knew that he was once again part of a great story. He had listened to you, Belog, and heard more than you knew. For all his anger came from his pain, and his pain was that he had too great a heart. He believed you, Belog. In the end he believed in Dracus, too. Belog, Urulani, and the dwarf stared at the lyric. Her eyes gazed far away, as though she were seeing a scene that was beyond the vision of mere mortals. She began walking toward the shattered gate as she spoke. But his own story was sad and tragic. He had bragged about going to war when he was a cub, but in his heart he had doubts. He feared pain and death, and so in the end he was branded a coward by his own pride and exiled. He was forgotten even among the Haka'aran who once had sheltered him. Urulani whispered, How can she know these things? That girl knows much more than she's letting on, Jugar said, his eyes narrowing as he considered her. Belog shook his head. Uh, come, look there in the ground. Those are Ru'ukag's tracks, the lyrics walking in them. They came to the shattered gate. The long tunnel beyond curved gradually upward toward the center of the enormous mud dome, as in every other city they had visited. But here they stopped in horror. The floor was carpeted with the dead. What a struggle they must have put up! Jugar breathed. Urulani pressed her lips together, unable to speak. Belog turned to the lyric. What happened here? He came, the lyric continued, her eyes staring past the end of the rising tunnel, toward where the glow of the fire could be seen. He had accepted your faith in Dracus, Belog, and the old fear returned to him, but this time that he would be remembered as the manticore who failed the human of the prophecy. The battle was already raging when he arrived— he had come for solace from these gentle creatures of the Haka'aran, the only family he felt left to him. He saw the battle, heard the desperate cries of the mud gnomes. The lyric turned and pointed at the ground. Here he ran, charging past the bodies of the gnomes who had fallen. He picked up a weapon, taken from this gnome's cold hands, and with a great warrior cry leaped forward. The lyric stepped carefully among the fallen dead, their blood staining her sandals and the hem of her skirt as she walked down the tunnel. Belog and the others, entranced by her words, followed down the hall with gingerly steps. 
The lyrics stopped where the tunnel rose sharply upward toward the center of the dome. A great jet-black stain swept from one side of the tunnel to the opposite wall, where some of the mud had melted into dark glass. Here he saw the first of them, a robed elven hunter whose magic was killing the Hakka Aran in terrible numbers. Seeing the gnomes being murdered thus, at last Rukog found his warrior's heart, or perhaps he found a cause for which he could fight. At the apex of the stain lay a robed figure, missing its head. Here, for the first time, the lyric said, Ru'ukog found the courage to kill. The lyric, her hymn now dragging a terrible bloody stain across the floor behind her, stepped up the ramp and into the great open space beneath the center of the dome. The fires were burning out in the upper levels, but still gave all too bright illumination on the grisly scene. Two sections of habitat walls had collapsed, and buried part of the central floor of the common area. The bodies of the dead gnome defenders were a terrible blanket across the floor. Where are the children? Urulani asked. What? What children? Belog growled. That's my point, Urulani said, her eyes shifting across the mass of the dead. These are all warrior gnomes. Some men and some women, but none of them old, none of them infirm, and there are no children here among the dead. She's right, Jugar said in astonishment. In such a calamity, one might expect an even greater number of non-combatants to fall prey to the terrible confusion of war. And there's not enough of the dead. Belog nodded. Ah, this was terrible indeed. But even so, there are nowhere near enough dead to account for the entire city. He saved them, the lyric said simply. Who saved them? Belog asked. The lyric pointed again, this time to the far side of the commons. Belog's eyes opened wide. Ru'ukog, or what was left of him, lay dead against the wall. His eyes were dull and blood stained at the corners of his open jaws and his bared teeth. The hair was burned entirely off his left side, where the raw red of his muscle was exposed. His right arm hung at an impossible angle, flopping limply over one of the three shafts that pierced his chest. Next to him was a crumpled form in robes, an elf whose throat had been torn out. Elves! Belog snarled. Back again, eh? The dwarf gritted his teeth. Look, there are more of them, Urulani said, again pointing to various places around the hall. Four, six, wait, there's one up there too, seven of them. Belog nodded as he stepped quickly through the carnage to reach Ru'ukag's side. He stood over the fallen manticore for a few moments, and then reached down and closed his eyes. Well fought, brother, he murmured into Ru'ukog's ear. You've proved your heart this day. Your story will be told, and I will tell it. Jugar considered Ru'ukog for a moment, then took in the rest of the dead. He bought them time, time to escape. Yes, Belog said, straightening up. The rest of the Haka Aran are fleeing to the other cities. Within days the story of what happened here will be told from one end of the savannah to the other. I don't understand, Urulani said, shaking her head. Slave hunters have no reason to attack the mud cities. The Haka Aran have no possessions worth the attention of any elves, and they make terrible slaves. These Aran slavers, Belog said, turning suddenly. This is a full quorum of the Iblisi, the inquisitors of the Imperium. They have no interest in gnomes. What do they want, then? Urulani asked. Why attack this city? Because they thought we were here. Belog replied. Because they thought he was here. 
Dracus! Urulani sputtered. All these gnomes destroyed and your friends slaughtered. Just because these elven magicians think your friend is part of this moldy prophecy. Come, the manticore said as he began moving back toward the tunnel as quickly as the gore-coated floor would allow. We have to get back. We have very little time left. Time, Urulani said with astonishment. Time for what? Lyric, ah, uh, Musharan, Pelog called. You must come and tell this story to Dracus. As a spirit, I am above such things, the Lyric replied. Yes, but Dracus is fond of communing with spirits. Pelog continued. Come quickly. Jugar, Urulani, we must get back at once. Get back! Urulani was losing her patience. What about any survivors? What if there are more of those Ubisi things around? I tell you that there will be a lot more of those Ubisi things around soon enough, Belog said, stopping at the top of the ramp and turning to face the warrior woman. This was a single quorum, but as soon as the other quorums get word of what happened here, they're going to know it was one of us who did this, and it won't take them long to figure out that the only way we might have gone is through the Cragsway Pass. And to Northry, Jugar said as he nodded. They found us, Belog said, and our backs are to the sea. Chapter 43 Relentless Where has everyone gone? Mala asked casually. Do I care where everyone has gone? Dracus answered back, soft warmth in his voice. They walked as one along the sloping sands of the bay's shore, their bare feet digging into the residual warmth of the sand as the cool offshore breeze flowed past them. The sun was setting on a perfect day in the first place of peace that Dracus had ever known. The totality of its experience was almost painful to the human warrior, who had never known tranquility, never even had the ability to imagine it. Yet here they were, Mala's arm wrapped around his waist and his around her shoulders, walking beside the gently lapping waves of Nothri Bay and looking in awe at the encircling mountain peaks, fading to purple under a vibrant orange sky at sunset. But I haven't seen anyone all day, Mala said. What do you mean, haven't seen anyone? Dracus spoke through a crooked smile. Look, over there behind that Corsair galley, there's a whole group of someones working on those nets. And just up there, entirely too many someones who are trying to keep those children out from underfoot while they cook dinner. The whole village is absolutely lousy with someones. Mala slugged him in the chest with the boots in her hand, just hard enough so that he would not let go of her. You're terrible. That's not what I meant, and you know it. Where's the dwarf or the lyric? Or either of the manticores from our old house, for that matter. You forgot the Chimerian. Well, I'd just as soon forget the Chimerian altogether. Can't argue with you there. But seriously, Dracus. Mala stopped walking, pulling him around to face her just before they came to the beached prow of one of the Sondau ships. Where are they? Don't you think it odd that they follow you all this way and then run off without a word to you? They've been gone more than a full day now. It's like they all vanished at once. Mala, stop worrying, Dracus said, turning toward her and taking her by the shoulders. She looked so beautiful to him in the soft light of the closing day that he nearly forgot what he was about to say. I spoke with Elder Shasa this morning. He said that most of them went off to try to find Ru'ukag, who apparently had gotten it into his mind to return to the Haka'aran on his own. No one knows where Ethis went. And to be honest, I'd be just as glad if he remained lost. But, Dracus, Mala, listen to me. There's something I want to talk to you about. Dracus took her hand and led her higher up the beach, just short of the seawall. He gestured for her to sit, and then sat next to her as they both looked out over the waters of the bay. The evening was deepening, but through the narrow channel that entered the bay between the towering rocks could still be seen the fading remnant of the sunset, 
illuminating the northern horizon. What is it, Dracus? Mala asked quietly. Dracus sat still for some time before he spoke. Have you ever enjoyed quiet like this? Quiet? Mala laughed. I hear those pots in the kitchen behind us. I hear the laughter of those men mending the net, those children squealing up the beach, and the birds around here can be downright obnoxious. Dracus smiled. That's not what I mean. I mean the luxury of being quiet, of just holding still and looking out over the water with someone next to you to share that stillness, to not have to say a word and know that no one needs you to speak because the quiet around you speaks for you. Mala leaned toward him, resting her head against his shoulder. I've never known that quiet before here. It's painful. Yes, that's right. Dracus nodded. Painful because we never knew it existed, and now the thought of losing it is unbearable. Mala, I'm tired of running toward a horizon that is always getting farther away. Tired of pretending to pursue some destiny that isn't even mine. What are you saying? Mala asked. I'm saying that this, right here, is everything that I want or could ever want out of my life. Dracus reached down and pulled up a handful of the white sand from between his feet. It glittered slightly in the fading rays of the day. This place, this peace. I don't want or need any great destiny that may not be mine to begin with. All I want is this quiet, right here, with you. But the song in your head, the music that calls you, it's still there. Dracus replied, looking through the narrow passage to the north. The light on the horizon was rapidly fading. If anything, it is stronger than ever, but... Mala, that doesn't mean I have to follow it. Let it just be a song in my head. From what Elder Shasta tells me, there are plenty of other humans who have heard the song, too, and they didn't have to go out and become this great prophecy fulfillment, either. What are you saying? I'm saying I don't want to run any more. Dracus turned to Mala. I'm saying I want to stay. Right here, with you as my mate, or wife, or whatever the Sondau call it. Bury my sword. Have a family of our own and live a quiet life. I... I don't... Mala stammered. Is it possible, Dracus? I mean, we've run for so long, and we barely know ourselves who we are. We can be whoever we choose, Dracus persisted. If anything, I've learned that over the last months. It doesn't matter who we were, Mala. We can become who we want to be. We can forget about our past. What we cannot forget, we can forgive and start anew. Can we, Dracus? Mala said, looking up into his face. I don't know if people can change. Maybe we're so broken that we can't change. Dracus smiled down at her. How will we ever know if we don't try? It would be wonderful to try, she replied softly. An unwelcome shout behind Dracus shattered the moment. Dracus! It would be him, Mala said distastefully. Dracus pushed himself up from the sand and turned toward the voice. Yes, Ethis, it's me. Now that you've completely ruined my evening, I'm sure you've thought of some way to ruin my night as well. What is it? The Chimerian paused, glanced at Mala rising to stand next to Dracus, and then took in a deep breath. Yes, Dracus urged. You've got my attention. What is it? I... I thought we might discuss our next move. Our next move, Dracus responded. Just what move would that be? Why, northward, as you said. Ethis spoke, choosing words as a warrior might choose his weapons in battle. The Sondau have these corsairs that are legendary in the open sea. You might prevail upon them to take us farther on, perhaps across the Bay of Thetis into Nordesia, or even— 
No, Dracus said flatly. They might take us along the coast to the west, or we could travel by land to Point Contantine, but we would still need the Corsair ships to— No, Ethis, Dracus repeated more firmly. I'm not going anywhere. But your destiny, my destiny. You've been repeating that lie so long that you've started believing it yourself. Dracus shook his head. It's not me. Even if it were me, I wouldn't want it. It was all just a story the dwarf told Ethis, so the gullible folks along the way would feed us and give us a bed. It got us here, and that's enough. I'm not going anywhere. So that's it, then, Ethis spat, his blank expression vanishing for the first time that Dracus had ever known him into what passed for a scowl. You just give up. Tell the rest of the world to jump into the chaos while you play in the sand. Yes, Dracus shot back. It's my life. For the first time, it is mine. Not yours, not the dwarf fools, certainly not the Empire's. And I'm not giving it up to anyone else either. Ethis shook his head. You selfish, blind, narrow-minded idiot. It's gone way beyond time for you to hide. You think the Iblisi will just give up? That they'll wake up one day and say, This is too hard, let's just let this one go? They never give up, Dracus, and they never, ever forget. They will hunt you down and murder you. You and anyone who has been with you. The very first they'll take will be the closest to you. The safest thing you can do is get off this continent. Across the sea, somewhere they can't reach. Oh, please. Draco sneered. You're scaring the women. Ethis growled under his breath in frustration. You have no idea who these Iblisi are. Or who I am, for that matter. Oh, I think I have a pretty good idea about you. Draco snarled. I've seen what you're capable of, just how honest you can be. I'm trying to help you, human! Dracus looked behind the Chimerian. There came a rising tide of shouts from the village. Suddenly, one appeared, then three, and then entire families were running frantically about. Soon a number of them ran toward the various ships beached along the crescent of sandy shore that marked the edge of the harbor. Dracus eyed the Chimerian. What did you do, Ethis? Belog and the Lyric appeared behind the dwarf, all of them running directly toward Dracus and Mala. Well, Mala sighed to herself, it looks like everyone found us. Urulani came with them, but ran past Dracus without as much as a nod, shouting toward the beached ship beyond. Conchu, get up! A head poked up over the gunnels, staring blearily back. Raise me a crew of twenty! she shouted plunging into the water without slowing, then pulling herself up a rope that Kanshu hastily tossed over the side. We've got to get the ship provisioned and ready for sale at once, and I want warriors and sea crafters only, and pray we don't need them. I got done, Kanshu replied at once, himself jumping over the side and pushing shoreward through the shallows. How long a voyage, Captain? I don't know. Bring as much as is at hand. Urlani shouted as she at once set about readying the ship. I've told the elders to abandon the village. We'll hold the beach until everyone is safely away on the other ships. Are we being raided, Captain? Kanshu asked as he surged out of the water and onto the shore. Yes! I don't know when, but soon! Urlani called out. We have to get everyone out! They can't kill us if we aren't here! Now what? Dracus groaned. Dracus! The dwarf shouted, his short legs churning up the sand atop the seawall. Ah, good it is to see you, my friend, and most blessed by the gods indeed that you are well. We've not a moment to waste. Gather all that is needful and let us away while we can. Dracus closed his eyes and turned his face up toward the dark sky. You too? I finally find a place where I am content to stop, and now all of you want to leave. I am sorry, Dracus. Belog said, but we must. We don't have to do anything, Dracus protested. The manticore drew himself up before the human warrior and looked down at him with kind eyes. 
<sighs> Sometimes, friend, we must do a thing or we stop being ourselves. What does that mean? Dracus asked. It means that we have just returned from the mud city south of the Sentinel Peaks, Belog said. We tracked Ru'u Kog there. There is much to that tale that we will tell you when there is more time. But for now, all that needs to be said is that Ru'u Kog is dead. And so, too, is the city of the Haka Aran. Ethis caught his breath sharply. <sighs> dead. All dead. Belog looked curiously at the Chimerian. Yes, though we know that most of the mud gnomes escaped, thanks, I believe, to Ru'ukog. He found his heart at last. But— Mala struggled to find her words. Who would do such a thing? I mean, the mud gnomes weren't a threat to anyone and had nothing anyone would want. They had, Drakus. Belog said, his gaze fixed on the human warrior. No— Dracus said, closing his eyes as he shook his head. There were seven robed elves among the dead. Belog continued. Nearly a full unit of what the Iblisi call a quorum. It took only seven of them to destroy perhaps a thousand of the gnomes. But Rukag managed to help stop them at last. Stop them to protect you, Dracus. No, please, Dracus moaned. Not for me. Beyond, among the huts of the village, the shadows were moving swiftly. Men emerged from the edge of the jungle forest, all rushing with sacks and chests shouldered as they charged down toward the ship behind Dracus. Elsewhere along the shoreline, the other ships were being readied in haste to depart. They tracked us to that city, Belog said. They tracked you. Perhaps the death of their quorum was enough to give them pause, but if there is more than one quorum pursuing us... They'll know where we went. Ethis finished. They'll come directly here. They won't stop, Dracus thought. They'll never stop. Mala started to ask, How much time do you think... An explosion rocked the ground. An enormous ball of flame shot into the sky south of the village. The heat of it burst against their faces as they watched it roll upward into the night. How much time? Ethis drew his sword. I would say not enough. Chapter 44 Fury Name of the ancients! Orulani swore from the deck of the ship as she watched the fireball climb high into the night. Those are the inner defenses. They slipped past the altitude. How close are they? Dracus called up to Urulani. One hundred yards from the edge of the village, she replied. They are very close, prophet man. Belog turned at once to Dracus. They know we have ships, and their objective is to destroy every breathing thing here. Their first move will be to cut off our escape. That means they'll try to take the beach. Dracus nodded as he drew his own sword. Probably from the sides. Or at least they'll try to destroy the ships. If they manage either one, we're finished. Ethis agreed. We've got to protect the flanks of the beach until the ships are away. Dracus turned to the manticore. Belog, you and Ethis take the east end of the beach. Gather as many of the Sondau warriors as you can. There's a jumble of boulders about a hundred yards down there just above the seawall. Do you see it? Yes, Dracus. The manticore nodded. Two more explosions erupted over the treetops, followed shortly by a third. The beach was getting crowded with people from the village, many of them readying the boats, and others tossing supplies and children in as well. The Sundao raiders were just as readily tossing the children back out, shouting for others to wait until the ships were ready to sail. The cries and confusion were both rising precipitously around them. Dracus kept talking to the manticore. Take anyone you can gather there. You'll have a good view of the eastern side, and the position is defensible. Fall back below the seawall if you have to, and make your way back here. Got that? Belog nodded. Ethis! Yes, Dracus. It looks like you'll get your wish after all, Dracus said. Don't let them through. If they close off this beach, it's all over. The Chimerian nodded, then drawing his two long scimitars from their scabbards at his back, 
He followed quickly on the heels of the manticore. Dracus turned to Mala. You get the lyric aboard the ship. Help Urulani get it ready to sail. Do anything she says, and wait for me here. Dracus, don't go, she said, her voice in near panic. I've seen you go off to battle so many times, but... I'll be back, Dracus repeated. I've got to come back. You're here. Mala nodded, then looked away, unable to watch him go. Dracus turned, slapping Jugar on the back. Let's go, dwarf! Have you ever actually been in a battle, or do you just talk about them? Oh, <laughs> I've been in a few, Jugar chuckled. Mind you, I prefer just talking about them, but I believe I'll manage. With that, the dwarf drew his broad-bladed axe in front of him and charged west down the beach, dodging between the humans rushing toward the edge of the water. Dracus shouted and followed after him. Soen stepped through the fold just as an explosion to his left rocked the ground. He lost his footing and fell to his knees. He cursed again, his eyes wide with anger and frustration. Everything had gone wrong. He had come to the northern reaches of the Empire with a simple plan, and he had hoped the blessing of Keeper Chidre to recapture this Dracus quietly so that they might use him for their own purposes. But Chidre was always a devious woman, and never made an honest wager when she could concoct a dishonest one. Soen had not been more than a few days out on his journey when he knew that he was being followed and tracked through the folds. It didn't take him long to determine that he, as the hunter, had become the hunted, the bait for a rather bloodier and more bludgeon-like approach to solving the problem. The subtlety that Chidre mastered in her politics had apparently failed her in execution of policy, and she preferred the finality of death to more delicate influences. Still, Soen had hoped to complete his mission as he had originally intended, confront this Dracus human, and determine if indeed he was the prophesied doom of the Imperium. Information like that brought opportunities that he could scarcely calculate, and capabilities that even the bloodthirsty Chidre could not deny. But all of that was crumbling around him. Even as he was making contact at last with the beacon among these bolters, the Inquisitor who had been tracking him had grown impatient and clumsy. A quorum had attacked and laid waste to an entire mud city of the Haka Aran, managing somehow also to get themselves destroyed in their zeal, and leaving behind such undeniable wanton carnage that even Soen was appalled. Worse, the stories of the slaughter were now spreading like a grass fire across the savanna by the surviving mud gnomes. The two stories were already merging, of Dracus and of the Iblisi quorums out to destroy him at any cost. Soon, if it had not happened already, these stories would reach the Jake Ka'aran townships around Urani Keep. Within a week, every ministry and order of the Empire would know that there was a Dracus loose in the Northlands who was being hunted by the Iblisi. Their very hunt would give the rumors credit, and what was once a containable flicker of an idea would become a raging bonfire of debate in the courts of the Emperor himself. He had managed to find their fold standards and followed them here to this human village on the shores of the Bay of Thetis, where once again this blundering Inquisitor was trying to capture a butterfly with a two-handed club. The outer homes of the village were already blazing, the walls of several of them blown flat. The smell of burning flesh filled the air. He could see robed figures hovering at the edge of the town, the spells from their mate staffs creating a wide clearing all around the village where no one could cross unnoticed. The path was closing toward the beach as he watched. He had to put a stop to this. There! I see them, Dracus, the dwarf responded. They had gathered a dozen men of the Sondau with them toward the western edge of the village. All of them were arrayed along a jagged low ridge a few yards from the beach. They're moving to the right. Aye, and now, lad, there's a few things you need to know about this particular enemy that in your experience you may not have considered before tonight. What? These are, if I may be so bold as to inform you, quorums of the Iblisi Order, keepers and guardians of the truth— they're rather powerful, experienced users of the elven aether magics, and are superbly trained warriors. For someone like yourself, skilled warrior as you are, 
To attempt to best one of these in single combat would be an act of supreme foolishness, and what I believe is commonly referred to as a sucker bet. You're telling me this now? Dracus answered in a hoarse whisper. What are you suggesting? That we just surrender and get it over with? I never counsel surrender, my friend, unless there is profit in it. The dwarf chuckled back. I only tell you this so that you will have no romantic notions about this combat. The Haka Aran were fine warriors despite their size, organized and efficient. There were only seven of these Iblisi, and the mud gnomes died by the thousands. In the end, the gnomes won because their numbers and the key help of Ru'ukag overwhelmed the Iblisi. So you want us to charge them in force? Dracus asked, his voice skeptical. I don't think we've got quite the numbers that the mud gnomes had. Nonsense, the dwarf winked. This calls for subtlety and a large dose of ledger domain. I want you to keep an open mind. If nothing else, remember this. There are only seven in a quorum. They are each powerful beyond belief, but with each one you kill they are diminished just as greatly. In such a contest there are no rules but one. He who lives wins. You cannot take any of them in open combat. No one can. You have to be where he does not suspect you, attack from where he cannot see you, and kill him before he knows he's dead. Clever trick, Dracus agreed. But they're almost to the beach. Their fires are burning a path before them, and anyone who tries to cross it is being burned to cinders before they reach the other side. We have no time for an elaborate defense. Not elaborate, the dwarf grinned. Just subtle. I've been saving this one up. The dwarf reached inside his waistcoat. In his hands, he held the dwarven heart of air. The rock shattered before Belog's face, collapsing in front of him into a blue haze. The manticore instinctively fell back away from the powerful eye of the Iblisi staff that was searching him out among the rocks, and he tumbled down the seawall. Ouch! Get off! Belog rolled over, pushing up off the sand while throwing himself against the seawall. Ethis, we need to get closer to them. Closer? The Chimerian shouted over the roar of the fires burning from the shore to the heart of the village. The Iblisi were incinerating them from thirty yards away. We can't hurt them if we're not close enough for our weapons. What about the Sondau? The Chimerian asked over the din. Don't they have archers? Great ones, but their volleys aren't hitting their marks. The manticore answered, his face peering over the sands toward the advancing enemy. Something is deflecting them. I can only imagine what that might be. Ethis groused. If we can get around their flank, Belog said, licking his incisors, then we'd be close enough to taste their blood. Around their flank? Ethis drew himself up next to Belog. Do you see a flank? At the water's edge. Belog pointed. We just need to draw them closer to the village. Two small hands clapped them both on the back at the same time. Fellow warriors, take heart! The Wind Princess of Nordens has come to your aid! With that, the lyric leaped blithely over the seawall and began running with all her might toward the burning village. No! Belog roared. Dracus floated upside down in the night. He had to close his eyes from time to time to avoid being dizzy, but he clutched his sword in his right hand so hard he thought the grip might snap. The fires spread by the Iblisi drifted below him. The heat from them was making him sweat, and this worried him as much as anything, because he somehow knew that a single drop falling from his brow could easily call death upon him. He twisted slightly as he opened his eyes. The dwarf was back behind the ridge of stone beyond the lane of fire. Trust the little fool not to mention that he had some skill in magic. Just when was he going to tell the rest of us? Dracus thought. At my funeral or after? Beneath him he could see his target, a robed Iblisi just below him, his staff gushing fire across the landscape only three feet below him. Dracus opened his left hand, readying it for the plunge, 
his right hand coiled with the sword ready to strike. The dwarf had said they never look up. He hoped this worked. Suddenly Dracus fell from the sky. In a swift motion, Dracus grabbed the sharp chin of the elf beneath him, and using the Iblisi's shoulders as leverage, swung his knees down his victim's back. The tip of his sword connected at the base of the throat just above the collarbone and slid with satisfactory force into the rib cage and tore through the creature's heart. In the next moment, Dracus lay on the ground, surrounded by the dense ground cover of the jungle, with the dead elf lying on top of him. That's one, Dracus thought. But it's not enough. They're moving too fast. In the next moment, he was yanked skyward by the dwarf's magic once again. Wait, look! Ethis shouted. The lyric ran across the line of Iblisi, diving at the last moment behind a tree. The trunk exploded into a thousand splinters, toppling the tree. But she was no longer there. The Iblisi saw her at once, their mate staffs shifting to strike her with their full force. Blue and red rods of light arced toward her. Waves of flame and sound engulfed her, but never reached her. She is the Wind Princess, Belog said with shock. Wind Princess or not, Ethis said with a smile as he pointed. Look what she's doing. The Iblisi continued to train their power against her as she darted about the village ruins, drawing them inward and away from the beach. There's your flank, Belog, Ethis said. But I've got something I have to tell you before you go. Something you have to do that can mean all the difference in the world to us all. The manticore looked quizzically at the Chimerian. You must do this for Dracus, he said, reaching into his pocket. Dracus once again floated over the landscape. They were moving too fast, and this was taking far too long. Good plan or not, the end result would be the same. Another of the Iblisi was below him now. He needed the dwarf to move him just a little more to the left. The fires below were unbearable. The heat was making it hard for him to concentrate, and his eyes stung. He opened his left hand again and drew back his sword. The dwarf was moving him slowly, carefully. A gust of wind drifted over the fires, carrying with it a wave of smoke just as Dracus drew in his breath. He coughed. The Iblisi looked up just as Dracus fell. He jumped sideways, but not far enough. Dracus caught him on the way down, dragging him along, but the sword did not enter properly and plunged into the elf's body at an angle. The elf screamed. Dracus tore the blade from the body of the elf, just as Jugar's magic dragged him into the air. Two of the Iblisi leaped into the air to follow. Chapter 45 Fall of the Inquisitor Dracus flipped over in midair, turning toward the rustling sound behind him. Two of the Iblisi were rising into the sky in his wake, their dark reddish robes rustling as they rushed toward him. He gripped his sword and was suddenly aware of how useless it was. There was no place in the sky where he could plant his feet and get any leverage with which to strike a blow. The dark spirits of death flew closer to him by the moment as he watched in helpless horror. In that instant, the two figures vanished in a roaring vortex of whirling sand. Dracus felt the magical power that supported him in his flight falter for a few staggering moments— and then vanish altogether as the cyclone tossed and tumbled the robed figures in its grasp. Dracus fell, his free hand clawing at the air. He glimpsed the beach rushing up toward him just before he closed his eyes. Something shoved him sideways, and in the next moment he was rolling across the sand. Chu Kong was yelling at him, Standing still on the field of battle is an invitation for death to find you! Dracus pushed his feet under him, dragging his sword from the sand and taking a defensive stance, though what he saw astonished him. The Sun Dao raiders were crouched down, prepared to meet the enemy, but it was Jugar who was commanding the cyclone. The vortex was spinning along the shore, dancing before the short, upstretched arms of the dwarf. Jugar's face was nearly beat red with the effort as he stood with his feet pressed hard against the sand and the heart of air in his left hand shining with a purplish light that made Dracus uneasy just to look at it. 
Jugar glanced at Dracus, saw that he was once more on his feet, and flicked the wrist of his extended right hand. One of the Iblisi shot from the vortex, spinning with frightening speed directly toward Dracus. The human warrior's trained muscles reacted before the thought entered his mind. He raised the blade over his head and stepped into the onrushing target. The whirling target did most of the work against the keen edge of the blade, nearly dividing the elf in two across the abdomen. As the target fell squealing to the ground, Dracus quickly reversed the blade in his hands and plunged it down directly into the creature's heart. Three, he counted. As he turned to stand, more movement caught his eye. Juga, more on the ground! The dwarf shifted at once. The vortex collapsed, tossing the suddenly freed Iblisi into the jungle trees. Dracus heard with satisfaction the elf slamming into a tree trunk with the sound of a smashing melon. Instantly, this was followed by an enormous wave drawn up from the bay. Its sea-foam face rose higher and higher, shimmering in the light of the burning village as it arched over and crashed down upon the advancing reddish robes. The waters flowed on into the village and over the fires, snuffing out a wide swath of the flames and filling the air with dense smoke. Through the smoke leaped four more of the robed horrors, one of them soaring directly toward the dwarf, its mate staff pointed at his heart. The dwarf turned toward his attacker, but the San Dao chose that instant to rise up. Three of them intercepted the Iblisi charging Jugar, physically knocking the magic-wielding elf down as he approached the ground. The Iblisi obliged them, countering with his staff in a blur of moves, killing the three of them where they stood around him nearly at once. More of the Sun Dao had joined in the fray, but they too were faring no better. Dracus ran to the dwarf. Juga, I'm nearly done, boy, the dwarf said as he tried desperately to catch his breath. Get up. We've got to keep moving. We can't. Hold them, the dwarf grimaced. Back, Dracus. We've got to get back to the boats. Dracus dragged the dwarf to his feet. The Sundao line of battle was literally evaporating into a bloody mist before the power of the Iblisi magic. They turned toward the boats that were still hovering near the shore, still struggling to load people aboard. They ran, knowing that the Iblisi would be right on their heels. They had tried to purchase enough time for the ships to get away, and they knew they had failed. Soen strode through the village, a circle of frost crackling around him wherever he stepped. His footfalls froze the fires beneath them, snuffing them out in a swath behind him. As he walked, he became two, walking side by side with a duplicate of himself. Then he became four, then eight, sixteen, thirty-two. Each laid frost in his wake, turning the fires of the village cold, their light extinguished with each step. They broke ranks, dozens of Soans moving through the burning paths of the village, drawing cold darkness behind them. Occasionally one of their number would happen upon an Assessia and beckon him to follow. Twice different Soans of their number came upon Codexia, all of whom were astonished to see him, but followed as well. Slowly the members of the quorums were being drawn into the center of what remained of the village— it was only a matter of minutes before one of them encountered the Inquisitor who was leading the raid. Dracus, what is it? The warrior stood looking down the beach, and then along the line of the still-burning homes near the water's edge. They've stopped. They're moving back into the village. We've beaten them? The dwarf said doubtfully. No, they never give up. Dracus said as he considered. But Jukong used to say if the gods are offering you a gift in the middle of a battle, you take it. Everyone, fall back to the boats. It's time to leave. Who here has countermanded my orders? Screamed the Inquisitor as he strode into the small village square, still burning brightly in places around what had once been a green, but was now trampled and utterly spoiled. Around the square... Ten red-robed Iblisi stood silently watching and listening. The rebel Dracus is known to be harbored here. The village and everyone in it is an offense to the imperial will, and by decree its utter destruction is ordained. Who ordered this withdrawal? Who ordered you here? I did. A voice answered from atop the stairs that once led to the now-burned-out lodge. 
The Inquisitor looked up, and then, through a tight smile, drew out the name as he spoke, as though tasting blood in each syllable. Soen. Yes. Soen replied as he carefully descended the steps, his hood drawn back, his black eyes shining in the light of the fires. I thought perhaps you and I should talk this out before you carelessly murder anyone else on your little crusade, Jukung. It is Jukung, isn't it? It is, Jukung replied, pulling back his own hood. The burn-scarred tissue drew his lips back hideously from his teeth, and one of his eyes had gone a flat gray. Sorry, I've no more time for you. That always was your problem, Soen continued, pushing past the robe de Blisi around the square. Always in such a hurry, always wanting to smash things and get it over with so you could move one more step higher in the eyes of the keeper. And your problem, Jukung sneered, was always one of insufferable arrogance. Some of us, however, prefer action over talk. Jukung raised his hand. The robed elves around the square lowered their mate staves, leveling them directly at Soen. Wait! There's something you need. Goodbye, Soen. I'll convey your regrets to Keeper Chadre. But you don't know. Jukung dropped his hand. Instantly, the mate staves of all ten of the surrounding Iblisi flashed rods of incredible blue, pulsing as they converged directly on the Inquisitor. Soen raised his own staff, but too late. He was engulfed by the power of the magic. His flesh turned to ash on his bones. His black eyes ran momentarily as a black liquid down his crumbling cheeks. What once had been Soen, inquisitor of the keeper and envoy to the imperial courts, collapsed into an unrecognizable pile of ash and bones smoldering in the center of Nothri's village square. Jukung grinned as he swaggered back to the center of the square. Ah, <laughs> How sad that you had to come to such an end, Soen, but take comfort that I have taken your place, and that it was I who taught you the last lesson of all. He reached down to pick up the skull of his vanquished rival, and his hand passed through it. What? Jukung's own skull was suddenly pulled backward, pain overwhelming him as a blade slid across his exposed neck, cutting deeply across his windpipe and vocal cords. He gasped reflexively for breath, but his lungs were filling quickly with his own blood. A voice spoke into his ear. This is your final lesson, Soen said as he kicked away the Inquisitor's mate stick while still holding him from behind. Sometimes the old ways are the best ways. Just be grateful that I am in a hurry, Jukung. You'll die quickly. I had wanted to let you bleed to death slowly, but I just haven't got the time for such amusements. Gasping, Jukung glanced at the surrounding Iblisi. All of them were pushing back their hoods. Each of them was the image of Soen. They're all away, Urulani shouted. Now it's our turn. Are we ready, Master Gonja? Aye, uh, Captain, the tall Sundao warrior called back from the prow. Anchors all in. Six men over the bow, Urulani called. Everyone else aft. All ready, Master Gonja. Now. I uh, put your shoulders into it, men of Sundao, Gonja shouted. Three men on each side of the bow pushed back and up, raising the prow from the sand. Push for your lives, men of Sonda! Ganja shouted. The bow shifted, and the ship rolled slightly. Suna would be better, Master Ganja! Urulani called. Aye, Captain! Push! Push! With agonizing slowness, the shore reluctantly relinquished its grip on the hull. In moments, she was drifting slowly away from shore. Board those men at once, Master Ganja! Urulani called out, then stepped quickly to the tiller. Everyone to your duty, quickly! The six Sondao who were standing waist-deep in the water by the drifting bow were quickly hauled aboard. 
Osman! Urulani called. Out with the sweeps! The Sundao men pushed the oars out the ports on both sides of the ship. Wait! came the shout from the beach. Dracus, standing with Mala and Jugar on the afterdeck, looked up sharply at the sound. Pelag? It is! Urulani waits! There's someone on the beach! Oars down! the captain cried. The manticore was running down the beach, holding something in his hands. The lyric. Please, Drinka said to Urulani. We can't leave them here. The Iblisi could return at any moment, Drakus. I can't. They are my people, Drakus said. Urulani peered into him as though she were trying to look into his soul. He matched her stare for stare until she turned away. Osman! Hold! Muster Ganja, get those two aboard at once! Speed won over Grace. Both the lyric and the now-soaked manticore were hauled over the side as though they were the catch of the day and dropped unceremoniously onto the foredeck. Now, if there is nothing else... Urulani snapped at Dracus. Let's leave, he said. Aft! Pull! The dark woman shouted, and the Sundao raiders responded at once. The Sidron surged backward so quickly that Dracus nearly lost his footing on the deck. The ship glided backward into the deeper waters of the bay. Port aft! Starboard four! Pull! Urulani called from the tiller, and the oarsmen responded, turning the great ship around its center. Pull! The captain called again, and the prow of the ship had nearly swung to point at the harbor passage. All together! Four! Pull! Urulani called, and this time the Sondao men responded with their full strength, all pulling back on their oars at once. The ship fairly leaped forward now, her sleek prow cutting smoothly through the night waters of the bay. Drakus and Mala leaned against the aft gunnels near where Urulani stood at the tiller. His arm was around her as they watched the village, and so much more. Burn. Neither of them spoke. Mala shuddered under Dracus's protecting arm, but could not bring herself to look away. A single tear carved a furrow down Dracus's soot-darkened cheek. There's someone else on the beach, Jugar said quietly to Dracus as he pointed. And not a passenger, I'll wager. Dracus looked up and saw a single robed figure silhouetted against the fires run down to the edge of the beach and stop. He could not be certain but there was something familiar in his stance, as though they had met somewhere before, but it was far too dark and too far for him to be certain. One thing Dracus was certain about was that the figure was one of the Iblisi, and that they too were hunting him because of this nonsense about a legend. They had murdered a city of the Hakaaran, and had they been able, would have murdered all the Sondao as well. They had taken from him the one place he had ever hoped for happiness. Shorten the sweeps! Urulani shouted from the helm. The twenty Sondao men at the oars complied at once, pulling the oars halfway inboard on both sides. The Sidron slid out between the harbor pillars, the last of the Sondao ships to leave. Within moments, the twisting passage obscured their view of the beach and snuffed out Dracus's hope once more. We've the wide Theta Sea before us, Urulani said to Dracus. The ships of North Three will go west along the Forgotten Coast and gather at an anchorage about ten leagues to the west of here. But I'll tell you, Master Legend Man, I've got a provision ship and a good crew, little stomach for you and what you brought down on my people, and the deep desire to hurt something. What do you suppose I should do? Dracus looked up at her. I know exactly what you should do. How far will the ship travel? As far as I take her, Urulani replied. Beyond Nordesia, beyond the Straits of Erebus. Jugar looked up in surprise. Why? Urulani asked. Because beyond the Straits is the land of this prophecy. Dracus replied. So now you are the legendary hero? Urulani scoffed. Please, he sneered. Of course not. Not that anyone will believe me. We're going to go there, beyond the northern ocean, into the lands of these myths. 
We're going to see this place for ourselves, and I'm going to prove once and for all that I am not this legend that everyone wants to believe that I am. What are you saying, boy? Jugar asked. You like to prove that I'm a fraud. Dracus continued talking to Urulani. And I want you to prove it. Because until you do, people are going to keep dying for a dream that doesn't exist. Urulani thought for a moment. Well, Dracus asked. Urulani smiled. Prove you a fraud. That would be worth the trip. For both of us, Dracus replied. Then we go north. Book Four The Sirens Chapter 46 Do Dwarves Float? Urulani set two of the Sidron's three sails after clearing the passage and set her course north from Sanctuary Bay toward Pilot Island, a nasty piece of rock that jutted up from the Thetis Sea. The island offered nothing beyond a place for the merfolk of the deep ocean to occasionally sun themselves, and a point of navigation for the Sundao Corsairs. By the light of the stars, Urulani caught sight of its southern shore sometime after the midpoint of the night, took her bearings, and after putting the ship on a more western course, turned the tiller over to Ganja. Then she found a spot on the deck on which to sleep. Watch by watch, the Sidron held its course across the Thetis Sea. The winds were not entirely in their favor, coming at them from three points off the port bow, so their progress was slower than the captain might have liked. It took another full day and night before the dark profile of Point Contantine came into view off their port bow as the morning rays were spreading across the sea. Beyond the point was the open Charos Ocean, a vastness that had yet to be tamed. Urulani chose not to make landfall at the point. She would only say that they would not be welcomed there, and that some things in the world were best left undisturbed, then turned their tack more north by northwest, laying on more sail. Now the quartering wind was to their advantage. The Sidron heeled over slightly and cut through the waves with vigorous speed. The sunlight was just failing by the time the ship eased toward the gentle slope of Cape Cauldron and made anchor in a small protected harbor. It had been a journey of just over one hundred and eighty leagues, and to Urulani, it seemed that the dwarf had talked the entire way. "'Where's the manticore?' Dracus asked as he pulled himself up on the deck. "'I thought he was down below.' "'Aye, my boy, and I can certainly understand why you would have thought to look there first. the dwarf said, beaming his wide-toothed smile. He sat on the afterdeck, its planks sloping forward gently toward the galley benches just forward, a piece of driftwood in his hands. A small pile of shavings was growing next to his crossed legs as he carved the wood with a thick-bladed knife. Indeed, our friend Belog does not seem to have taken to this travel by sea as so many of the rest of us have. Captain Urulani has expressed her concern for him on a number of occasions, and I have personally assured her that manticores are perfectly capable of sea travel. There are many stories, both ancient and in times nearer our own, in which seagoing manticores have figured prominently and acted most bravely. This does not seem to apply to friend Belog, however, who was most anxious to get off of this barge, as he put it, and feel the ground under his feet for a while. Dracus was only half listening to what the dwarf was saying. He stood with a wide stance on the deck and looked about. So where is Mala? There you have the collision of both stories, for she went ashore as well. Jugar continued. I believe the captain called it provisioning, and she seemed most anxious to do so regarding water stores. Uh, apparently the next leg of our trip is a rather lengthy one, more than a week at sea, or longer still, even should the winds prove themselves favorable. Belog won't care much for that, Dracus laughed. So why didn't you and the Lyric go ashore as well? So I did earlier, but in truth I found it rather dull. The dwarf shrugged. "'shaving another curling piece from the driftwood. 
I attempted to enliven the conversation with the captain by regaling her with stories of famous shipwrecks, trying, uh, in the interest of better relations, to build some sort of rapport with her, but she did not seem to appreciate the subject matter as much as I had hoped. Is he still talking? Urulani was pulling herself up over the side of the ship. The water shone on her dark skin, pooling at her feet on the deck. Dracus found himself staring at her muscular figure as she pushed the water out of her hair. By the ancients, how do you ever get him to stop? I don't, but I'm open to suggestions. Well, do dwarves float? We could find out, Dracus agreed. Now, both of you, just stop that kind of talk right now, Jugar said, his face becoming red at once as he pointed the tip of his broad knife at them in turns. That is a poor jest at my expense, especially as I am an important and critical member of this expedition, whose knowledge will be invaluable in the days ahead, threatening me with a watery grave. It would appear, Dracus commented to Urulani, the dwarves are not entirely fond of bathing which is easily discerned if one remains upwind of a dwarf, Urulani added. Why, I I'll have you both know that dwarves consider their hygiene to be of the highest personal priority in all levels of their society, the dwarf sputtered. I never doubted it, Dracus said, bowing slightly. You'll be granting me a far greater measure of respect once we reach the desolation of the north, Jugar said wagging his wide fingers at the two humans. There, at the end of the River of Tears, in the far reaches of the Sand Sea, we'll find the God's Wall, from which mountain peaks the dragons issue their mournful call. And who will interpret the ancient words for you then, eh? The power of the ancient magic of the Aetherasian dragon warriors rivaled that of Ronas itself— and who will protect you from the ravages of its pent-up forces if it isn't this humble fool of a dwarf, eh? Humble fool of a dwarf, Dracus said, looking down his nose with suspicion. I've been meaning to ask you about that ever since Nothri. This humble fool of a dwarf was spinning some rather impressive magics of his own that night. Oh, well, <laughs> not really as impressive as it seemed at the time. Jugar said at once, his countenance shifting with remarkable swiftness from belligerent to shy. It really was mostly the heart of air that was impressive. I just used it to conjure a little trick or two. A little trick or two, Dracus said, his words slower and with more consideration. You bested not one, but four, or possibly five Iblisi with those little tricks. It's most kind of you to say so, but in all fairness, it was only with your most able and impressive aid that such a feat was accomplished. The dwarf said, smiling once more. Dracus was not convinced. You're a wizard, Juga. When were you going to tell us? It was a terrible battle indeed, my boy. Uh, but at least we are read of the Chimerian Ethis. Juga continued as though he had not heard the man. I dare say that each of us sleeps better at night knowing that he has gone on his way. I do not say that I wish the fellow harm. Never let it be said that Jugar would be so cruel. But there was something about him that I did not trust. True, it is most likely that he is a fallen comrade lying scorched and broken among the ruins of Nothri. But tragic as such an end may be, it has brought to us this fine ship and furthered us on our very honorable journey in search of your destiny. Urulani just shook her head. Unbelievable. How does he do that? Listen to me, dwarf, Dracus said, squatting down on the deck before Jugar, but the dwarf continued to look down at the wood he was working in his hands. You've been making me out to be this legendary hero to everyone we've met since the fall of House Timuron. It kept Belog sane when he might have fallen into madness, and I'm glad for that. It even managed to somehow bluff us through the fairy kingdom, although I find it hard to believe that Queen Murialis didn't see through the lie from the first. It got us fed on the Vestasian savannah, and it seemed just like a convenient little lie then. The dwarf continued to look at his hands as they worked the wood. But now people are dying. 
Dracus continued. The city of the Haka'aran is filled with the dead, and Ru'ukag with them because of that lie. All of Nothri was burned to the ground, and who knows how many of the family and friends of this crew may be dead for all we know. Certainly all of them now homeless because of that lie. It's not a lie, Jugar huffed. I am not the man, Dracus said each word with emphasis. You could be, Jugar shouted. Dracus stood up. How do you know? The dwarf continued as he too stood, turning his face up so that their eyes could meet. You've lived your entire life so far, as you recall, under the thumb of your pathetic elven masters. Masters, they call themselves. They stomp about the world, taking what they want, bleeding the world pale just to satisfy their whims while the rest of us die for them. They destroyed your people, Dracus. They hated humanity so much that they killed as many as they could and enslaved those that remained, not because you were such prized slaves or warriors, but because they wanted every day, every day, Dracus, to see the evidence in the flesh of their superiority over conquered humankind. When the dwarves wouldn't bow to them, they destroyed them too. Oh, yes, they took them apart throne by throne until only the ninth throne stood— and even then they would not bow to the imperial whim. They paid for it with their last blood. But you, the dwarf said, taking a step toward Dracus, you can change all that. One man alone is worthless. But a legend? A legend can forge a new destiny, Dracus. A legend can change the world. You, me, we're nothing. Lumps of flesh who just wander the world for a few years before we return to the ground that spawned us. But a legend lives forever, boy. A legend has a destiny beyond the life of anyone. I've seen the fruits of this legend you're so pleased about, Dracus said in a voice that barely carried across the deck. So far it has motivated hundreds. Maybe upward of a thousand very inspired deaths. You're missing the grander picture, my boy, the dwarf replied, not unkindly. Nonsense, Urulani interjected. I'd say he's got a rather clear understanding of the situation. This from a corsair, a woman whose people subsist on the scraps they can steal from their neighbors while they hide in coves along a coast that no one wants. Jugar suddenly changed his gruff tone after the look on the captain's face conveyed her sudden desire to test her dwarf-floating hypothesis. My apologies, good captain. It was an ill-advised phrase that I used in the heat of the argument. I should have suggested, and indeed do suggest, that the perspective of the Sondau clan should be broadened beyond their pressing and immediate concerns. Ronas is at war with the entire world— and has brought it to heel. The dwarf turned back to Dracus. The one thing that survived the fall of humanity was this legend, this tale of the great dragon warrior who turned his back on the world and would return again to save it in its hour of most desperate need. The hope of this redemption, this story of justice to come— has found its way in one form or other into every nation and race, from the Charos beaches of Mestophia to the breaking waves of Chenandria's Lyrex shores. They all look to the north and wait for the legend to fulfill his destiny and bring peace to their lives. The sands have fallen again and again through the glass of time. Our need has grown more desperate with each passing year, and still... He has not come. But now you're here, Dracus. The dwarf poked the human with the tip of his knife. Mortals do not get to choose their fates. Their fates choose them. You're going to be the Dracus. That's your fate. Dracus gazed down at the dwarf and shook his head. When we get to these God's Wall peaks you keep talking about, 
Then we'll find out whether I choose my fate or it chooses me. There is only one way to be absolutely sure. Indeed? the dwarf asked. Yes. The same way one can be absolutely sure as to whether a dwarf floats or not. Chapter 47 One Among Us Mala watched Cape Cauldron fall astern as the Sidron sailed northwest from the anchorage, her eyes never leaving the coast until it vanished at last below the horizon under a brightening morning sky. As the sun crossed the tops of the masts, shore again was sighted to the east, this time the west wall cliffs rising through the haze on the eastern horizon. This, Urulani informed Dracus, was the farthest western end of Nordesia. Their conversation was somewhat disjointed, however, as Jugar was constantly interrupting with some prattle about the giants that lived in the west wall cliffs and who occasionally waded out into the ocean to capture and play with boats that passed too close to the shore. Urulani scoffed at the child's tale as she stood at the tiller, but Dracus quietly noted to himself that she nevertheless kept the ship far from those shores. It was perhaps two hours later that Urulani pushed the tiller over slightly, and the ship's bow responded, changing their course perpendicular to the falling sun. They were heading truly north now. The Straits of Erebus lay far to the east, that body of water that separated the Lyranian and Dracusian continents. Their course, however, would take them directly north across the eastern expanse of the Charos Ocean, as that was the course the song in Dracus's head seemed to dictate to him. There was nothing now between them and the sirens that called to Dracus but the open sea. Dracus stood on the afterdeck of the Sidron, his hand on the tiller as he watched the bow, and more importantly, the stars beyond. From where he stood he could see the length of the middeck below him. The oars, sweeps, he corrected himself, were pulled in and stored beneath the galley benches. The night had been a clear one, and remarkably warm with the trade wind blowing from the southeast off of Nordesia. Urulani had instructed the crew to strike the canvas that they had spread days earlier like a tent over the mid-deck. There was a lower deck to the Sidron where the crew could bunk among the stores, and where poor Belog had elected to spend most of the voyage, miserable in his seasickness. But tonight most of the crew elected to sleep on the deck, beneath the gentle breeze and the great dome of the star-filled night sky. He could see them as shadowy figures on either side of the elevated decking that ran the length of the ship, between the port and starboard ranks of galley benches, and around the masts, ending at the forecastle deck at the bow. Come to the shores of the sorrowful. Come to the northerly lands. Come on the ocean. Come with devotion. Dracus was fancying himself something of a corsair. There was something about the water, its freedom, and the motion of the ship beneath his feet that called to him like the song that still ran through his head. The seas were relatively calm this night, and the breezes generally favorable as they made their way northward. Urulani had instructed him on how to man the tiller and steer a course directly north by keeping the bow directed toward a particular place about which all the heavens overhead revolved. She kept a critical eye on him for some time, and then, at last satisfied that he would not be a danger to the ship or her crew, she sat with her back against the aft bulwark, folded her arms, and drifted off to sleep. One is the guardian of our hope. One is the poison we drink. Pity the last one. Keep the course true on. Since leaving the West Wall Cliffs five days before, everyone aboard had settled into a comfortable routine, and being in such confined quarters, got to know each other quickly. Ganja, the ship's master, was next in command on board, a tall and powerfully built man of Sondau, who kept his tightly curled hair cut close to his scalp. Dracus knew that the man was deeply distrustful of both him and his companions, but he also sensed that he was unswervingly devoted to his captain. He often would take a watch at the tiller, as did Kendai and Dakran, the two sailing loremasters aboard. Then there were the eight men on each side who manned the oars whenever Urulani found the wind not to her perfect liking, 
and tended to other duties aboard when the sails were full. Yithri, Quare, Gantau, Jorno the Giant, Zinbar, Lucrasse, whom all the rest kidded about his diminutive height, and whom Jugar had taken to defending. Dracus was coming to know them all as they worked shoulder to shoulder on the ship. He looked down at Mala, who lay on a bedroll he had prepared for her, curled tightly under a blanket, her back turned against the breeze. Her hair had completely covered the tattoo atop her head that had branded her, and branded Dracus and so many of his companions as slaves of the House of Timuron. Now her auburn hair fluttered slightly in the night breeze, and he realized how beautiful it had become to him, more beautiful with each passing wave of the ocean below. Nightmares and dreams are for dark of night. Sometimes we sleep while awake. Tears for our sorrow. Weep for the morrow. Perhaps, he reflected, that was what he liked about the Corsair ship, that here on the open waters he was far from the cares of the Ronos or the fear of being brought into bondage. He had tasted the free air of the sea, and felt the ship beneath his feet go wherever his mind willed his hands to take her. This was what a man was meant to be, to master his fate, to be his own. Dracus froze. A tall, robed figure stood silhouetted at the bow. Its face was in darkness, but its form was all too familiar to him. And the magical Mate staff, its headpiece glowing a painful blue, was unmistakable. Alarm! Dracus screamed, letting go of the tiller at once and charging down the central decking as he reached for his sword. Alarm! 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 He could hear the crew around him struggling up from the depths of their sleep. The deck beneath his feet rocked with the motion of the Sondau warriors clambering to get their feet under them. Their shouts grew, and the sound of their weapons being gathered filled the air. Hold, Dracus of Timuron! The figure shouted at him as the glowing head of the staff shifted. Dracus realized there were two figures on the forecastle. The lyric. The lithe woman stood quivering in front of the Iblisi, her back turned toward him and his left hand on her throat. The blue glow of the Mate staff cast shadows across her frightened face. Dracus came to a stuttering halt, his feet sliding awkwardly across the planking. The Sondau warriors hesitated as well, looking aft toward their captain. Dracus glanced back as well and saw Urulani, now standing silently on the afterdeck, with Mala at her side. Well, you should pause to consider, Corsair, the Iblisi called down the length of the ship. One poor decision on my part could tear this ship from stem to stern, and I know that it is too far from land to swim, even for the much-storied Sondau. Jugar struggled up from the blow decks, his axe in hand. Where's the fight? That's what we're about to find out, Dracus said quietly. Urulani stood so still that Dracus could not tell if she were breathing. What do you want? What I have always wanted, the Iblisi snapped, his voice cracking. What I have crossed continents and oceans to achieve. What has caused death and destruction everywhere in its wake. I want to speak with the slave Dracus. Urulani raised her hand. The Sondau drew back slightly. You've come a long way to speak with a slave, friend. Who are you? Mala quickly made her way down the central deck to where Dracus stood. He tried to reassure her with a thin smile as she came to his side. Come far. I have come too far, the Iblisi stated in contemptuous tones. And my name is Soen. Just Soen. What do you want, Soen? You, Dracus. Soen replied from the folds of his hood. You and your bolters have eluded me far better than any have before. I will grant you that. But I have found you at last. Found us? You didn't find us at all! Jugar shouted. You were led to us, you lying bastard elf! You would never have discovered us without traitorous assistance! 
there is no shame in accepting help, especially if the help is so very willing. The Iblisi said casually as he released the lyric, letting her fall with a heavy sound to the deck at his feet. I'll admit that I was nearly lost when you left no three without me, until I discovered this. Soen reached his right arm inside his cloak and pulled out what appeared to be a small ball of mud about the size of a pea. It is a beacon stone, a magical object that calls me to it, dropped by one of your closest companions along the way, so that I would not be left behind on your journey. This particular one was the most useful to me, because, to my surprise, I found it at Cape Cauldron. That's what led me to you here, and the end of your run, Bolters. It's time to come home. Dracus gripped his sword and glanced around him, miles from shore, and only the boat beneath their feet. Peace, friend, so said in even tones. Peace is not what I have in mind, Dracus said, his breath coming quicker. Peace, friend, so repeated. What? Dracus did not understand what the elf meant. Next to him, Mala took her arms from around his waist and started walking toward the Iblisi. Mala, no, stand back, Dracus cried. Please, Mala said in a quivering voice. Please, take me. Please take me home. The lyric looked up in astonishment at Mala from where she lay on the forecastle. Mala! Dracus called, tears blurring his vision. No! Come here! Please, take me home! Mala's voice grew stronger with every step, her hands reaching out towards Soen. I've done everything you asked. I've gone with them and followed them and been with them. I've eaten with them. Slept with them, smiled at them. I've done all that the demons have spoken from the dark dreams. I looked for you, longed for you to come. No! Draco screamed as he rushed forward, grabbing Mala by the arm. You can't! Everything we have together! Everything that we were... Pretend! Mala shrieked, tearing her arm away from him. You said it was pretend! And the demons said it, too. They said you lied and made me remember, and as long as I remember, they'll tear at me in the night. But I won't let them. She turned and ran forward, throwing herself at the elven inquisitor's feet. You won't let them. You'll take me back home and free me from the demons just like before. You'll send them back to the forgotten places. I did everything they said I should do, and now you've come for me. You've come to take me back. Soen gazed down at her with his black, lifeless eyes. You promised! Mala screamed. I gave them to you. I dropped the stones just as the demon said I should. I slowed them down. I was clever. Soen looked up at Dracus. The human had fallen to his knees on the deck, quaking in his agony. Mala turned too. You promised to keep me away from him most of all! The demons are nothing next to his pain. He loved me. He hurt me. I want him. I hate him. Her voice dropped to a whimper. Please, take me home. I cannot live with what he feels. I cannot live with what I feel. I want to never know that pain again. I want to forget. She began to sob. Please take me home. Mala, so and said in a soft, warm voice, you have indeed done everything that you were meant to do. I am sorry, but the demons must stay with you. Mala looked up into the Inquisitor's face, her shoulders shaking as she spoke. But, Master, you've come for me. You, 
You've come to take me home? No, Mala. Soen replied, I cannot do that. Why? Because I am not the Inquisitor whom you serve. The elf replied, I am not Soen. The robes began to shift as the Mate staff fell heavily to the deck. The black elven eyes contorted, and the flesh around them shifted. The robes collapsed into smoother forms. Two arms became four, as the expressionless and all-too-familiar face looked up. I am sorry, Dracus, Ethis said from the forecastle, where Mala lay quivering at his feet. There was no other way. Chapter 48 Chimera Ethis! Jugar sputtered. You! I have seen a number of feats of legerdemain in my time, but how is it that you have thus magically appeared on this ship? In a moment, friend Jugar, Ethis said, looking toward the afterdeck. Captain Urulani, may I suggest that a few of your crew take charge of this human woman? I believe she is now beyond doing us any further harm, but her actions, I believe, warrant some prudent caution. Urulani broke from her astonishment and nodded. I agree. Zinba and Gantau, go forward and take charge of her. Bind the woman hand and foot, but I don't think a gag is necessary. Make her comfortable, but I want her secure. Aye, Captain. They responded and moved forward. Zinbar picking up a coil of rope stowed next to the mainmast. Urulani raised an eyebrow as she spoke to the Chimerian. Anything else? Ethis bowed slightly. It's your ship, Captain. And I'd like to see that it remains my ship, the Captain replied. Is there anything else you would like to tell me? Only that my name is Ethis. That I am, as you plainly see, a Chimerian shapeshifter, and that I serve you aboard this ship. That's all. Oh, and that you'll find that there is no longer a seasick manticore in your hold. Which is because, Urulani urged, because, because I was that seasick manticore. Aha! The dwarf crowed. That's how you got aboard! and how I've been aboard since we made our hasty retreat from Northry. Ethis replied, taking a step down the deck, then turning back to the dwarf. Oh, here is something I need to return to you. The Chimerian reached into folds in his flesh that had been smoothed over moments before, and pulled out a shining black-faceted stone. The dwarf's eyes went wide as his hands instinctively patted down his waistcoat and discovered it empty. The heart of air! Dad, how did you— I am a creature of many talents, the Chimerian replied. Besides, I could hardly have a real wizard conjuring up spells against a fake one, could I? The dwarf frowned, holding out his open palm. Ethis shrugged and set the stone carefully in Jugar's hand. I am just a poor fool of a dwarf, but it occurs to me that the shape-shifting talents of the common Chimerian do not include the ability to mimic clothing, and even hair down to a degree of complexity that would pass even a cursory examination. Jugar's eyes narrowed, but there remained a brightness to them as he spoke. Such capabilities are rare indeed, and often put to rather specialized use in behalf of the Chimerian state interests. Such dangerous creatures have been rumored to be abroad in the land. You wouldn't happen to be one of them, would you now, Ethis? And you are, friend Jugar, no more than a common dwarven fool? The Chimerian's face remained as blank and inscrutable as ever, but he leaned forward as he continued. Just as a pure matter of speculation, it would be an interesting contest, though from what I have heard of such beings, it would be better not to know them. You of all creatures should recognize the advantage of anonymity. 
However, should any such creatures be made known to me, I should be glad to direct you to them. The dwarf, for once, held his silence. Dracus was vaguely aware of Ethis as the Chimerian turned and stepped carefully over to where he remains kneeling. His head hung down, his chin nearly resting on his chest. His mouth hung slackly open, and his eyes were closed. Dracus was still aware that he held his sword loosely in his hand, his shoulders rising and falling with his quick breaths. But the rest of the world seemed so far away, and the sound so muffled. Ethis knelt down in front of the human. Dracus. He continued to breathe raggedly, the sound of his breath roaring in his ears. Ethis was saying something to him. Dracus, I'm sorry. Ethis continued. It was the only way I could have convinced you. The human opened his eyes slowly. His head still hung down to his chest. You would not have believed me. Ethis continued. You haven't really trusted me since that day we awoke in House Timuron. Your suspicions were only strengthened in the Fairy Kingdom. You thought I had betrayed you there. But in truth, it was the only way to save you, to save us all. The Iblisi were closing in on us. Murialis was our only chance. But I had to prove to her that all of us were who we claimed to be. She trusted me to find that out. You did. Dracus said, his voice rough from deep in his throat. His words sounded disconnected, as though he were talking through a dream. Yes, Ethis continued. Dracus could feel himself being drawn out through the Chimerian's words, being coaxed to come back to the realm of consciousness and pain. We had met many years before when— Well, it doesn't matter when. And I knew that she could help you. Dracus's eyes shifted upward and peered at Ethis from under his brows. So, you were only helping me? Yes, Dracus, Ethis urged. I had suspected Mala ever since my interrogations in the Fairy Kingdom, but it was not until the dwarf discovered the beacon stones on the savannah that I knew with certainty. The Iblisi were closing in on us. I had to act. For my own. Good. Dracus found the words distasteful as he spoke them. For your own good. Ethis nodded. I waited for an opportunity. Then, when we reached No. 3, the day she was bathing at the pool. Dracus shuddered violently, closing his eyes again, but Ethis' words kept coming at him. I took some of her beacon stones from the hem of her gown. I went back through the pass to a crossroads on the fringes of the savannah and used the stones to call him. I suspected the Inquisitor did not actually know which of us was helping him. I changed form and appeared to him as Ru'ukag. He never suspected me. I told him the stones had been compromised by the dwarf, and he gave me an entirely new set of stones. Now that same Inquisitor Soen is chasing the wrong stones instead of us. Who's dropping these wrong stones, then, and drawing what will soon be a very angry Iblisi after them? Belog, Ethis said. I told him to lead him east, back toward the Jekaaren. And he did this for my own good, Dracus said through clenched teeth. Yes, Ethis nodded. Everything we've done has been for your own good. Dracus's grip on his sword tightened as he sprang toward Ethis with a terrible yell that started from the darkness of his soul and rushed from his mouth with animal ferocity. He pressed his left forearm against the Chimerian's throat, his weight and momentum pushing Ethis back against the mainmast. His body pinned the lighter Chimerian, the edge of the blade suddenly biting at Ethis's throat. Dracus's crazed face was within inches of the Chimerian's own face. For my own good! Everyone seems to be working for my own good! House Timuron fell for my own good! And it brought me memories that are still too painful for me to even think about! It stole my life from me! 
You took us into the fairy kingdom for my own good, and because Murialis would either be entertained by us or kill us, you cheated me out of my deepest thoughts, hopes, and fears. Ru'ukog! Ru'ukog died for my own good, and the gods only know how many others. And now you... You show me this! You take away from me the one thing I ever wanted! The one really honest, good thing I ever asked for myself! You tear out my soul, and you have the gall to tell me it's for my own good! Dracus, my boy, Jugar said in a careful voice. It's truly a calamitous situation, deplorable and tragic. But a little calm reflection and distance might— And you! Dracus wheeled on the dwarf. You started this all! You and your talk of legends and humanity's lost greatness. You packaged it and sold it to everyone we've met along the way. But it was all a lie! You don't know that, lad, Jugar said, holding his hands up. Those stories that I told are true. It's not me! Dracus wailed at the dwarf. He turned back to Ethis, his sword cutting across the Chimerian's skin just below his jaw. What did you do to her? How did you make her lie like that? It's not him, lad, the dwarf said. You then? Dracus said his wild eyes fixed on the dwarf as he turned. No, my boy, Jugar said, with as much calm as he could muster in the face of the crazed Dracus. The elves, they did this to her. Dracus stood on the deck, glaring at the dwarf. He was vaguely aware of the rest of the crew watching him, of the damning concern in their eyes, and of their pity. He hated them for that, too. She's, she's what they call a sanar, a beacon. Jugar continued, his eyes fixed on Dracus as he spoke. It's an old-fashioned custom that was the tradition in elven households for nearly a century. May Nexog damn them forever for it. The Ronas elves would take one of their household slaves and train them to be a sanar. But this wasn't training as you know it, my boy. They would take them when they were youths, just in their beards, as we say among the dwarves, both male and female, and afflict them with such terrible horrors, tortures, lad, of mind and body, until they had burned those trained scars into their minds, seared them so deeply that they would never be free of the orders they were given. Then they deviously buried the memory of this training under the devotion spell, so that the slaves themselves would not be aware of it. They were trained to betray their own kind, to run away with any slaves who might somehow break the bonds of their devotions, just as we did, lad, and lead the Iblisi to them. They did that, Dracus said, his eyes shifting to where Mala lay bound on the foxhole. What did they do to her? It wasn't magic, Jugar said quietly. It was not some spell that could be released and make her right. It was her mind they broke, as they did with every other Sanar. Then in a cruel blessing they gave them their devotions in the households and allowed them to forget all the carefully, torturously impressed commands that they had burned into their minds, leaving them buried there against the unlikely day when the devotions would fail and their precious slaves would escape. Dracus dropped his sword, barely aware of it clattering on the deck at his feet. Then she didn't choose this. They made her do it. They... they broke her. I... Jugar nodded. Intentionally, but I... they broke her. It is a difficult and costly proposition... Most of the lesser houses of the Empire no longer go to the expense of what has become such a luxury. But Timuron was just proud enough and just vain enough to want to own a traitor to her own kind. Dracus walked slowly up to the foxel. The two Sondar warriors stood on either side of Mala, 
who looked pathetically small where she lay on the deck between them. Dracus reached down slowly, pushing back the hair that had fallen over her face. She looked up at him with the eyes that he had long remembered with such depth of feeling, though now they were unfocused, and seemed to dart about, unable to fix on any one thing. Take me home, she said to no one in particular. Please take me home. Dracus stood up and drew in a long, shuddering breath. If you like, Ethis said quietly behind him, I can take care of this for you. Dracus turned. What did you say? This needs to be taken care of. Ethis said with a little more emphasis. She's a sanar, Dracus. She'll do whatever she can to lead the Iblisi to us. She's Marla, Dracus said, shaking his head. No, she's not, Jugar said. She has betrayed us, and beyond doubt she will betray us again. No, Dracus insisted. She doesn't want to be this. It isn't a question of what she wants, Ethis said with conviction. She has no control over this any more than you can control whether you breathe or not. She is broken, deep within, and she cannot be fixed. No! Draco shouted. She was fine before we began this insane quest, and she'll be fine again. If I find a way to put her back under house devotions, she'll be... What? Your slave? Ethis countered. Is that what you're hoping for? Dracus wheeled on Ethis, slamming his right fist into his face. He felt the bones of the Chimerian's face flex, as was the inherent trait of his kind, and his fist give in to the soft flesh of the face. But the blow did force Ethis back a few paces, and gave Dracus back his focus from the satisfying blow. We sail north! Dracus made the statement as though he dared anyone to contradict him. We find the Siren Coast in this river of tears or whatever it is, and see what there is to this damn legend. Until then, Mala is mine and under my protection. It's my ship, Urulani said. If she stays, then she stays under guard. You too, I see, Dracus replied. Then take me north, O oh great captain. We have a legend to bury. Chapter 49 Voice of Dragons Dracus stood at the tiller that night. He shifted the course of the Sidron five points to starboard and held it there for nearly three days. All Urulani's arguments were brushed aside by him as she held that course, because, he said, the song was calling to him, and this was the course where he heard it the loudest. By the dawn of the second day, the distant shoreline could just be made out on the northern horizon. It took until just before noon for the coast features, such as they were, to become defined. Short, gnarled trees and scrub brush painting a dark line above a bright sand shore. Here and there a tumble of rocks could be seen, but for the most part it was the most unremarkable coast Urulani or any of her crew had ever seen. Dracus leaned hard on the tiller, his red sleepless eyes struggling to peer over the bow. Despite the lack of landmarks, however, he steered the ship with remarkable precision up one of a dozen channels that flowed over a wide sandy delta. The Sidron was made for shallow draft river raiding, and passed smoothly over the delta waters and into the main channel of what Jugar at once proclaimed to be the River of Tears. Only then did Dracus relinquish the tiller to Urulani, and he collapsed on the deck, just as Urulani called for the sweeps to be set and the oarsmen to start pulling. Dracus did not awaken again for another day and a half. How is your head? Urulani asked. Much worse, Dracus replied as he stretched. Where are we? I can report that we are definitely somewhere, she replied, and we are making good time. Wonderful news, Dracus responded, looking around them. 
the river had cut a meandering course, which Urulani was trying to make her ship follow. I see that the river banks are sand. What's beyond? More sand, Urulani replied with a twinkle in her dark eyes. Then I think you are wrong, Dracus said, drawing in a deep breath. We've gone right past somewhere and have definitely reached nowhere. The shores of the sand sea drifted past them for a time, the silence broken only by the rhythmic stroke of the oars to the drum below. How is your mala? Urlani asked. She is. She's doing better, Dracus replied. She has calmed down and is speaking again, but she is still undoubtedly broken. Then why keep her with us? Urulani said to him with surprising softness in her voice. I do not ask you this to be cruel, Dracus. But what kind of life can you have together without trust? She is clearly a danger to you, and perhaps to us all. What kind of a life can she have beyond the forgetful lie that the elves offer to all their slaves? You make sense, Urulani, Dracus responded. In fact, all of you make sense. Even Ethis is starting to make sense to me. I cannot explain it, but I feel responsible for her. You did not break her, Dracus, the captain said. It is not your fault that she is how she is. Yes, I know, he said, gazing out over the bow. But I made promises to her when she was whole when I thought she was mine. And now that she is no longer whole, I feel that those promises should still mean something. Maybe it wasn't real for her, but it was for me, or at least as real as I believe anything to be anymore. So, are you this Dracus they all want you to be? Urulani asked through a smile. You really want to know? Yes then I'll really tell you. I don't know. That's no answer, Urlani scoffed. That's all the answer I've got, Dracus said, reaching up for one of the backstays and leaning against it. There's only one thing that I'm certain of, and that is that I need to know, one way or the other, if this is my destiny. So much has happened. So many people have sacrificed so much even their lives from time to time. But I have to wonder if all of this has some meaning, some purpose. Belog once told me that he had to believe in me, or his brother's death would have had no meaning. All I'm left with now is that thought and this terrible song in my... Wait. Look ahead. Just around this bend. The bow was swinging around another turn in the river. Urulani's face shifted into a crooked smile. Is that a road? she asked. Ethis! Chuga! Draca shouted. Break out the packs and make sure they're stocked. We're going on a little trip. Master Ganja, you are in charge, Urulani said, checking her pack and closing it. I've got six of the crew with me. The rest are to stay here. There was a groan among those left behind. They would have liked the opportunity to see this new land. Dracus, are you ready? She asked as she shouldered her pack. We're all ready, he replied. Urulani turned to acknowledge him when she was caught up short. You're not serious! The captain had expected Ethis and Jugar to be joining the expedition, but there, too, was a brightly beaming lyric and most surprising of all, Mala, holding her pack and looking down at the deck, seemingly avoiding anyone's eyes. There is no way they are coming with us, she said. There is no way they cannot, Dracus replied. I'm not dragging those women across the sand sea. You're not dragging anyone, Dracus said. Both the Lyric and Mala need to be watched and not out of my sight. You don't trust my crew. Not with Mala, he replied. Fine, 
Urulani shouted. But if she so much as spits in my direction, I'm going to kill her myself. And I promise you, I will not be asking your permission ahead of time. You understand? I understand, Dracus answered. Urulani turned on Mala, jabbing her finger at her collarbone. And do you understand, princess? Yes, Mala answered, not looking up. Well, what a happy crew, Urulani said, though there was nothing happy in her tone at all. Urulani had beached the Sidron on the riverbank, so they jumped from the bow of the boat onto the sands of the shore. Their feet sank down into the warm sands, causing them to struggle slightly until they managed to clamber up onto the remains of the roadway. There was some concern about the dwarf, who panicked for a time in the sands, trying to get his footing, but in the end they managed to pull him onto the path as well. The road of tightly fitted stones was broken in many places, and completely obscured by drifting sand in so many more, that Jugar feared they would lose it altogether. But in time they followed it up, at last cresting the sand dune at the edge of the river's channel. They were greeted with the sight of a chain of towering mountains that seemed to stretch from horizon to horizon, purple-blue in the distance and appearing to waver in the heat of the day. Their peaks were sharp, jagged pinnacles whose crests were still draped in the white of perpetual snow. They looked as though they had been pushed up angrily from below, rising abruptly from the sands at their base in sheer granite crags and towers, the savage teeth of the world. The God's Wall! Jugar cried, and began dancing a strange dwarven step on the ancient stones. How did we miss that? Ethis blurted out. We've been in the river channel, Urulani shrugged. The dunes must have hidden them from us. That doesn't prove anything, dwarf, Dracus said, his eyes narrowing to try to examine the mountains better. He raised his arm and pointed. What are those? What? Urulani asked. There at the base. Those tall shapes at the base of the range. They're too evenly spaced to be natural, and they seem to run down the length of the range. They are my brothers, the lyric said with pride. We are home. The sirens! Jugar crowed. Those are dragons, my boy. The dragons of the prophecy calling to you. Is it, is it possible? Dracus whispered. We came to find out, Ethis said. It must be four, maybe five leagues to the base. We could make it before dark, but we'd have to make camp and return in the morning. You want to make camp with dragons? Urulani asked. Do dwarves float? Dracus asked as he started down the road which ran straight toward the base of the mountains. Dracus stared up at the dragon. The dragon's dead stone eyes stared back at him. Dracus stood on a wide black marble platform. The surface had been pitted and scarred by the blowing sands over time, scuffed to a dull finish. Fixed to it, the great carving of a dragon rose above him, its neck craning downward until its chin also rested on the pedestal. Enormous wings, also of stone, rose high above them nearly one hundred feet into the sky, brightly cast in the red light of the sunset. The front and back claws clutched enormous crystals in their talons that were embedded into the marble base. The crystals looked dark and common, but the dragon carving was intricate and detailed with pictograms of people now long dead and fallen to dust, pursuing great deeds that were now otherwise forgotten. Dracus considered the statue in silence. I... I am sorry, my boy, Jugar said next to him. More sorry than I can say. Dracus started to speak, considered for a moment, and then continued. It's hollow. Can you see it? The head cavity all the way up the neck and into the body is entirely hollow. Yes, lad, Jugar said sadly. Behind him, the rest of their party stood in the sand or sat on the edge of the pedestal. The song of the dragon rose and fell around them, a mournful, hollow sound. 
as far as they could see down both directions of the range, duplicates of this same statue stood on their own pedestals. Each of them in turn was making the same music across the sand sea to the south. The wind, Dracus continued dispassionately, pointing toward the head. It blows here constantly through that hole in the dragon's mouth. I saw a musician once who played an instrument by blowing into it. It looked about the same size as that hole. You know, there must be some mechanism in the head that varies the pitch so that the song can be played over and over and over and over. Come, lad, Jugar said, pulling at Dracus's arm. A little supper, perhaps, and a story or two. There it is, dwarf, Dracus shouted. There's the great destiny of humanity. There are no dragons to save us, just these lovely marble dreams we've created for ourselves. All myths and stories and lies we tell ourselves to comfort us and make us think there is some meaning to what we do. Well, here they are, dwarf. Here are the dragons that I'm supposed to raise from the storybook past and make war with on the elves. Here's the source of the song that calls me back to a dead land filled with dead dragons. Here are your sentinels, the sirens of the desolation, watching over us with stone eyes and weak songs. Please, my boy, Jugar tugged at the human's belt. Enough of this. Enough! Dracus's laugh had a hysterical edge. <laughs> this weak... Windy song? Let's make a decent noise of it. Let's call the whole world up here to see just how hollow this legend of yours is. Dracus turned back to the dragon's head, drew in a deep breath, and blew as hard as he could through the hole. A thunderous blast of sound shook the ground, raising a pall of dust two feet high. Dracus staggered back from the statue, his hands clasped to his ears. Mala stood up her jaw dropping in wonder. The crystals under the statue's talons flared suddenly to life, brilliant light radiating outward, then curving back in on itself, forming a ball on the platform directly beneath the statue. Ethis turned, his eyes widening. All down the range the other statues were answering in kind. Ethis watched as the bases of each, as far as he could see, were being illuminated by crystals as well. Jugar's cheers were entirely engulfed in the sound. The progression of the song began, note after overwhelming note. Nine notes, seven notes, shaping the globe beneath the dragon statue until it flashed once and stabilized. The lyric smiled. Five notes, five notes. Draca staggered back off the platform just as the song concluded its final chords echoing off the sunset-glowing mountain peaks to the north. He took his hands from his ears. The song had stopped. It was gone from his mind. It's a fold! Ethis shouted. The sphere of light beneath the dragon had become a portal. It was ancient, certainly older than any known in Ronas. Beyond it was a land of dense green forests and bright towers in the distance. Mala screamed. Dracus looked up. The peaks of the God's Wall range suddenly began to move. Dracus's legs lost their strength. As far as he could see, from every crag and mountaintop, dragons had awakened and were filling the skies. They answered the call. They were coming for him. Chapter 50 Celebrations The old elven woman had all the credentials of a court adjudicator of the Ministry of Occupation, a wizened post well suited to her age. If anyone looked more closely as she traveled the North March folds, they might discover that she bore the name of Liu Si Feng, third court adjudicator of the Arikasi Chien Soi Prefecture, and a sight maiden of the Paktan Order. Liu would tell you that she was a devout follower of Kiris, the elven goddess of light and dark, and that her mission on behalf of her master Arikasi 
dealt with trade disputes in the Northern Territories. All of it was perfectly correct. None of it was true. The elven woman stepped uncertainly from the fold portal, gripping her walking stick tightly. The fold itself was guarded on both sides by rather impressive warriors of the Nakara order, with a single Okuran foldmaster sitting with his feet over the edge of the platform. Young, the old woman thought, on his first posting for the order and wondering if there was any part of the empire more distant from all he wanted than this one. The woman struggled forward, her staff dragging against the stone of the platform. The day was pleasantly cool. She could smell the breeze coming off the bay beyond the mud and stone walls of the town below. There was music rolling over the walls, and she could hear happy shouts and laughter punctuating the music drifting up the slope. The Okuran foldmaster did not bother to stand. He only turned to see who had come through, and seeing no one of importance, turned back to his idle consideration of his own importance. The old woman would not be put off, however. Young fold master, she said in a quavering voice, what town is this? You're on a cape, the youth replied, though the effort seemed to pain him. That stack of mud buildings is the capital city of this region. They seem to be celebrating, the woman noted. Do you know the cause? Is it a holiday? I do not know the cause, nor do I care. The youth stretched at the aching in his limbs. They have given us three days of rest and peace from their constant trafficking of their wares through this fold, and that is as good a cause as any to celebrate as far as I am concerned. The old woman smiled and nodded as she hobbled down off the platform and wound her way toward the city gates. The fold master was typical of elven youth, spoiled, proud, lazy, whining, and lost in his self-importance. She silently put him on her list. In time she arrived at the gates through the city walls, finding them both open and unattended. The narrow winding avenues with their cobblestone streets were filled with short, rust-brown gnome men, women, and children, laughing and chattering at one another. Wherever there were small bands of drummers, lute players, trumpeters, or other musicians playing together, they were surrounded by other gnomes, who were invariably dancing and cavorting through the streets. She came at last to the large paved plaza of the city, and climbed with stiff and pained strides the wide stairs up to the great house hall of the caliphate of the Jay Ka'aran. Several gnome guards stood before the great doorway that led into the hall. The captain of the guards stepped out from their number, and held his hand up. Stop! I yes? the woman asked weakly. Do you wish to see the caliph? That is why I have come. The captain's hand flipped palm up. Ten imperial dacella for ten minutes. Hard coin only, no paper. Could the captain of the guard manage to give me a private audience, undisturbed for, say, twenty decella? The captain considered for a moment, then nodded. He's all yours for twenty. The woman sighed, then produced the coins for the captain. He stepped aside and motioned the rest of the guards to do likewise. She passed through the large doors and turned her stooped form back to close the doors behind her. As the doors rang shut, the old elf woman turned, gripping her staff firmly with both her hands. She took in the disgusting room with practiced eyes. Bent over and with shuffling steps, she moved slowly toward the throne of the caliph. Chadre was in no hurry. She knew how to play a part well. Few alive remembered that the keeper had been a great inquisitor in her day. Down the years of her rise to the highest position in her order, she had increasingly affected the role of a withered elven matron. While it was true that her skills had diminished over time, it was not nearly to the extent that even her closest associates in the order thought. She held them against those times when it was necessary that she travel alone. This had become one of those times. It had all gone wrong. 
She first knew it when reports came back of entire gnome cities being massacred by Iblisi quorums in the Vestasian wasteland. Jukung had been her choice to quietly contain the problem. He became her mistake, and she could see that now. She thought his passion would give him strength to do the job. Instead, it consumed him to the point where he forgot what the mission was about. The surviving members of Jukung's quorums whom she questioned confirmed her worst fears. He had substituted his own orders for hers. Now Jukung was dead, and all the Empire, it seemed, was talking about how the Iblisi had been hunting a human named Dracus, and succeeded only in killing everyone they met except him. This disaster was bad enough, but not enough to bring her out of her lair. Tadre had come north for her own reasons— one of the Assessia she interviewed had given her a message from the one person she had no wish to hear from. Soen. He seemed to have vanished almost the moment after he had killed Jukung in some obscure human coastal village. The Codexia could not say where he had gone. They had followed rumors of an elven Iblisi tracking a manticore eastward along the Thetis coast. There were other reports of him among the mud gnome cities— or passing east into Ephendria, or bartering for a ship in Minenos. None of it could be confirmed. All that remained was the message given her by the Codexia. Tell the keeper I leave my answer with the Caliph of Urani. She stopped and looked up at the foot of the throne. At the sight, Chadre straightened at once, tossing back the hood from her head. The keeper of the Iblisi stood staring at the form of Argos Helm, the former caliph of the Jekaarin, and now a rapidly rotting corpse impaled on the top of his own throne. You always were a clever boy, Chadre breathed through clenched teeth. No wonder the town was celebrating. Argos Helm was a despot of the worst kind— but he had been a despot the elves could easily control. Now it would be only a matter of time, days perhaps, before the warlords of the Jakaaran threw the region into an uproar over which of them would be dominant. The guards outside were undoubtedly making their coin, letting the jubilant citizens in for a peek at this freak show that— A mark on the frame of the throne caught her eye. It would have been invisible to anyone else— but those trained in her order had it so ingrained into them that it would call their attention even without an active search. Chadre moved quickly around the throne. The blood of Argos' helm had dried down the back of the throne, but she paid no attention to it or the rotting corpse. She pried at the back board. It came away in one piece, exposing a hollow space. Within lay a vellum scroll tied with a brightly colored ribbon. Chidre snatched it from its place, pulled the ribbon free, and unrolled the vellum. The writing on it was in an ancient script known now only among the Iblisi, and used generally for messages intended for their ranks alone. She recognized the concise and careful hand that wrote it at once. My respected Chidre, I always repay the kindnesses shown me. As you can see, I have done so with the Caliph, and all he ever did for me was to lie. However shall I ever repay you? Soen, Chenre. Chadre looked up at the broken form of the gnome Caliph. The sounds of laughter and music, muffled and distant, filtered into the hall. So it's begun, so and you fool, she murmured to the empty hall, and you do not know how terribly it will end for us all. The End of Book One We hope you have enjoyed our presentation of Song of the Dragon, The Annals of Dracus, Book One, by Tracy Hickman. Copyright 2010 by Tracy and Laura Hickman. Performed by Phil Giganti. Directed by Kevin Yawn. Engineered by Troy Harrison. Performance copyright 2010 by Brilliance Audio. All rights reserved. 
For further information concerning this program or other Brilliance Audio titles, please call the following toll-free number, 1-800-222-3225, or visit our website at www.brilliansaudio.com. No part of this recording may be played for an audience or reproduced in any form. It may not be streamed, downloaded, broadcast, or copied without written permission. Address all inquiries to Brilliance Audio, P.O. Box 887, Grand Haven, Michigan, 49417.